Chapter twenty nine of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to El Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ning. Chapter twenty nine of Personal Narrative of a Pilgrimage to El Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. The Ceremonies of Yom Arafat, or the Second Day the morning of the ninth al hijjah tuesday thirteenth september was ushered in by military sounds a loud discharge of cannon warned us to arise and to prepare for the ceremonies of this eventful day after ablution and prayer i proceeded with the boy mohammed to inspect the numerous consecrated sites on the mount of mercy in the first place we repaired to a spot on rising ground to the south-east and within a hundred yards of the hill it is called Jama Sakhra, or the assembling place of the rock. Footnote. Ali Bey calls it Jama Rahma, or the assembling place of mercy. End of footnote. From two granite boulders upon which the Prophet stood to perform Talbiyat, there is nothing but a small enclosure of dwarf and whitewashed stone walls, divided into halves for men and women by a similar partition, and provided with a niche to direct prayers towards Mecca entering by steps we found crowds of devotees and guardians who for consideration offered mats and carpets after a two-bow prayer and a long supplication opposite the niche we retired to the inner compartment stood upon a boulder and shouted the labbaik thence threading our way through many obstacles of tent and stone we ascended the broad flight of rugged steps which winds up the southern face of the rocky hill even at this early hour it was crowded with pilgrims, principally Bedouin and Wahhabis, who had secured favourable positions for hearing the sermon. Already their green flag was planted upon the summit close to Adam's place of prayer. The wilder Arabs insist that wukuf, or standing, should take place upon the hill. This is not done by the more civilised, who hold that all the plain within the Alamein ranks as Arafat, according to ali bey the maliki school is not allowed to stand upon the mountain about half way up i counted sixty-six steps and remarked that they became narrower and steeper crowds of beggars instantly seized the pilgrims robes and strove to prevent our entering a second enclosure this place which resembles the former except that it has but one compartment and no boulders is that whence mohammed used to address his followers and here to the present day the khatib or the preacher in imitation of the last of the prophets sitting upon a dromedary recites the arafat sermon here also we prayed a two-bow prayer and gave a small sum to the guardian thence ascending with increased difficulty to the hilltop we arrived at a large stuccoed platform with prayer niche and a kind of obelisk mean and badly built of lime and granite stone whitewashed and conspicuous from afar footnote here was a small chapel which the wahhabis were demolishing when ali bey was at mecca it has not been rebuilt upon this spot the prophet according to burckhardt used to stand during the ceremonies End of footnote. it is called the maqam or mada sayyidina adam footnote burckhardt gives this name to a place a little way on the left and about forty steps up the mountain and a footnote here we performed the customary ceremonies amongst a crowd of pilgrims and then we walked down the little hill close to the plain we saw the place where the egyptian and the damascus mahmel stand during the sermon and descending the wall that surrounds arafat by a steep and narrow flight of coarse stone steps we found on our right the fountain which supplies the place with water it bubbles from the rock and is exceedingly pure as such water generally is in el hijaz our excursion employed us longer than the description requires nine o'clock had struck before we reached the plain all were in a state of excitement guns fired incessantly horsemen and camel riders galloped about without apparent object even the women and children stood and walked too restless even to sleep arrived at the tent i was unpleasantly surprised to find a new visitor in an old acquaintance ali bin yasin the zemzemi 
he had lost his mule and wandering in search of its keepers he unfortunately fell in with our party i had solid reasons to regret the mishap he was far too curious and too observant to suit my tastes on the present occasion he being uncomfortable made us equally so accustomed to all the terrible neatness of an elderly damsel in great britain a few specks of dirt upon the rugs and half a dozen bits of cinder upon the ground sufficed to give him attacks of nerves that day we breakfasted late for night must come before we could eat again after midday prayer we performed ablutions some the greater others the less in preparation for the wukuf or standing from noon onwards the hum and murmur of the multitude increased and people were seen swarming about in all directions a second discharge of cannon at about three fifteen p m announced the approach of al asr the afternoon prayer and almost immediately we heard the nobat or band preceding the sharif's procession as he wended his way towards the mountain fortunately my tent was pitched close to the road so that without trouble i had a perfect view of the scene first swept a cloud of mace-bearers who as usual on such occasions cleared the path with scant ceremony they were followed by the horsemen of the desert wielding long and tufted spears immediately behind them came the sharif's led horses upon which i fixed a curious eye all were highly bred and one a brown nujdi with black points struck me as the perfection of an arab they were all small and all apparently of the northern race footnote in solomon's time the egyptian horse cost a hundred and fifty silver shekels which if the greater shekel be meant would still be about the average price eighteen pounds abbas the late pasha did his best to buy first-rate arab stallions on one occasion he sent a mission to al medina for the sole purpose of fetching a rare work on ferriery yet it is doubt whether he had ever a first-rate nijdi a Badawi sent to cairo by one of the chiefs of nejd being shown by the viceroy over the stables on being asked his opinion of the blood replied bluntly to the great man's disgust that they did not contain a single thoroughbred he added an apology on the part of his laird for the animals he had brought from arabia saying that neither sultan nor sheikh could procure cults of the best strain for none of these horses would a staunch admirer of the long-legged monster called in england a thoroughbred give twenty pounds they were mere rats short and stunted ragged and fleshless with rough coats and a slouching walk but the experienced glance notes at once the fine snake-like head ears like reeds wide and projecting nostrils large eyes fiery and soft alternately broad brow deep base of skull white chest crooked tail limbs padded with muscle and long elastic pasterns and the animal put out to speed soon display the wondrous force of the blood in fact when buying arabs there are only three things to be considered blood blood and again blood in marco polo's time i didn't supply the indian market the state of the tribes round the eye of yemen has effectually closed the road against the horse caravans for many years past it is said that dhu muhammad and dhu hussein sub-families of the banu yem a large tribe living around north of sana'a in al yemen have a fine large breed called al jofi and the clan al awlaqi rear animals celebrated for swiftness and endurance the other races are stunted and some arabs declare that the air of al yemen causes a degeneracy in the first generation the bedouin on the contrary uphold their superiority and talk with the utmost contempt of the african horse in india we now depend for arab blood upon the persian gulf and the consequence of monopoly display themselves in an increased price for inferior animals our studs are generally believed to be sinks for rupees the governments of india now object it is said to rearing at a great cost animals distinguished by nothing but ferocity it is evident that al hijaz can never stock the indian market whether a nejd will supply us when the transit becomes safe is a consideration which only time can decide meanwhile it would be highly advisable to take steps for restoring the adan trade by entering into closer relations with the imam of sana'a and the bedawi chiefs of the north of al yemen End of, footnote. of their old crimson velvet caparisons the less said the better no little indian nawab would show aught so shabby on state occasions 
after the charges paraded a band of black slaves on foot bearing huge matchlocks and immediately preceded by three green and two red flags came the sharif riding in front of his family and courtiers the prince habited in a simple white ihram and bareheaded mounted a mule the only sign of his rank was a large green and gold embroidered umbrella held over him by a slave the rear was brought up by another troop of bedouin on horses and camels behind this procession were the tents whose doors and walls were scarcely visible for the crowd and the picturesque background was the granite hill covered wherever standing room was to be found with white-robed pilgrims shouting the bake and waving the skirts of their glistening garments violently over their heads slowly and solemnly the procession advanced towards the hill exactly at the hour of al asr the two mahmuds had taken their station side by side on a platform in the lower slope that of damascus could be distinguished as the narrower and the more ornamented of the pair the sharif placed himself with his standard bearers and his retinue a little above the mahmuds while hearing the preacher the pilgrims crowded up to the foot of the mountain the loud labbaik of the bedouin and the wahhabis fell to a solemn silence and the waving of the white robe ceased a sign that the preacher had begun the khutbat al waqfa or sermon of the standing upon arafat footnote i obtained the following note upon the ceremonies of wahhabi pilgrimage from one of their princes khalid bey the wahhabi who it must be borne in mind calls himself a muwahhid or unitarian in opposition to a mushrik or polytheist any other sect but his own at mecca follows out his two principal tenets public prayer for men daily for women on fridays and rejection of the prophet's mediation imitating muhammad he spends the first night of pilgrimage at muna stands upon the hill arafat and returning to muna passes three whole days there he derides other muslims abridges and simplifies the kaaba ceremonies and if possible is guided in his devotions by one of his own sect and a footnote from my tent i could distinguish the form of the old man upon his camel but the distance was too great for ear to reach but how came i to be at the tent a short confession will explain they will shrive me who believe in inspired spencer's lines and every spirit as it is more pure and hath in it the more of heavenly light so it the fairer body doth procure to habit in the evil came of a fairer body i had prepared in cachette a slip of paper and had hid in my ihram a pencil destined to put down the heads of this rarely heard discourse but unhappily that red cashmere shawl was upon my shoulders close to us at a party of fair meccans apparently belonging to the higher classes and one of these i had already several times remarked she was a tall girl about eighteen years old with regular features a skin somewhat citron coloured but soft and clear symmetrical eyebrows the most beautiful eyes and a figure all grace there was no head thrown back no straightened neck no flat shoulders nor toes turned out in fact no elegant barbarism the shape was what the arabs love soft bending and relaxed as a woman's figure ought to be unhappily she wore instead of the usual veil a yashmak or transparent muslin bound around the face and the chaperon mother or duenna by whose side she stood was apparently a very unsuspicious or complacent old person flirtilla fixed a glance of admiration upon my cashmere i directed a reply with interest at her eyes she then by the usual coquettish gesture threw back an inch or two of head veil disclosing broad bands of jetty hair crowning a lovely oval my palpable admiration of the new charm was rewarded by a partial removal of the yashmak when a dimpled mouth and a rounded chin stood out from the envious muslin seeing that my companions were safely employed i entered upon the dangerous ground of raising hand to forehead she smiled almost imperceptibly and turned away the pilgrim was in ecstasy the sermon was then half over i was resolved to stay upon the plain and see what flirtilla would do grace to the cashmere we came to a good understanding the next page will record my disappointment that evening the pilgrim resumed his soiled cotton cloth and testily returned the red shawl to the boy mohammed the sermon always lasts till near sunset or about three hours 
at first it was spoken amid profound silence then loud scattered amens and volleys of labbaik exploded at uncertain intervals at last the breeze brought to our ears a purgatorial chorus of cries sobs and shrieks even my party thought proper to be affected old ali rubbed his eyes which in no case unconnected with dollars could by any amount of straining be made to shed even crocodile's tears and the boy mohammed wisely hid his face in the skirt of his rida presently the people exhausted by emotion began to descend the hill in small parties and those below struck their tents and commenced loading their camels although at least an hour's sermon remained on this occasion however all hurry to be foremost as the race from arafat is enjoyed by none but the bedouin although we worked with a will our animals were not ready to move before sunset when the preacher gave the signal of israf or permission to depart the pilgrims swaying to and fro like waves of a great sea that in mid-shock confound each other white with foam and fear rushed down the hill with the labbaik sounding like a blast and took the road to munna then i saw the scene which has given to this part of the ceremonies the name of a deaf min arafat the hurry from arafat every man urged his beast with might and main it was sunset the plain bristled with ten pegs litters were crushed pedestrians were trampled camels were overthrown single combats with sticks and other weapons took place here a woman there a child and there an animal were lost briefly it was a chaotic confusion to my disgust old ali insisted upon bestowing his company upon me he gave his newly found mule to the boy mohammed bidding him to take care of the beast and mounted with me in the shukduf i had persuaded sheikh masoud with a dollar to keep close in rear of the pretty meccan and i wanted to sketch the holy hill the senior began to give orders about the camel i counter orders the camel was halted i urged it on old ali directed it to be stopped meanwhile the charming face that smiled at me from the litter grew dimmer and dimmer the more i stormed the less i was listened to a string of camels crossed our path i lost sight of the beauty then we began to advance again my determination to sketch seemed likely to fail before the zemzemi's little snake eyes after a few minutes angry search for expedients one suggested itself effendi said old ali sit quiet there is danger here i tossed about like one suffering from evil conscience or from the colic effendi shrieked the senior what art thou doing thou wilt be the death of us wallah i replied with a violent plunge it is all thy fault there another plunge put thy beard out of the other opening and allah will make it easy to us in the ecstasy of fear my tormentor turned his face as he was hidden towards the camel's head a second halt ensued when i looked out at the aperture in rear and made a rough drawing of the mountain of mercy at the akshabain double lines of camels bristling with letters clashed at a shock more noisy than the meeting of torrents it was already dark no man knew what he was doing the guns roared like their brazen notes re-echoed far and wide by the harsh voices of the stony hills a shower of rockets bursting in the air threw into still greater confusion the timorous mob of women and children at the same time martial music rose from the masses of nizam and the stouter-hearted pilgrims were not sparing of their labbaik and eid mubarak may your festival be happy footnote labbaik is repeated until the pilgrims reach minna and not afterwards another phrase is unto minna laidin or may you be the keepers of festival End of footnote after the pass of the two rugged hills the road widened and old ali who during the bumping had been in a silent convulsion of terror recovered speech and spirits this change he evidenced by beginning to be troublesome once more again i resolved to be his equal exclaiming my eyes are yellow with hunger i seized a pot full of savoury meat which the old man had previously stored for supper and without further preamble began to eat it greedily at the same time ready to shout with laughter at the mumbling and grumbling sounds that proceeded from the darkness of the litter we were at least three hours on the road before reaching Muzdalifa, and being fatigued we resolved to pass the night there hanafis usually followed the prophet's example in nighting at Muzdalifa 
in the evening after the prayers they attend the mosque listen to the discourse and shed plentiful tears most shafis spend only a few hours at muzdalifa and a footnote the mosque was brilliantly illuminated footnote some sects consider the prayer at muzdalifa a matter of vital importance End of footnote. but my hungry companions apparently thought more of supper and sleep than of devotion footnote. we failed to buy meat at arafat afternoon although the bazaar was large and well stocked it is usual to eat flesh there consequently it is greedily bought up at an exorbitant price End of footnote whilst the tent was being raised the indians prepared our food boiled our coffee filled our pipes and spread our rugs before sleeping each man collected for himself seven jumra bits of granite at the size of a small bean footnote jumra is a small pebble it is also called hasa in the plural hasayat End of footnote. then weary with emotion and exertion all lay down except the boy mohammed who preceded us to find a camping ground at mina old ali in lending his mule made the most stringent arrangements with the youth about the exact place and the exact hour of meeting an act of simplicity at which i could not but smile the time was by no means peaceful or silent lines of camels passed us every ten minutes and the shouting of travellers continued till near dawn pilgrims ought to have nighted at the mosque but as burckhardt's time so in mine baggage was considered to be in danger thereabouts and consequently most of the devotees spent the sermon hours in brooding over their boxes End of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of personal narrative of pilgrimage to el medina and mecca by richard francis burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter thirty the ceremonies of the yom al nahr or the third day at dawn on the eid al qurban tenth of the hijjah wednesday september fourteenth a gun warned us to lose no time we arose hurriedly and started up the button mahasser to mina by this means we lost at muzdalifa the salat al eid or festival prayers the great solemnity of the muslim year performed by all the community at daybreak my companion was so anxious to reach mecca that he would not hear of devotions about eight a m we entered the village and looked for the boy mohammed in vain old ali was dreadfully perplexed a host of high-born turkish pilgrims were he said expecting him his mule was missing could never appear he must be late should probably never reach mecca what would become of him i began by administering admonition to the mind diseased but signally failing in a cure i amused myself with contemplating the world from my shukduf leaving the office of directing it to the old zemzemi now he stopped then he pressed forward here he thought he saw mohammed there he discovered our tent at one time he would knock the camel to wait in patience his supreme hour at another half mad with nervousness he would urge the excellent masoud to hopeless inquiries finally by good fortune we found one of the boy mohammed's cousins who led us to an enclosure called hosh al uzam in the southern portion of the muna basin at the base of mount sabir Footnote even pitching ground here is charged to pilgrims and a footnote there we pitched the tent refreshed ourselves and awaited the truant's return old ali failing to disturb my equanimity attempted as those who consort with philosophers often do to quarrel with me but finding no material wherewith to build a dispute in such fragment as ah hmm allah he hinted desperate intentions against the boy mohammed when however the youth appeared with even more jauntiness of mien than usual ali bin yasin lost heart brushed by him mounted his mule and doubtless cursing us under the tongue rode away frowning viciously with his heels playing upon the beast's ribs mohammed had been delayed he said by the difficulty of finding asses we were now to mount for the throwing as a preliminary to which we washed with seven waters the seven pebbles brought from muzdalifa and bound them in our ihrams footnote some authorities advise that this rite of remi be performed on foot End of footnote. our first destination was the entrance to the western end of the long line which composes the muna village 
we found a swarming crowd in the narrow road opposite the jamrat al aqaba or as it is vulgarly called the shaytan al kabir or the great devil footnote the word jamra is applied to the place of stoning as well as to the stones End of footnote. these names distinguish it from another pillar the wusta or a central place of stoning built in the middle of muna and a third at the eastern end al ula or the first place footnote these numbers mark the successive spots where the devil in the shape of an old sheikh appeared to adam abraham and ismail and was driven back by the simple process taught by gabriel of throwing stones at about the size of a bean End of footnote the shaitan al-kabir is a dwarf buttress of rude masonry about eight feet high by two and a half broad placed against a rough wall of stones at the meccan entrance to mina as the ceremony of rami or lapidation must be performed on the first day by all pilgrims between sunrise and sunset and as the fiend was malicious enough to appear in a rugged pass the crowd makes the place dangerous footnote i borrow this phrase from ali bey who however speaks more like an ignorant catalonian than a learned abbasid when he calls the pillar la maison du diable and facetiously asserts that le diable a eu le malice de placer sa maison dans un lieu fort étroit qui n'a peut-être pas trente-quatre pieds de large End of footnote. on one side of the road which is not forty feet broad stood a row of shops belonging principally to barbers on the other side is the rugged wall against which the pillar stands with a cheval de frise of bedouin and naked boys the narrow place was crowded with pilgrims all struggling like drowning men to approach as near as possible to the devil it would have been easy to run over the heads of the mass amongst them were horsemen with rearing chargers bedouin on wild camels and grandees on mules and asses with outrunners were breaking away by assault and battery i had read ali bey's self-felicitations upon escaping this place with only two wounds in the left leg and i had duly provided myself with a hidden dagger the precaution was not useless scarcely had my donkey entered the crowd than he was overthrown by dromedary and i found myself under the stamping and roaring beast's stomach avoiding being trampled upon by a judicious use of the knife i lost no time in escaping from a place so ignobly dangerous some muslim travellers assert in proof of the sanctity of the spot that no muslim is ever killed there meccans assured me that accidents are by no means rare presently the boy mohammed fought his way out of the crowd with a bleeding nose we both sat down upon a bench before a barber's booth and schooled by adversity awaited with patience and opportunity finding an opening we approached within about five cubits of the place and holding each stone between the thumb and the forefinger of the right hand we cast it at the pillar footnote some hold the pebble as a schoolboy does a marble others between the thumb and the forefinger extended others shoot them from the thumb knuckle and most men consult their convenience and a footnote exclaiming in the name of allah and allah is almighty i do this in hatred of the fiend and to his shame after which came the tahlil and the thana or praise to allah the seven stones being duly thrown we retired and entering the barber's booth took our places upon one of the earthen benches around it this was the time to remove the ihram or the pilgrim's garb and return to hilal the normal state of al islam the barber shaved our heads and after trimming our beards and cutting our nails made us repeat these words i purpose loosening my ihram according to the practice of the prophet whom may allah bless and preserve o allah make unto me in every hair a light a purity and a generous reward in the name of allah and allah is almighty at the conclusion of his labor the barber politely addressed us to naiman pleasure to you to which we as ceremoniously replied allah give thee pleasure footnote the barber removed all my hair hanafis shave at least a quarter of the head shafi's a few hairs on the right side the prayer is as usual differently worded 
some saying o oh allah this is my forelock is in thy hand then grant me for every hair a light on resurrection day by thy mercy o most merciful of the merciful i remarked that the hair was allowed to lie upon the ground whereas strict muslims with that reverence for man's body the temple of the supreme which characterizes their creed carefully bury it in the earth and a footnote we had no clothes with us but we could use our cloths to cover our heads and slippers to defend our feet from the fiery sun and we now could safely twirl our mustachios and stroke our beards placid enjoyments of which we had been deprived by the laws of pilgrimage after resting about an hour in the booth which though crowded with sitting customers was delightfully cool compared with the burning glare of the road we mounted our asses and at eleven a m we started mecca wards this return from minna to mecca is called the nafr or the flight footnote this word is confounded with defa by many muslim authors some speak of the nafr from arafa to muzdalifa and the daf from muzdalifa to minna i have used the words as my mutawif used them End of footnote. we did not fail to keep our asses at speed with a few halts to refresh ourselves with gugglets of water there was nothing remarkable in the scene our ride in was a repetition of our ride out in about half an hour we entered the city passing through that classical locality called batan quraish which was crowded with people and then we repaired to the boy mohammed's house for the purpose of bathing and preparing to visit the kaaba shortly after our arrival the youth returned home in a state of excitement exclaiming rise effendi dress and follow me the kaaba though open would for a time be empty so that we should escape the crowd my pilgrim's garb which had not been removed was made to look neat and somewhat indian and we sallied forth together without loss of time the crowd had gathered around the kaaba i had no wish to stand bareheaded and barefooted in midday september sun at the cry of open the path for the haji who would enter the house the gazers made way two stout meccans who stood below the door raised me in their arms whilst a third drew me from above into the building at the entrance i was accosted by several officials dark-looking meccans of whom the blackest and plainest was a youth of the benu sheba family footnote they keep the keys of the house in my day the head of the family was sheikh ahmed and a footnote the sang azul of al hijaz he held in his hand the huge silver gilt padlock of the kaaba footnote in ibn jubayr's time this large padlock was of gold it is said popularly that none but the banu sheba can open it a minor miracle doubtless proceeding from the art of some eastern hobs or barama and a footnote and presently taking his seat upon a kind of wooden press in the left corner of the hall he officially inquired my name nation and other particulars the replies were satisfactory and the boy mohammed was authoritatively ordered to conduct me around the building and to recite the prayers i will not deny that looking at the windowless walls the officials at the door and the crowd of excited fanatics below and the place death considering who i was footnote however safe a christian might be at mecca nothing could preserve him from the ready knives of enraged fanatics if detected in the house the very idea is pollution to a muslim and a footnote my feelings were of a trapped rat description acknowledged by the immortal nephew of his uncle perez this did not however prevent my carefully observing the scene during our long prayers and making a rough plan with a pencil upon my white ihram nothing is more simple than the interior of this celebrated building the pavement which is level with the ground is composed of slabs of fine and various coloured marbles mostly however white disposed checkerwise the walls as far as they can be seen are of the same material but the pieces are irregularly shaped and many of them are engraved with long inscriptions in the soles and other modern characters the upper part of the walls together with the ceiling at which it is considered disrespectful to look are covered with handsome red damask footnote i do not know the origin of this superstition but it would be unsafe for a pilgrim to look fixedly at the kaaba ceiling 
under the arras i was told is a strong planking of saj or indian teak and above it a stuccoed satih or flat roof and a footnote flowered over with gold and tucked up about six feet high so as to be removed from pilgrims hands footnote exactly realizing the description of our english bard goodly arras of great majesty woven with gold and silk so close and near that the rich metal lurked privily as feigning to be hid from envious eye End of footnote. the flat roof is upheld by three cross beams whose shapes appear under the arras they rest upon the eastern and western walls and are supported in the centre by three columns footnote. ibn jubair mentions three columns of teak burkhardt and ali bey too in al fasi's day there were four the quraysh erected six columns in double row generally the pillars have been three in number End of footnote covered with carved and ornamented aloes wood footnote this wood which has been used of old to ornament sacred buildings in the east is brought to mecca in great quantities by the malay and java pilgrims the best kind is known by its oldly appearance and a fizzing sound in fire the cunning vendors easily supply it with desiderata End of footnote. at the iraqi corner there is a dwarf door called babatoba of repentance Footnote. Ibn Jubair calls it Bab al Rahma. End of footnote. It leads into a narrow passage and to the staircase by which the servants ascend to the roof. It is never opened except for working purposes. The Aswad or Asad corner. Footnote. The Hajar Aswad is also called Al Asad or the Propitious. End of footnote. Is occupied by a flat topped and quadrant shaped press or safe. Footnote here in ibn jubair's time stood two boxes full of qur'ans End of footnote. in which at times is placed the key of the kaaba footnote the key is sometimes in the hands of a child of the house of sheba who sits in state with black slaves on both sides End of footnote. both door and safe are of aloes wood between the columns and about nine feet from the ground ran bars of a metal which i could not distinguish and hanging between them were many lamps set to be gold although there were in the kaaba but a few attendants engaged in preparing it for the entrance of the pilgrims footnote in ibn jubair's day the kaaba was opened with more ceremony the ladder was rolled up to the door and the chief of the benu sheba ascending it was covered by attendants with a black veil from head to foot whilst he opened the padlock then having kissed the threshold he entered shut the door behind him and prayed two rakats after which all the banu sheba and lastly the vulgar were admitted in these days the veil is obsolete the sheikh enters the kaaba alone perfumes it and prays the pilgrims are then admitted en masse and the style in which the eunuchs handle their quarter staves form a scene more animated than decorous and a footnote the windowless stone walls and the choked-up door made it worse than the piombi of venice perspiration trickled in large drops and i thought with horror what it must have been when filled with a mass of furiously jostling and crushing fanatics our devotions consisted of two bow prayer footnote some pray for instead of two bows and a footnote followed by long supplications at the shami or the west corner the iraqi or the northern angle the yemeni the south and lastly opposite the third of the black wall footnote burkhardt erroneously says in every corner and a footnote these concluded i returned to the door where payment is made the boy mohammed told me that the total expense would be seven dollars at the same time he had been indulging aloud in his favourite rodomantade boasting of my greatness and had declared me to be an indian pilgrim a race still supposed at mecca to be made of gold footnote these indians are ever in extremes paupers or millionaires and like all muslims the more they pay at mecca the higher becomes their character and religious titles a turkish pasha seldom squanders as much money as does a muslim merchant from the far east khudabakhsh the lahore shawl dealer owned to having spent eight hundred liras in feasting and presents he appeared to consider that sum a trifle 
although had a debtor carried off one teeth of it his health would have been seriously affected and a footnote when seven dollars were tendered they were rejected with instance expecting something of the kind i had been careful to bring no more than eight being pulled and interpolated by half a dozen attendants my course was to look stupid and to pretend ignorance of the language presently the sheba youth bethought him of a contrivance drawing forth from the press the key of the kaaba he partly bared it of its green silk gold letter etui and rubbed a golden knob quarter foil shaped upon my eyes in order to brighten them footnote the cover of the key is made like abraham's veil of three colours red black and green it is of silk embroidered with golden letters and upon it are written the bismillah the name of the reigning sultan back of the key of the holy kaaba and a verselet from the family of al imran quran chapter three it is made like the kiswa at khurunfish a place that will be noticed below and a footnote i submitted to the operation with a good grace and added a dollar my last to the former offering the sharif received it with a hopeless glance and to my satisfaction would not put forth his hand to be kissed then the attendants began to demand veils i replied by opening my empty pouch when let down from the door by the two brawny meccans i was expected to pay them and accordingly appointed to meet them at the boy mohammed's house an arrangement to which they grumblingly assented when delivered from these troubles i was congratulated by my sharp companion thus wallah fendi thou hast escaped well some men have left their skins behind footnote a corse or pilati the idea is common to most imaginative nations End of footnote. all pilgrims do not enter the kaaba and many refuse to do so for religious reasons footnote. the same is the case at al medina many religious men object on conscientious grounds to enter the prophet's mosque the poet quoted below many visitations to al medina but never would persuade himself to approach the tomb the esquire carver saw two young turks who had voluntarily had their eyes thrust out at mecca as soon as they had seen the glory and visible sanctity of the tomb of mohammed i doubt the fact which thus appears ushered in by a fiction and a footnote Amr Effendi, for instance who had never missed the pilgrimage had never seen the interior of the kaaba footnote i have not thought it necessary to go deep into the list of muharramat or actions forbidden to the pilgrim who has entered the kaaba they are numerous and meaningless and a footnote those who treat the hollowed floor are bound among other things never again to walk barefooted to take up fire with fingers or to tell lies most really conscientious men cannot afford the luxuries of slippers tongs and truth so thought thomas when offered the apple which would have given him the tongue that cannot lie my tongue is mine ain true thomas said a goodly gift ye wad gie to me i neither thought to buy nor sell at fair or tryst where i may be i doth neither speak to prince or peer nor ask of grace from fair lady amongst the hindus i have met with men who have proceeded upon a pilgrimage to dwarka and yet who would not receive the brand of the god because lying would be forbidden to them a confidential servant of a friend in bombay naively declared that he had not been marked as the act would have ruined him there is a sad truth in what he said lying to the oriental is meat and drink and the roof that shelters him the kaaba had been dressed in her new attire when we entered footnote the use of the feminine pronoun is explained below when unclothed the kaaba is called ariana or naked in opposition to its normal state muharrama or clad in ihram in burckhardt's time the house remained naked for fifteen days now the investiture is effected in a few hours and a footnote the covering however instead of being secured at the bottom of the metal rings in the basement was tucked up by ropes from the roof and depended over each face in two long tongues 
it was of brilliant black and the hizam the zone or golden band running round the upper portion of the building as well as the burqa were of dazzling brightness footnote the gold embroidered curtain covering the kaaba door is called by the learned burqa al kaaba or the kaaba's face veil the vulgar burqa fatima they connected in idea with the prophet's daughter and a footnote the origin of this custom must be sought in the ancient practice of typifying the church visible by a virgin or a bride the poet abdul rahim al burai in one of his gnostic effusions has embodied the idea and mecca's bride i e the kaaba is displayed with miraculous signs this idea doubtless led to the face veil the covering and the guardianship of the eunuchs the meccan temple was first dressed as a mark of honour by tubba the himyarit when he judaized footnote the pyramids it is said were covered from base to summit with yellow silk or satin and a footnote if we accept this fact which is vouched for by oriental history we are led to the conclusion that the children of israel settled at mecca had connected the temple with their own faith and as a colorally that the prophet of al islam introduced their apocryphal tradition into this creed the pagan arabs did not remove the coverings the old and torn kiswa was covered with a new cloth and the weight threatened to crush the building footnote at present the kiswa it need scarcely be said does not cover the flat roof and a footnote from the time of qusay the kaaba was veiled by subscription till abu rabiat al mughayra bin abdullah who having acquired great wealth by commerce offered to provide the kiswa on alternate years and thereby gain the name of al adil the prophet preferred the covering of fine yemen cloth and directed the expense to be defrayed by the bayt al-mal or public treasury Omar chose egyptian linen ordering the kiswa to be renewed every year and this old covering to be distributed among the pilgrims in the reign of uthman the kaaba was twice clothed in winter and summer for the former season it received a kameez or thobe of brocade with an izar or veil for the latter a suit of fine linen muawiyah first supplied linen and brocade he afterwards exchanged the former for striped yemen stuff and ordered shaiban bin uthman to strip the kaaba and to perfume the walls with khaluq shaiba divided the old kiswa among the pilgrims and abdullah bin abbas did not object to this distribution Footnote. when shaiba proposed to bury the old kiswa so that it might not be worn by the impure Aisha also directed him to sell it and to distribute the proceeds to the poor. The Meccans still follow the first half but neglect the other part of the order given by the mother of the Muslims. Qadi Khan advises the proceeds of the sale being devoted to the repairs of the temple. The Siraj al Wahaj positively forbids as a sin the cutting, transporting, selling, buying, and placing it between the leaves of the Quran qutbuddin from whom i borrow these particulars introduces some fine and causeistic distinctions in his day however the banu shayba claimed the old after the arrival of the new kiswa and their right to it was admitted to the present day they continue to sell it End of footnote. the caliph mamun of the ninth century ordered the dress to be changed three times a year in his day it was red brocade on the tenth of muharram fine linen on the first of rajab and white brocade on the first of shawwal at last he was informed that the veil applied on the tenth of muharram was too closely followed by the red brocade in the next month and that it required renewing on the first of shawwal this he ordered to be done al mutawakkil of the ninth century when informed that the dress was spoiled by pilgrims at first ordered two to be given and the brocade shirt to be let down as far as the pavement at last he sent a new veil every two months during the caliphate of the abbasids this investiture came to signify sovereignty in al hijaz which passed alternately from baghdad to egypt and al yemen in al idris's time twelfth century a d the kiswa was composed of black silk and renewed every year by the caliph of baghdad ibn jubayr writes that it was green and gold the kiswa remained with egypt and sultan cologne of the nineteenth century footnote 
some authors also mention a green kiswa applied by this monarch embroidered on it were certain verselets of the quran and the formula of the muslim faith and the names of the prophet's companions End of footnote. conveyed the rents of two villages baisus and sinbus footnote borkhart says baisus and sandabir End of footnote to the expense of providing an outer black and an inner red curtain to the kaaba with hangings for the prophet's tomb at al medina when the holy land fell under the power of uthmani sultan selim ordered the kiswa to be black and his son sultan suleiman the magnificent of the sixteenth century a d devoted considerable sums to the purpose the kiswa was afterwards renewed at the ascension of each sultan and the wahhabis during the first year of their conquest covered the kaaba with a red kiswa of the same stuff as the fine arabian abba or cloak and made it at al hasa the kiswa is now worked at a karun factory called al khurunfush of the tum bab shairiya in cairo it is made by a hereditary family called the bayt al-sadi and as the specimen in my possession proves it is a coarse tissue of silk and cotton mixed the kiswa is composed of eight pieces two of each face of the kaaba the seams being concealed by the hizam a broad band which at a distance looks like gold it is lined with a white calico and it is supplied with cotton ropes anciently it is said all the quran was interwoven into it now it is inscribed verily the first of houses founded for mankind to worship is that at bekka blessed and a direction to all creatures footnote from the family of al imran chapter three bekka is a place of crowding hence applied to mecca generally some writers however limit it to the part of the city around the harem and a footnote together with the seven chapters namely the cave maryam the family of al imran repentance taha and yasin and tabarak the characters that is called tumar the largest style of eastern calligraphy legible from a considerable distance footnote it is larger than the souls admirers of eastern calligraphy may see a bismillah beautifully written in tumar on the wall of sultan muayyad's mosque at cairo and a footnote the hizam is a band about two feet broad and surrounding the kaaba at two-thirds of its height it is divided into four pieces which are sewn together on the first and second is inscribed the throne verselet and on the third and fourth the titles of the reigning sultan these inscriptions like the burqa or the door curtain are gold worked into red silk by the bayt al-sadi when the kiswa is ready at khurunfush it is carried in procession to the mosque al hasanain where it is lined soon and prepared for the journey footnote mr lane was given an ample and accurate description of the kiswa i have added a few details derived from khalil Avendi of cairo a professor of arabic and an excellent french scholar and a footnote after quitting the kaaba i returned home exhausted and washed with henna and warm water to mitigate the pain of the sun skulls upon my arms shoulders and breast the house was empty all the turkish pilgrims being still at minna and the kibira the old lady received me with peculiar attention i was ushered into a room whose teak wainscotings covered with kufic and other inscriptions large carpets and ample divans still showed a sort of ragged splendour the family had seen better days the sharif ghalib having confiscated three of its houses but it is still proud and cannot merge the past into the present in the drawing-room where the turkish colonel occupied when at mecca the kabira supplied me with a pipe coffee cold water and breakfast i won her heart by praising the graceless boy mohammed and like all mothers she dearly loved the scamp of the family when he entered and saw his maternal parent standing near me with only the end of her veil drawn over her mouth he began to scold her with diverse insinuations soon thou wilt sit amongst the men in the hall he exclaimed o oh, my son rejoined the kabira 
fear Allah, thy mother is in years. And truly she was so, being at least fifty. Ah, sneered the youth, who had formed, as boys of the world must do, or appear to do, a very low estimate of the sex. The old lady understood the drift of the exclamation, and departed with a half-laughing, May Allah disappoint thee! She soon, however, returned, bringing me water for ablution, and having heard that I had not yet sacrificed a sheep at Minna, enjoined me to return and perform without delay the important rite. After resuming our local toilette, and dressing gaily for the great festival, we mounted our asses about the cool of the afternoon, and returning to Muna, we found the tent full of visitors. Ali bin Yasin, the Zemzemi, had sent me an amphora of holy water, and the carrier was awaiting the customary dollar. With him were several Meccans, one of whom spoke excellent Persian. We sat down and chatted together for an hour, and afterwards I learned from the boy Muhammad that all had pronounced me to be an Ajami. After their departure we debated about the victim, which is only a sunnah or practice of the Prophet. Footnote. Those who omit the right fast ten days, three during the pilgrimage season, and the remaining seven at some other time. End of footnote. It is generally sacrificed immediately after the first lapidation, and we had already been guilty of delay. Under these circumstances, and considering the meagre condition of my purse, I would not buy a sheep, but contented myself with watching my neighbors. They gave themselves great trouble, especially a large party of Indians pitched near us to buy the victim cheap. But the Bedouin were not less acute, and he was happy who paid less than a dollar and a quarter some preferred contributing to buy a lean ox none but the sharif and the principal dignitaries slaughtered camels the pilgrims dragged their victims to a smooth rock near the aqaba above which stands a small open pavilion whose sides red with fresh blood showed that the prince and his attendants had been busy at sacrifice Footnote. The camel is sacrificed by thrusting a pointed instrument into the interval between the strenum and the neck. This anomaly may be accounted for by the thickness and the hardness of the muscles of the camel's throat. End of footnote. Others stood before their tents, and directing the victim's face towards the Kaaba, cut its throat, ejaculating, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar. Footnote. It is strange that the accurate Burkhardt should make the Muslim say, when slaughtering or sacrificing, in the name of the most merciful God. As Mr. Lane justly observes, the attribute of mercy is omitted on these occasions. End of footnote. The boy Muhammad sneeringly directed my attention to the Indians, who, being a mild race, had hired an Arab butcher to do the deed of blood and he aroused all Sheikh Noor's ire by his taunting comments upon the chicken-heartedness of the men of Hind. It is considered a meritorious act to give away the victim without eating any portion of its flesh. Parties of Takruri might be seen sitting vulture-like, contemplating the sheep and goats, and no sooner was the signal given than they fell upon the bodies and cut them up without removing them. The surface of the valley soon came to resemble the dirtiest slaughter-house, and my prescient soul drew bad auguries for the future. We had spent a sultry afternoon in the basin of Muna, which is not unlike a volcanic crater, an Aden closed up at the seaside. Towards night the occasional puffs of Semum ceased, and through the air of deadly stillness a mass of purple nimbus bisected by a thin grey line of mist cloud rolled down upon us from the taif hills when the darkness gave the signal most of the pilgrims pressed towards the square in front of the munna mosque to enjoy the pyrotechnics and the discharge of cannon but during the spectacle came on a windy storm whose lightnings flashing their fire from pole to pole paled the rockets and whose thunderings re-echoed by the rocky hills dumbed the puny artillery of men we were disappointed in our hopes of rain a few huge drops pattered upon the plain and sank into its thirsty entrails all the rest was thunder and lightning dust clouds and whirlwind End of chapter 30
Chapter 31 of Pilgrimage to El Medina and Mecca. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thelma Meyer. Chapter 31 of Personal Narrative of a Pilgrimage to El Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. The Three Days of Drying Flesh All was dull after the excitement of the great festival. The heat of the succeeding night rendered every effort to sleep abortive, and as our little camp required a guard in a place so celebrated for plunderers, I spent the greater part of the time sitting in the clear, pure moonlight. Footnote 1 it is not safe to perform this ceremony at an early hour, although the ritual forbids it being deferred after sunset. A crowd of women, however, assembled at the devils in the earlier part of the eleventh night, our tenth, and these dames, despite the oriental modesty of face veils, attack a stranger with hands and stones as heartily as English hop-gatherers hastened to duck the Acteon who falls in their way. Hence, popular usage allows stones to be thrown by men until the morning prayers of the eleventh Zul Hijah. End of footnote. After midnight, we again repaired to the devils, and beginning with the Ula, or first pillar, at the eastern extremity of Muna, threw at each seven stones, making a total of twenty-one, with the ceremonies before described. On Thursday, September 15, 1853, we arose before dawn, and prepared with a light breakfast for the fatigues of a climbing walk. After half an hour spent in hopping from boulder to boulder, we arrived at a place situated on the lower declivity of the Jabal Sabir, the northern wall of the Muna Basin. Here is the Majar al Kabsh, the dragging place of the ram, a small whitewashed square divided into two compartments. The first is entered by a few ragged steps in the southeast angle, which lead to an enclosure thirty feet by fifteen. In the northeast corner is a block of granite, A, in which a huge gash, several inches broad, some feet deep, and completely splitting the stone in knife shape, notes the spot where Ibrahim's blade fell when the archangel Gabriel forbade him to slay Ismail, his son. The second compartment contains a diminutive hypogeum, B. In this cave, the patriarch sacrificed the victim, which gives the place a name. We descended by a flight of steps, and under the stifling ledge of rock found mats and praying rugs, which at this early hour were not overcrowded. We followed the example of the patriarchs and prayed a two-bow prayer in each of the enclosures. After distributing the usual gratification, we left the place and proceeded to mount the hill in hope of seeing some of the apes said still to haunt the heights. These animals are supposed by the Meccans to have been Jews, thus transformed for having broken the Sabbath by hunting. Footnote 2 Traditions about these animals vary in the different parts of Arabia. At Aden, for instance, they are supposed to be a remnant of the rebellious tribe of Ad. It is curious that the popular Arabic, like the Persian names Sa'adan, Maimun, Shadi, etc., etc., are all expressive of a probably euphuistic propitiousness. End of footnote. They abound in the elevated regions about Arafat and Taif, where they are caught by mixing the juice of the Asclepius and narcotics with dates 
and other sweet bait. Footnote 3. The Egyptians generally catch, train, and take them to the banks of the Nile, where the Kurayeti, ape leader, is a popular character. End of footnote. The Hadjazi ape is a hideous cynocephalus with small eyes placed close together and almost hidden by a disproportionate snout, a greenish brown coat, long arms, and a stern of lively pink like fresh meat. They are docile and are said to be fond of spirituous liquors and to display an inordinate affection for women. Al Masudi tells about them a variety of anecdotes. According to him, their principal use in Hind and Chin was to protect kings from poison by eating suspected dishes. The Badawin have many tales concerning them. It is universally believed that they catch and kill kites by exposing the rosy portion of their persons and concealing the rest. The bird pounces upon what appears to be raw meat and presently finds himself viciously plucked alive. Throughout Arabia, an old story is told of them. A merchant was once plundered during his absence by a troop of these apes. They tore open his bales and, charmed with the scarlet hue of the tar bushes, began applying these articles of dress to uses quite opposite to their normal purpose. The merchant was in despair when his slave offered for a consideration to recover the goods, placing himself in the front like a fugleman to the ape company he went through a variety of maneuvers with a tar bush and concluded with throwing it far away. The recruits carefully imitated him, and the drill concluded with his firing a shot. The plunderers decamped, and the caps were recovered. Failing to see any apes, we retired to the tent ere the sun waxed hot in anticipation of a terrible day. Nor were we far wrong. In addition to the heat, we had swarms of flies, and the blood-stained earth began to reek with noisome vapors. Naught moved in the air except kites and vultures, speckling the deep blue sky. The denizens of earth seemed paralyzed by the fire from above. I spent the time between breakfast and nightfall, lying half-dressed upon a mat, moving round the tent-pole to escape the glare, and watching my numerous neighbors, male and female. The Indians were particularly kind, filling my pipe, offering cooled water, and performing similar little offices. I repaid them with a supply of provisions, which, at the Muna market prices, these unfortunates could ill afford. When the moon arose, the boy Mohammed and I walked into the town, performed our second lapidation. Footnote 4. The ceremony, as the reader will have perceived, is performed by the Shafis on the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th of Zul Hijjah. The Hanafis conclude their stoning on the 13th. The times vary with each day and differ considerably in religious efficacy. On the night of the 10th, our 9th, for instance, lapidation according to some authorities cannot take place. Others permit it with a sufficient reason. Between the dawn and sunrise it is macru, or disapproved of. Between sunrise and the declination is the sunat time, and therefore the best. From noon to sunset it is muba, or permissible. 
The same is the case with the night, if a cause exist. On the 11th and 12th of Zul Hijjah, lapidation is disapproved of from sunset to sunrise. The sunat is from noon to sunset, and it is permissible at all other hours. The number of stones thrown by the Shafis is 49, viz. seven on the tenth day, seven at each pillar, total 21 on the eleventh day, and the same on the twelfth Zul Hijjah. The Hanafis also throw 21 stones on the thirteenth, which raises their number to 70. The first seven bits of granite must be collected at Muzdalifa. The rest may be taken from the Muna Valley, and all must be washed seven times before being thrown. In throwing, the Hanafis attempt to approach the pillar, if possible, standing within reach of it. Shafis may stand at a greater distance, which should not, however, pass the limit of five cubits. End of footnote and visited the coffee houses. The shops were closed early, but business was transacted in places of public resort till midnight. We entered the houses of numerous acquaintances who accosted my companion and were hospitably welcomed with pipes and coffee. The first question always was, Who is this pilgrim? and more than once the reply, an Afghan, elicited the language of my own country, which I could no longer speak. Of this phenomenon, however, nothing was thought. Many Afghans settled in India know not a word of Pushtu, and even above the passes many of the townspeople are imperfectly acquainted with it. The Meccans, in consequence of their extensive intercourse, with strangers and habits of traveling are admirable conversational linguists. They speak Arabic remarkably well and with a volubility surpassing the most lively of our continental nations. Persian, Turkish, and Hindustani are generally known, and the Mutawifs, who devote themselves to various races of pilgrims, soon become masters of many languages. Returning homewards, we were called to a spot by the clapping of hands. Footnote 5. Here called Safk. It is mentioned by Herodotus and known to almost every Oriental people. The Badawin sometimes, though rarely, use a table or kettle drum. Yet amongst the Parda, or musical modes of the East, we find the Hijazi ranking with the Isfahani and the Iraqi. Southern Arabia has never been celebrated for producing musicians like the banks of the Tigris, to which we owe, besides castanets and cymbals, the guitar, the drum, and the lute, father of the modern harp. The name of this instrument is a corruption of the Arabic al oud Arabic text, through liutu and luth into lut. End of footnote. And the loud sound of song. We found a crowd of Badawin surrounding a group engaged in their favorite occupation of dancing. The performance is wild in the extreme, resembling rather the hopping of bears than the inspirations of Terpiscore. The bystanders joined in the song, an interminable recitative as usual in the minor key, and Orientals are admirable timists. It sounded like one voice. The refrain appeared to be La Yaha, La Yaha, to which no one could assign a meaning. At other times, they sang something intelligible, for instance, Arabic, that is to say. On the great festival day at Muna, I saw my Lord. I am a stranger amongst you, therefore pity me. 
this couplet may have like the puerilities of certain modern and european poets an abstruse and mystical meaning to be discovered when the arabs learn to write erudite essays upon nursery rhymes the style of saltation called rufaya rivaled the song the dancers raised both arms above their heads brandishing a dagger pistol or some other small weapon they followed each other by hops on one or both feet sometimes indulging in the most demented leaps whilst the bystanders clapped with their palms a more enlivening measure this i was told is especially their war dance they have other forms which my eyes were not fated to see amongst the badawin of al hijaz unlike the somali and other african races the sexes never mingle the girls may dance together but it would be disgraceful to perform in the company of men after so much excitement we retired to rest and slept soundly on friday the twelfth zul hija the camels appeared according to order at early dawn and they were loaded with little delay we were anxious to enter mecca in time for the sermon and i for one was eager to escape the now pestilential air of muna literally the land stank five or six thousand animals had been slain and cut up in this devil's punch bowl i leave the reader to imagine the rest the evil might be avoided by building abattoirs or more easily still by digging long trenches and by ordering all pilgrims under pain of mulkt to sacrifice in the same place unhappily the spirit of al islam is opposed to these precautions of common sense inshallah and kismat must take the place of prevention and of cure and at mecca the headquarters of the faith a desolating attack of cholera is preferred to the impiety of flying in the face of providence and the folly of endeavouring to avert inevitable decrees footnote six note to third edition since this was written there have been two deadly epidemics which began it is reported at muna the victims however have never numbered seven hundred thousand nor is each pilgrim required to sacrifice one animal at the shrine of mohammed as we find it in quote, cholera prospects by tilbury fox m d hardwick and a footnote mounting our camels and led by masood we entered muna by the eastern end and from the litter threw the remaining twenty-one stones i could now see the principal lines of shops and having been led to expect a grand display of merchandise was surprised to find only mat booths and sheds stocked chiefly with provisions the exit from muna was crowded for many like ourselves were flying from the revolting scene i could not think without pity of those whom religious scruples detained another day and a half in this foul spot after entering mecca we bathed and when the noon drew nigh we repaired to the harim for the purpose of hearing the sermon descending to the cloisters below the bab al ziyada i stood wonderstruck by the scene before me the vast quadrangle was crowded with worshippers sitting in long rows and everywhere facing the central black tower the showy colours of their dresses were not to be surpassed by a garden of the most brilliant flowers and such diversity of detail would probably not be seen massed together in any other building upon earth the women a dull and sombre-looking group sat apart in their peculiar place 
the Pasha stood on the roof of Zemzem, -Zem, surrounded by guards in Nizam uniform, where the principal Ulema stationed themselves. The crowd was thicker, and in the more auspicious spots naught was to be seen but a pavement of heads and shoulders. Nothing seemed to move but a few darwayshis who, censer in hand, sidled through the rows and received the unsolicited arms of the faithful. Apparently in the midst, and raised above the crowd by the tall pointed pulpit whose gilt spire flamed in the sun, sat the preacher, an old man with snowy beard, the style of headdress called Taylasan. Footnote 7. A scarf thrown over the head, with one end brought round under the chin and passed over the left shoulder, composes the Tylosan. End of footnote. Covered his turban, which was as white as his robes. Footnote 8. As late as Ibn Jaber's time, the preacher was habited from head to foot in black, and two muazins held black flags fixed in rings on both sides of the pulpit with the staves propped upon the first step and a footnote and a short staff supported his left hand footnote nine mr lane remarks that the wooden sword is never held by the preacher but in a country that has been won from infidels by the muslims burckhardt more correctly traces the origin of the custom to the early days of al-islam when the preachers found it necessary to be prepared for surprises and all authors who like ibn jubair described the meccan ceremonies mention the sword or staff the curious reader will consult this most accurate of muslim travellers and a perusal of the pages will show that anciently the sermon differed considerably from and was far more ceremonious than the present kutbah and a footnote presently he arose took the staff in his right hand pronounced a few inaudible words footnote ten the words were peace be upon ye and the mercy of allah and his blessings and a footnote and sat down again on one of the lower steps while a muazin at the foot of the pulpit recited the call to sermon then the old man stood up and began to preach as the majestic figure began to exert itself there was a deep silence presently a general amin was intoned by the crowd at the conclusion of some long sentence and at last toward the end of the sermon every third or fourth word was followed by the simultaneous rise and fall of thousands of voices i have seen the religious ceremonies of many lands but never nowhere aught so solemn so impressive as this end of chapter thirty one recording by thelma meyer brooklyn new york Chapter thirty two of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage from El Medina to Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter thirty two of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage from El Medina to Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. Life at Mecca and the Umrah or the Little Pilgrimage. My few remaining days at Mecca sped pleasantly enough. Umar Effendi visited me regularly, and arranged to accompany me furtively to Cairo. I had already consulted Muhammad Shaklibha, who suddenly appeared at Mina, having dropped down from Suez to Jeddah, and having reached Mecca in time for pilgrimage, about the possibility of proceeding eastward. The honest fellow's eyebrows rose till they almost touched his turban, and he exclaimed in a roaring voice, Allah, Fendi, thou art surely mad. Every day he brought me news of the different caravans. 
the bedouin of al hijaz were he said in a ferment caused by the reports of the holy war want of money and rumours of quarrels between the sharif and the pasha already they spoke of an attack upon jeddah sheikh masoud the camel-man for whom i parted on the best of terms seriously advised my remaining at mecca for some months even before proceeding to sana'a others gave the same counsel briefly i saw that my star was not in the ascendant and resolved to reserve myself for more propitious conjuncture by returning to egypt the turkish colonel and i had become as friendly as two men ignoring each other's speech could be he had derived benefit from prescription but like all his countrymen he was pining to leave mecca Footnote. no more than one quarter of the pilgrims who appear at arafat go on to El medina the expense the hardships and the dangers of the journey account for the smallness of the number in theology it is jais or admissible to begin with the prophet's place of burial but those performing the hajjat al-islam are enjoined to commence at mecca End of footnote. whilst the pilgrimage lasted no malady came to trouble them but with its excitement over they could think of nothing but their wives and children long-drawn faces and continual sighs evidenced nostalgia at last the house became a scene of preparation blue chinaware basketed bottles of zamzam water appeared standing in solid columns and pilgrims occupied themselves in hunting for mementos of mecca ground plants combs balm henna tooth sticks aloe woods turquoise coral and mother-of-pearl rosaries shreds of kiswa cloth and fine abas or cloaks of camel's wool it was not safe to mount the stairs without shouting Tariq! out of the way at every step on peril of meeting face to face some excited fair footnote where respectable married men live together in the same house a rare occurrence except on journeys this most ungallant practice of clearing the way is and must be kept up in the east End of footnote. the lower floor was crowded with provision vendors and the staple article of conversation seemed to be the chance of a steamer from jeddah to suez weary of the wrangling and chaffering of the hall below i had persuaded my kind hostess in spite of the surly skeleton that her brother was partially to clear out a small storeroom in the first floor and to abandon it to me between the hours of ten and four during the heat of the day clothing is unendurable at mecca the city is so compacted together by hills that even the samum can scarcely sweep it the heat reverberated by the bare rocks is intense and the normal atmosphere of an eastern town communicates a faint lassitude to the body and irritability to the mind the houses being unusually strong and well built might by some art of their antidote be rendered cool enough in the hottest weather but they are now ovens footnote i offer no length of description of the town of mecca ali bey and burckhardt have already said all that requires saying although the origin of the Baytullah be lost in the glooms of past time the city is comparatively modern place built at about a d four hundred fifty by qusay and quraysh it contains about thirty thousand to forty five thousand inhabitants with lodging rooms for at least treble that number and the material of the houses is brick granite and sandstone from the neighbouring hills the site is a winding valley on a small plateau half way below the gulfs its utmost length is two miles and a half from Ma'daba at the north to the southern mount jihad and three-quarters of a mile would be the extreme breadth between abu Qubais eastward upon whose western slope the most solid mass of the town clusters and jabal hindi westward of the city in the centre of this line stands the kaaba i regret being unable to offer the reader a sketch of mecca or of the great temple the stranger who would do this should visit the city out of the pilgrimage season and hire a room looking into the quadrangle of the harem this addition to our knowledge is more required as our popular sketches generally taken from dusson are utterly incorrect the kaaba is always a recognizable building but the view of mecca known to europe is not more like mecca than like cairo or bombay and a footnote. it was my habit to retire immediately after the late breakfast to the little room upstairs to sprinkle it with water and to lie down on a mat in the few precious moments of privacy notes were committed to paper but one eye was ever fixed on the door 
Sometimes a patient would interrupt me, but a doctor is far less popular in al Hijaz than Egypt. The people, being more healthy, have less faith in physics. Sheikh Mas'ud and his son had never tasted in their lives aught more medicinal than green dates and camel's milk. Occasionally the black slave girls came into the room asking if the pilgrim wanted a pipe or a cup of coffee. They generally retired in a state of delight, attempting vainly to conceal with a corner of a tattered veil a grand display of ivory consequent upon some small and innocent facetiousness. The most frequent of my visitors was Abdullah, the Kabira's eldest son. This melancholy Jacques had joined our caravan at al Hamra on the Yambar road accompanied us to al medina lived there and journeyed to mecca with the syrian pilgrimage yet he had not once come to visit me or his brother the boy mohammed when gently reproached for this omission he declared it to be his way that he never called upon strangers until sent for he was the perfect saudawi or melancholist in mind manners and personal appearance and this class of humanity in the east is almost as uncomfortable to the household as the idiot of europe i was frequently obliged to share my meals with him as his mother though most filially and reverentially entreated would not supply him with breakfast two hours after the proper time or with a dinner served up forty minutes before the rest of the household often too i had to curb by polite deprecation the impetuosity of the fiery old kabira's tongue thus abdullah and i became friends after a fashion he purchased several little articles required and never failed to pass hours in my closet giving me much information about the country deploring the laxity of meccan morals and lamenting that in these evil days his countrymen had forfeited their name at cairo and constantinople his curiosity about the english in india was great and i satisfied it by praising as a muslim would their politique their even-handed justice and their good star then he would inquire into the truth of a fable extensively known on the shores of the mediterranean and of the red sea the english it is said sent a mission to mohammed inquiring into his doctrines and begging that the heroic khalid bin al walid might be sent to proselytize them Footnote. it is curious that the afghans should claim this Quraysh noble as their compatriot on one occasion when khalid bin al walid was saying something in his native tongue the pushtu or afghani muhammad remarked that assuredly that language was the peculiar dialect of the damned as khalid appeared to suffer from the observation and to betray certain symptoms of insubordination the prophet condescended to comfort him by graciously pronouncing the words Rache linda raora i e bring me my bow and arrows remarks on dr dorn's Christomati of the pushtu or afghan language translated bombay asiatic society eighteen forty eight end of footnote unfortunately the envoys arrived too late the prophet's soul had winged its way to paradise an abstract of the muslim scheme was however sent to the ingris who declined as the founder of the new faith was no more to abandon their own religion but the refusal was accompanied with expressions of regard for this reason many muslims in barbary and other countries hold the english to be people of the books and the best inclined towards them as regards the prophet's traditions concerning the fall of his birthplace and the thin car from the habash abyssinian shall destroy the kaaba i was informed that towards the end of time a host will pass from africa in such multitudes that a stone shall be conveyed from hand to hand between jeddah and mecca this latter condition might easily be accomplished by sixty thousand men the distance being only forty-four miles but the citizens consider it to express a countless horde some pious muslims have hoped that in abdullah bin zubair's re-erection of the kaaba the prophecy was fulfilled footnote see the ninth building of the kaaba described in chapter four and a footnote the popular belief however remains that the fatal event is still in the womb of time in a previous part of this volume i have alluded to similar evil presentiments which haunt the mind of al-islam and the christians zealous for the propagation of his faith may see in them an earnest of its still wider diffusion in future ages footnote 
it requires not the ken of a prophet to foresee the day when political necessity will compel us to occupy in force the fountain head of al-islam End of footnote. late in the afternoon i used to rise perform ablution and repair to the haram or wander about the bazaars till sunset after this it was necessary to return home and prepare for supper or dinner it would be called in the west with the meal concluded i used to sit for a time outside the street door in great dignity upon a broken-backed black wood chair traditionally said to have been left in the house by one of the princes of delhi smoking a shisha and drinking sundry cups of strong green tea with a slice of lime a fair substitute for milk at this hour the seat was as in a theatre but the words of the actor were of nature somewhat too fascinating for a respectable public after nightfall we either returned to the harem or retired to rest our common dormitory was the flat roof of the house under each cot stood a water gugglet and all slept as must be done in the torrid lands on and not in bed i sojourned at mecca but a short time and as usual with travellers did not see the best specimens of the population the citizens appeared to me more civilized and more vicious than those of al medina they often leave home where small experience grows and qui multum pregri natur raro sancti ficatur or become a worldly wise god-forgetting and a mammonish sort of folk circumambulate and run between safa and marwa and commit the seven deadly sins is a satire popularly levelled against them hence to the proverb al haram fil haramain evil dwelleth in the two holy cities and no wonder since plenary indulgence is so easily secured footnote good acts done at mecca are rewarded a hundred thousandfold in heaven yet it is not auspicious to dwell there umar informs us that an evil deed receives the punishment of seventy End of footnote. the pilgrim is forbidden or rather dissuaded from abiding at mecca after the rites and wisely too great emotions must be followed by a reaction and he who stands struck by the first aspect of allah's house after a few months the marvel waxing stale sweeps past with indifference or something worse there is however little at mecca to offend the eye as among certain nations further west a layer of ashes overspreads the fire the mine is concealed by a green turf fair to look upon it is only when wandering by starlight through the northern outskirts of the town that citizens may be seen with light complexions and delicate limbs coarse turbans and egyptian woolen robes speaking disguise and the purpose of disguise no one within the memory of man has suffered the penalty of immorality spirituous liquors are no longer sold in shops as in burckhardt's day Footnote it must be remembered that my predecessor visited mecca when the egyptian army commanded by muhammad ali held the town and, footnote. and some are not officers assured me that they found considerable difficulty in smuggling flasks of araki from jidda the meccan is darker a man than the medinet the people explain this by the heat of the climate i rather believe it to be caused by the number of female slaves that find their way into the market gallas swahilis a few somalis and the abyssinians are embarked at suakin zayla tajurra and berbera carried in thousands to jidda and the holy city has the pick of every batch thence the stream sets northwards a small current towards el medina and the main line to egypt and turkey Footnote in another place i have ventured a few observations concerning the easy suppression of this traffic and a footnote. most meccans have black concubines and as has been said the appearance of the sharif is almost that of a negro i did not see one handsome man in the holy city although some of the women appeared to me beautiful the male profile is high and bony the forehead recedes and the head rises unpleasantly towards the region of firmness 
in most families male children when forty days old are taken to the kaaba prayed over and carried home where the barber draws with the razor three parallel gashes down the fleshy portion of each cheek from the exterior angle of the eyes almost to the corners of the mouths these mashali as they are called may be of modern date footnote the art is called tashrib or gashing the body is also marked but with smaller cuts so that the child is covered with blood ali bey was told by some meccans that the face gashes served the purpose of phlebotomy by others that they were signs that the scarred was the servant of allah's house he attributes this male gashing like female tattooing to coquetry the citizens told me that the custom arose from the necessity of preserving children from the kidnapping persians and that it preserved as mark of the holy city but its wide diffusion denotes an earlier origin mohammed expressly forbade his followers to mark the skin with scars these beauty marks are common to the nations in the regions to the west of the red sea the barabara of upper egypt adorn their faces with scars exactly like the meccans the abyssinians moksa themselves in hita combs for fashion's sake i have seen cheeks gashed as in the holy city among the gallas certain races of the swahili trace around the head a corona of little cuts like those of a cupping instrument and to quote no other instances some somalis raise ghastly seams upon their chocolate-coloured skins End of footnote. the citizens declare that the custom was unknown to their ancestors i am tempted to assign to it a high antiquity and cannot but attribute a pagan origin to a custom still prevailing despite all the interdictions of the ulama in point of figure the meccan is somewhat coarse and lymphatic the ludicrous leanness of the outward man as described by ali bey survives only in the remnants of themselves belonging to a bygone century the young men are rather stout and athletic but in middle age when man swills and swells they are apt to degenerate into corpulence the meccan is a covetous spendthrift his wealth lightly won is lightly prized pay pension stipends presents and the ikram here as at al medina supply the citizen with the means of idleness with him everything is on the most expensive scale his marriage his religious ceremonies and his household expenses his house is luxuriously furnished entertainments are frequent and the junketings of his women make up a heavy bill at the end of the year it is common practice for the citizen to anticipate the pilgrimage season by falling into the hands of the usurer if he be in luck he catches and skin one or more of the richest hajis on the other hand should fortune fail him he will feel for life the effect of interest running on at the rate of at least fifty per cent the simple and compound forms of which are equally familiar to the wily sarraf footnote sairafi money changer sarraf is banker the indian shroff is banker money changer and usurer and a footnote the most unpleasant peculiarities of the meccans are their pride and coarseness of language footnote when speaking of the meccans i allude only to the section of society which fell under my observation and that more extensive division concerning which i obtained notices that could be depended upon and a footnote. looking upon themselves as the cream of earth's sun they resent with extreme asperity the least slighting word concerning the holy city and its denizens they plume themselves upon their holy descent their exclusion of infidels footnote the editor of burckhardt's travel in arabia supposes that his author's sect of light extinguishers were probably parsees from surat or bombay the mistake is truly ludicrous for no pious parsee will extinguish a light moreover infidels are not allowed by law to pass the frontiers of the sanctuary the sect alluded to is an obscure heresy in central asia and concerning it the most improbable scandals have been propagated by the orthodox and a footnote their strict fastings their learned men and the purity of their language footnote 
it is strange how travellers and linguists differ upon the subject of arabic and its dialects Niepor compares their relation to that of Provencal, Spanish, and Italian, whereas Lane declares the dialects to resemble each other more than those of some different countries in England. Herbin, or grammar, draws a broad line between ancient and modern Arabic, but Hawks, or Nachrichten von Marokos und Fez, asserts that the difference is not so great as is imagined perhaps the soundest opinion is that proposed by claudius in his arabic grammar dialecticus arabum vulgaris tantum differt ab erudita quantum isocrates dictio ab hodierna lingua grecia but it must be remembered that the arabs divide their spoken and even written language into two orders the kalam wati or vulgar tongue sometimes employed in epistolary correspondence and the nahwi or grammatical and classical tongue every man of education uses the former and can use the latter and the koran is no more a model of arabic as it is often assumed to be than paradise lost is of english inimitable but no man imitates them End of footnote in fact their pride shows itself at every moment but it is not their pride which makes a man too proud to do dirty work my predecessor did not remark their scurrility he seems on the contrary rather to commend them for respectability in this point if he be correct the present generation has degenerated the meccans appear to me distinguished even in this foul-mouthed east by the superior licentiousness of their language abuse was bad enough in the streets but in the house it became intolerable the turkish pilgrims remarked but they were too proud to notice it the boy mohammed and one of his tall cousins at last transgressed the limits of my endurance they had been reviling each other vilely one day at the house door about dawn when i administered the most open reprimand in my country afghanistan we hold this to be the hour of prayer the season of good thoughts when men remember allah even the kafir doth not begin the day with curses and abuse the people around approved and the offenders could not refrain from saying thou hast spoken truth o Fendi. then the bystanders began as usual to improve the occasion see they exclaimed this suleimani gentleman he is not the son of a holy city and yet he teaches you yea the children of the prophet repent and fear allah to which they replied verily we do repent and allah is a pardoner and the merciful were silent for an hour and then abused each other more foully than before yet it is a good point in the meccan character that it is open to reason it can confess itself in error and it displays none of that darkness of vice which distinguishes the sinner of a more stolid race like the people of southern europe the samite is easily managed by jest though grave and thoughtful he is by no means deficient in the sly wit which we call humour and the solemn gravity of his words contrasts amusingly with his ideas he particularly excels in the cervantic art the spirit of which says sterne is to clothe low subjects in sublime language in mohammed's life we find that he by no means disdained a joke sometimes a little hazard as in the case of the paradise coveting old woman the redeeming qualities of the meccan are his courage his bonhomie his manly suavity of manners his fiery sense of honour his strong family affections his near approach to what we call patriotism and his general knowledge the reproach of extreme ignorance which burckhardt directs against the holy city has long ago sped to the limbo of things that were the dark half of the picture is formed by pride bigotry irreligion greed of gain immorality and prodigal ostentation of the pilgrimage ceremonies i cannot speak harshly it may be true that the rites of the kaaba emasculated of every idolatrous tendency still hang a strange unmeaning shroud around the living theism of al-islam
but what nation neither in the west or in the east has been able to cast out from its ceremonies every suspicion of its old idolatry what are the english mistletoe the irish wake the pardon of brittany the carnival and the worship at iserna better far to consider the meccan pilgrimage rites in the light of evil worship turned into lessons of good than to philosophize about their strangers and to blunder in asserting them to be insignificant even the bedouin circumambulating the kaaba fortifies his wild belief by the fond thought that he treads the path of allah's friend at arafat the good muslim worships in imitation of the pure allah footnote safiullah or adam End of footnote. and when hurling stones and curses at three senseless little buttresses which commemorate the appearance of a fiend the materialism of the action gives to its sentiment all the strength and endurance of reality the supernatural agencies of pilgrimage are carefully and sparingly distributed the angels who restore the stones from munna to muzdalifa the heavenly host whose opinions cause the kaaba's veil to rise and wave and the mysterious complement of the pilgrims total at the arafat sermon all belong to the category of spiritual creatures walking earth unseen a poetical tenet not condemned by christianity the meccans are it is true to be reproached with their open mammon worship at times and at places the most sacred and venerable but this has no other effect upon the pilgrims than to excite disgust and open reprehension here however we see no such silly frost as heavenly fire drawn from a phosphorus match nor do two rival churches fight in the flesh with teeth and nails requiring the contemptuous interference of an infidel power to keep a round order here we see no fair dames staring with their glasses rocks at the head of the church or supporting exhausted nature with the furtive sandwich or carrying pampered curs who too often will not be silent or scrambling and squeezing to hear theatrical music reckless of the fate of the old lady who on such occasion there is always one has been thrown down and cruelly trampled upon by the crowd if the meccan citizens are disposed to scoff at the wild takruri they do it not so publicly or shamelessly as the roman jeering with the ribald jest at the fanaticism of strangers from the bogs of ireland finally at mecca there is nothing theatrical nothing that suggests the opera but all is simple and impressive filling the mind with a weight of awe not easy to be borne and tending i believe after its own fashion to good as regards to the meccan and muslim belief that abraham and his son built the kaaba it may be observed the eugenistic account of the great patriarch has suggested to learned men the idea of two abrahams one the son of terah and one the son of azer the fire a prometheus who imported civilization and knowledge into arabia from haram the sacred centre of sabaean learning footnote the legend that abraham was the son of fire might have arisen from his birthplace ur of the chaldees this ur whence the latin uro becomes in persian hair or in arabic ir or ar it explains the origin of orotalt better than by means of allah ta'ala this word variously spelt orotalt orotalt and orotal the latter would be the masculine form in arabic is urrat ilat or the goddess of fire most probably the sun a shuns, which the semites make a feminine for begin translated sonen got an error of gender as the final consonant proves the other deity of pagan arabia alilat is clearly alat may not the phoenicians have supplied the word er which still survives in erin and in ireland even so they gave to the world the name of britain Britainke, barat et tanuki, the land of tin and i should more readily believe that iran is the land of fire and accept its derivation from ir or a man End of footnote. muslim historians all agree in representing abraham as the star worshipper in youth and eusebius calls the patriarch a son of athar his father's name 
therefore is no arab invention whether ishmael or his sire ever visited mecca to build kaaba is in my humble opinion an open question the jewish scripture informs us only that the patriarch dwelt at beersheba in gerar in the southwest of palestine without any allusion to the annual visit which muslims declare he paid to their holy city at the same time arab tradition speaks clearly and consistently upon the subject and generally omits those miraculous and superstitious adjuncts which cast shadows of sore doubt upon the philosophic mind the amount of risk which a stranger must encounter at the pilgrimage rites is still considerable a learned orientalist and divine intimated his intention in a work published a few years ago of visiting mecca without disguise he was assured that the turkish governor would now offer no obstacle to a european traveller i was strongly dissuade a friend from making the attempt it is true that the frank is no longer as in captain head's day insulted when he ventures out of the meccan gate of jeddah footnote captain c f head author of eastern and egyptian scenery was pelted by the bedouin as late as eighteen twenty nine because he passed the eastern gate of jeddah in frankish dress and a footnote and that our vice consuls and travellers are allowed on condition that their glands do not pollute the shrine to visit taif and the regions lying eastward of the holy city neither the pasha nor the sharif would in these days dare to enforce in the case of an englishman the old law a choice thrice offered between circumcision and death but the first bedouin who caught sight of the frank's hat would not deem himself a man if he did not drive a bullet through the wearer's head at the pilgrimage season disguise is easy on the account of the vast and varied multitudes which visit mecca exposing the traveller only to stand the buffet with knaves who smell of sweat but woe to the unfortunate who happens to be recognized in public as an infidel unless he could throw himself at once upon the protection of the government footnote the best way would be to rush if possible into a house and the owner would then for his own interest as well as honour defend a stranger till assistance could be procured and a footnote amidst however a crowd of pilgrims whose fanaticism is worked up to the highest pitch detection would probably ensure his dismissal at once al numero de piu those who find danger the salt of pleasure may visit mecca but if asked whether the result justifies the risk i should reply in negative and the vice-consul at jeddah would only do his duty in peremptorily forbidding european travellers to attempt mecca without disguise until the day comes when such steps can be taken in the certainty of not causing a mishap an accident would not redound to our reputation as we could not in justice revenge it footnote future pilgrims must also remember that the season is gradually receding towards the heart of the hot weather for the next fifteen years therefore an additional risk will attend the traveller on the fourteenth of the hijjah we started to perform the rite of umrah or little pilgrimage after performing ablution and resuming the ihram with the usual ceremonies i set out accompanied by the boy mohammed and his brother abdullah mounting asses which resembled mules in size and speed footnote pliny is certainly right about this useful quadruped and its congeners the zebra and the wild ass in describing it as animal frigors maxim impatiens it degenerates in cold regions unless as in afghanistan and barbary there be a long hot and dry summer Aden, Kutch, and Baghdad have pine breeds, whereas those of India and southeastern Africa are poor and weak. The best and the highest price come from the Maghrib, and the second to them in ranks is the Egyptian race. At Mecca, careful feeding and kind usage transform the dull slave into an active and symmetrical friend of man. He knows his owner's kind voice, and if one of the two fast, it is generally the biped the asses of the holy city are tall and plump with sleek coats generally ash or grey coloured the eyes of deer has gracefully carried an ambling gait and extremely sure-footed they are equal to great fatigue and the stallions have been known in their ferocity to kill the groom the prices varies from twenty-five to a hundred and fifty dollars 
We rode to the Haram and prayed there. Again remounting, we issued through the Bab al-Safa towards the open country north-east of the city. The way was crowded with pilgrims, on foot as well as mounted, and their loud labbaiks distinguished those engaged in Umrah from those whose business was with the camp of the Damascus caravan. At about half a mile from the city we passed on the left a huge heap of stones, where my companion stood and cursed. This grim-looking cairn is popularly believed to note the place of the well where Abu Lahab laid an ambuscade for the Prophet this wicked uncle stationed there a slave with orders to throw headlong into the pit the first person who approached him and privily persuaded his nephew to visit the spot at night after a time anxiously hoping to hear that the deed had been done abu lahab incautiously drew nigh and was precipitated by his own bravo into the place of destruction footnote such is the popular version of the tale which differs in some points from that recorded in books others declare that here in days gone by stood the house of another notorious malignant abu jahal some again suppose that in this place a tyrannical governor of mecca was summarily lynched by the indignant populace the first two traditions however are favourites the vulgar citizens as well as pilgrims loving to connect such places with the events of their early sacred history even in the twelfth century we read that pilgrims used to cast stones at two cairns covering the remains of abu lahab and the beautiful termagant his wife and a footnote. hence the well-known saying in al-islam whoso diggeth a well for his brother shall fall into it himself we added our quota of stones footnote. Certain credulous authors have contrasted these heaps with the clear ground at minna for the purpose of a minor miracle According to them, this cairn steadily grows, as may believed it would, and that, were it not for the guardian angels, the millions of little stones annually thrown at the devils would soon form a mass of equal magnitude. This custom of lapidation, in token of hate, is an ancient practice still common in the East, yet in some parts of Arabia stones are thrown at tombs as a compliment to the tenant and in the somali country the places where it is said holy men sat receive the same doubtful homage and a footnote and proceeding we saw the jeddah road spanning the plain like a white ribbon in front of us the highway was now lined with coffee tents before which effeminate dancing boys performed to admiring syrians a small whitewashed bungalow the place of the amir al hajj lay on the left and all around it clustered the motley encampment of his pilgrims after cantering about three miles from the city we reached the alamein or two pillars that limit the sanctuary and a little beyond it is the small settlement popularly called al umra footnote it is called in books at the Neem bestowing plenty a word which readers must not confound with a district of the same name in the province of kaulan made by nibhur the tumna or thumna or temna capital of the katabanites other authors apply at tanim to the spot where abu lahab is supposed to lie there are two places called al umra near mecca the kabir or the greater is i am told in the wadi fatma and the prophet ordered aisha and her sister to begin the ceremonies at that place it is now visited by picnic parties and those who would pray at the tomb of maimuna one of the prophet's wives modern pilgrims commence always i am told at the umr al sagir or the lesser which is about half way nearer to the city and a footnote dismounting here we sat down on rugs outside a coffee tent to enjoy the beauty of the moonlight and an hour of kaif in the sweet air of the desert presently the coffee tent keeper after receiving payment brought us water for ablution this preamble over we enter the principal chapel an unpretending building badly lighted spread with dirty rugs full of pilgrims and offensively close here we prayed the isha or the night devotions and then a two-bow prayer in honour of the ihram footnote some assume the ihram garb at this place and a footnote after which we distribute gratuities to the guardians and alms to the importunate beggars and now i perceive the object of abdullah's companionship 
the melancholy man assured me that he had ridden out for love of me and in order to perform as wakil or substitute a vicarious pilgrimage for my parents vainly i assured him that they had been strict in the exercise of their faith he would take no denial and i perceived that love of me meant love of my dollars with a surly assent he was at last permitted to act for the pious pilgrim yusuf or joseph bin ahmed and fatima bin Yunus, my progenitors it was impossible to prevent smiling at contrast as abdullah gravely raising his hands and in directing his face to the kaaba intoned i do vow the sehram of umrah in the name of yusuf son of ahmed and fatima daughter of yunus then render it attainable unto them and accept it of them bismillah allahu akbar remounting we galloped towards mecca shouting labbaik and halting at every half mile to smoke and drink coffee in short time we entered the city and repairing to the haram by the safa gate performed the tawaf or circumambulation of umrah after this dull round and necessary repose we left the temple by the same exit and mounting once more we turned towards the safa which stands about a hundred yards south-east of the mosque and as little deserves this name of mountain as do those that undulate the face of modern rome the safa end is closed by a mean-looking building composed of three round arches with a dwarf flight of stairs leading up to them out of a narrow road without dismounting we wheeled our donkeys around footnote we had still the pretext of my injured foot when the sa'i rite is performed as it should be by a pedestrian he mounts the step to about the height of a man and then turns towards the temple and a footnote left shoulders forward no easy task in the crowd and vainly striving to sight the kaaba through the baba safa performed the niyat or vow of the right as sa'i or the running footnote i will not trouble the reader with the niyat which is the same as that is used in the tawaf rite and a footnote after tahlil takbir and talbiyat we raise our hands in the supplicatory position and twice repeat it there is no god but allah alone without partner his is the kingdom unto him be praise he giveth life and death he is alive and perisheth not in his hand is good and he over all things is omnipotent footnote almost every mutawif it is must be remembered has his own set of prayers and a footnote then with the donkey boys leading our animals and a stout fellow preceding us with lantern and a quarter staff to keep off the running bedouin camel men and the riders of asses we descended safa and walked slowly down the street al masa towards marwa footnote safa means large hard rock marwa means hard white flints full of fire and a footnote during our descent we recited aloud o allah cause me to act according to the sunnah of thy prophet and to die in his faith and defend me from errors and disobedience by thy mercy o most merciful of the merciful arrived at what is called the batna al wadi belly of the valley a place now denoted by the alamein al akhdarain or the two green pillars one fixed in the eastern course of the haram footnote in former times a devastating torrent used to sweep this place after the rains the fumara bed has now disappeared and the pillars are used as landmarks galland observes that these columns are planted upon the place which supported eve's knees when after three hundred years of separation she was found by adam and a footnote the other in a house on the right side footnote this house is called rubat al abbas and a footnote we began the running by urging our beasts here the prayer was o lord pardon and pity and pass over what thou knowest for thou art the most dear the most gracious save us from hell-fire safely and cause us safely to enter paradise o lord give us happiness here and happiness hereafter and spare us the torture of the flames at the end of this supplication we passed the button or lowest ground whose farthest limits were marked by two other pillars footnote here one stood asaf and naila the two idols some say a man and a woman metamorphosed for separation in the temple and a footnote again we began to ascend repeating as we went verily safa and marwa are two of the monuments of allah 
whoso therefore pilgrimeth to the temple of mecca or performeth umrah it shall be no crime in him to run between them both and as for him who voluntarily doeth a good deed verily allah is graceful and omniscient footnote quran chapter two and a footnote at length we reached marwa a little rise like safa in the lower slope of abu Qubais. the houses cluster in amphitheatre shape above it and from the mas'a or the street below a short flight of steps to a platform bounded on three sides like a tennis court by three walls without arches the streets seen from above was a bowstring curve it is between eight and nine hundred feet long with high houses on both sides and small lanes branching from it footnote ibn jubayr gives eight hundred ninety three steps other authorities make the distance seven hundred and eighty short cubits the size of an average man's forearm and a footnote at the foot of the platform we brought right shoulders forward so as to face the kaaba and raising hands to ears thrice exclaimed allahu akbar this concluded the first course and of these heaven composed the ceremony as say or the running there was a startling contrast to the origin of this ceremony when the poor outcast on the cheerless wild arabia's parent clasped her fainting child as the turkish infantry marched in european dress with sloped arms down the mesa to relieve guard by the side of the half-naked running bedouin they looked as if epochs disconnected by long centuries had met a laxity too there was in the frequent appearances of dogs upon this holy and most memorial ground which said little in favour of the religious strictness of the administration footnote the ceremony of running between safa and marwa is supposed to represent hagar seeking water for her son usually pilgrims perform this rite in the morning of visiting the kaaba and a footnote our say ended at mount marwa there we dismounted and sat outside the barber's shop on the right hand of the street he operated upon our heads causing us to repeat o oh allah this my forelock is in thy hand then grant me for every hair a light on the resurrection day o oh, most merciful of the merciful this and the paying for it constituted the fourth portion of the umrah or little pilgrimage throwing the skirt of our garments over our heads to show that our ihram was now exchanged for the normal state or the ihlal we cantered to the haram prayed there to bow prayer and returned home not a little fatigued End of chapter thirty two Chapter thirty three of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to El Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter thirty three of Personal Narrative of a Pilgrimage to El Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. Places of Pious Visitation at Mecca the traveller has little work at the holy city with exceptions of jabal nur and jabal thor all the places of pious visitation lie inside or close outside the city footnote jabal nur or jabal hira has been mentioned before jabal thor rises at some distance to the south of mecca and contains the celebrated cave in which muhammad and abu bakr took refuge during the flight End of footnote it is well worth the while to ascend abu Qubais, not so much to inspect the makan al hajar and the shak al qamar the tradition of these places is related by every historian the former is the repository of the black stone during the deluge the latter splitting of the moon is the spot where the prophet stood when to convert the idolatrous quraysh he caused half the orb of the night to rise from behind abu Qubais and the other from jabal qayqa'an on the western horizon this silly legend appears unknown to muhammad's day and a footnote as to obtain an excellent bird's eye view of the haram and the parts adjacent footnote the pilgrimage season strictly speaking concluded this year on the seventeenth of september or thirteenth of the hijjah at which time travellers began to move towards jidda 
those who purposed visiting al medina would start about three weeks afterwards and many who had leisure intended witnessing the muharram ceremonies at mecca and a footnote the boy mohammed had applied himself sedulously to commerce after his return home and had actually been seen by sheikh nur sitting at a shop and selling small curiosities with my plenary consent i was made over to abdullah his brother on the morning of the fifteenth of the hijjah nineteenth of september he hired two asses and accompanied me as guide to the holy places mounting our animals we followed the road before described to the jannat al ma'la the sacred cemetery of mecca a rough wall with a poor gateway encloses a patch of barren and grim-looking ground at the foot of a chain which bounds the city's western suburb and below al aqaba the gap through which khalid bin al walid entered mecca with a triumphant prophet footnote this is the local tradition it does not agree with authentic history muir in life of muhammad volume four page hundred twenty six reminds me that khalid and his bedouin attacked the citizens of mecca without the prophet's leave but after the attack he may have followed in his leader's train and a footnote inside are a few ignoble whitewashed domes all are of modern construction for here as at al baqar further north the wahhabis indulge their levelling propensities footnote the reason of their vandalism has been noticed in a previous volume End of footnote. the rest of the ground shows some small enclosures belonging to particular houses equivalent to our family vaults and the ruins of humble tombs lying in confusion whilst a few parched alloys spring from between the bricks and stones footnote the alloy here as in egypt is hung like the dried crocodile over houses as talisman against evil spirits burckhardt assigns as a motive for it being planted in graveyards that its name sabir denotes the patience with which the believer awaits the last day and lane remarks the alloy thus hung over the door without earth and water will live several years and even blossom hence it is called saber which signifies patience in india it is hung up to prevent mosquitoes entering a room i believe the superstition to be a fragment of african fetishism the gallas to the present day plant always on graves and supposes that when the plant sprouts the deceased has been admitted into the gardens of wak the creator ideas breed vocables but seldom except among rhymesters does the vocable give birth to a popular idea and in arabic sabr as well as sabr is the name for alloy and a footnote the cemetery is celebrated in local history here the body of abdullah bin zubair was exposed by the order of hajjaj bin yusuf and the number of saints buried in it has been so numerous that even the twelfth century may have fallen into oblivion it is visited by the citizens on fridays and by women on thursdays to prevent the meeting of sexes which in the east is so detrimental to public decorum i shall be sparing in my description of the mala ceremonies as the prayers prostrations and supplications are almost identical with those performed at al baqar after a long supplication pronounced standing at the doorway we entered and sauntered about the burial ground on the left of the road stood an enclosure which according to abdullah belonged to his family the door and stone slabs being valuable to the poor had been removed and the graves of his forefathers appeared to have been invaded by the jackal he sighed recited a fatha with tears in his eyes and hurried me away from the spot the first dome which we visited covered the remains of abdurrahman the son of abu bakr one of the worthies of al-islam equally respected by sunni and by shia the tomb was a simple catafalque spread with the usual cloth after performing our devotions at this grave and distributing a few piastres to the guardians and beggars we crossed the main path and found ourselves at the door of the cupola beneath which sleeps the venerable khadija mohammed's first wife the tomb was covered with a green cloth and the walls of the little building were decorated with written specimens of religious poetry a little beyond it we were shown into another dome the resting place of siti amina the prophet's mother footnote burckhardt mentions the tomb of umna the mother of amna in the mala at mecca and all the cicerone agree about the locality 
yet historians place it at abwa where she gave up the ghost after visiting al medina to introduce her son to his relations and the learned believe that the prophet refused to pray over or to intercede for his mother she having died before al islam was revealed End of footnote. burkhardt chronicles its ill usage by the fanatic wahhabis it has now been rebuilt in that frugal style that characterizes the architecture of al hijaz an exceedingly garrulous old woman came to the door invited us in and superintended our devotions at the end of which she sprinkled rose water upon my face when asked for a cool draught she handed me a metal saucer whose contents smelled strongly of mastic earnestly directing me to drink it in a sitting posture this tomb she informed us is the property of a single woman who visits in every evening receives the contributions of the faithful prays sweeps the pavement and dusts the furniture we left five piastres for this respectable maiden and gratified the officious crone with another shilling she repaid us by signalling to some score of beggars that a rich pilgrim had entered the mala and their importunities fairly drove me out of the hallowed walls leaving the janet al ma'ala we returned towards the town and halted on the left side of the road at a mean building called the masjid al jinn mosque of the jinni here was revealed the seventy-second chapter of the al-quran called after the name of the mysterious fire drakes who paid fealty to the prophet descending a flight of steps for this mosque like all ancient localities at mecca is as much below as us above ground we entered a small apartment containing water-pots for drinking and all the appurtenances of ablution in it is shown the mawda al khat place of the writing where muhammad wrote a letter to abu mas'ud after the homage of the jinnis a second and interior flight of steps led to another diminutive oratory where the prophet used to pray and receive the archangel gabriel having performed a pair of bows which caused the perspiration to burst forth as if in a russian bath i paid a few piastres and issued from the building with much satisfaction we had some difficulty in urging our donkeys through the crowded street called zaqaq al hajar presently we arrived at the bayt al nabi the prophet's old house in which he lived with sitt khadija here says burckhardt the lady fatima first saw a light and here according to ibn jubair al hasan and al hussein were born footnote burckhardt calls it maulit sittana fatima but the name qubbat al wahi applied by my predecessor to this locality is generally made synonymous with al muhtaba the hiding place where the prophet and his followers used to pray in dangerous times End of footnote dismounting at the entrance we descended a deep flight of steps and found ourselves in a spacious hall vaulted and for better appearance than most of the sacred edifices at mecca in the centre a well-railed round stood a closet of rich green and gold stuffs in shape not unlikely an umbrella tent a surly porter guarded the closed door which some respectable people vainly attempted to open by honeyed words a whisper from abdullah solved the difficulty i was directed to lie at full length upon my stomach and to kiss a black-looking stone said to be the lower half of the lady fatima's quern fixed at the bottom of a basin of some material footnote so loose is the local tradition that some have confounded this quern with the natak al nabi the stone which god gave speed to the prophet End of footnote. thence we repaired to a corner and recited a two-bow at the place where the prophet used to pray the sunnah and the nafila or supererogatory devotions Footnote. he would of course pray the fard or obligatory devotions at the shrine End of footnote. again remounting we proceeded at a leisurely pace homewards and on the way passed through the principal slave market it is a large street roofed with matting and full of coffee-houses the merchandise sat in rows parallel with the walls the prettiest girls occupied the highest benches below were the plainer sort and the lowest of all the boys they were all gaily dressed in pink and other light-coloured muslins with transparent veils over their heads and whether from the effect of such unusual splendour or from their reactions succeeding their terrible land journey and sea voyage they appeared to be perfectly happy 
laughing loudly talking unknown tongues and quizzing purchasers even during the delicate operation of purchasing there were some pretty galas douce-looking abyssinians and africans of various degrees of hideousness from the half arab somal to the baboon like swahili the highest price of which i could hear was sixty pounds and here i matured a resolve to strike if favoured by fortune a death-blow at the trade which is eating into the vitals of industry in eastern africa the reflection was pleasant the idea that the humble hadji contemplating the scene from his donkey might become the instrument of the total abolition of this pernicious traffic footnote about a year since the writing above a firman was issued by the porte suppressing the traffic from central africa hitherto we have respected slavery in the red sea because the turk thence drew his supplies we are now destitute of an excuse a single steamer would destroy the trade and if we delay to take active measures the people of england who have spent millions in keeping up a west african squadron will not hold us guiltless of negligence note to the second edition the slave trade has since these remarks were penned been suppressed with a high hand the arabs of al hijaz resented the measure by disowning the supremacy of the porte but they were soon reduced to submission and a footnote what would have become of that pilgrim had the crowd in the slave market guessed his intentions passing through the large bazaar called sugalel i saw the palace of mohammed bin aun quondam prince of mecca it has a certain look of rude magnificence the effect of huge hanging balconies scattered in profusion over lofty walls clairvoies of brickwork and of course various coloured stones the owner is highly popular among the bedouin and feared by the citizens on account of his fierce looks courage and treachery they describe him to me as vir bonus bene strangulando perutus but mr cole who knew him personally gave him a high character for generosity and freedom from fanaticism he seems to have some idea of the state which should hedge in a ruler his palaces at mecca and that now turned into a wakala at jidda are the only places in the country that can be called princely he is now a state prisoner at constantinople and the bedouin pray in vain for his return Footnote the prince was first invested with the sharifat by muhammad ali of egypt in a d eighteen twenty seven when yahya fled after stabbing his nephew in the kaaba to the banu harb bedouin he was supported by ahmed pasha of mecca with a large army but after the battle of taraba in which ibrahim pasha was worsted by the bedouin muhammad bin aun accused of acting as sila was sent in honourable bondage to cairo he again returned to mecca where the rapacity of his eldest son abdullah who would rob pilgrims caused fresh misfortunes in a d eighteen fifty six when abdul muttalib was appointed sharif the pasha was ordered to send bin aun to stamboul no easy task the turk succeeded by a manoeuvre mohammed's two sons appearing to be at jeddah were invited to inspect a man-of-war and were there made prisoners upon this the father yielded himself up although it is said the flashing of the bedawi sabre during his embarkation made the turks rejoice that they had won the day by state craft the wild men of al hijaz still sing songs in honour of this sharif note to the second edition early in eighteen fifty six when the sharif abdul muttalib was deposed mohammed bin aun was sent from constantinople to quiet the insurrection caused by the new slave laws in al hijaz in a short space of time he completely succeeded End of footnote. the other places of pious visitation at mecca are briefly these one natak al nabi a small oratory in zakaq al hijr it derives its name from the following circumstance as the prophet was knocking at the door of abu bakr's shop a stone gave him god speed and told him that the master was not home the wonderful mineral is of reddish black colour about a foot in dimension and fixed in the wall somewhat higher than a man's head there are servants attached to it and the street sides are spread as usual with the napkins of importunate beggars two moulid al nabi or the prophet's birthplace footnote 
the twelfth of rabi al awwal or muhammad's birthday is here celebrated with great festivities feasts prayers and perusals of the quran these molids or ceremonies of nativity are by no means limited to a single day in a year End of footnote. it is a little chapel in the sugilayl not far from muhammad bin aun's palace it is below the present level of the ground and the centre is a kind of tent concealing it it is said a hole in the floor upon which amina sat to be delivered three in the quarter shab ali near the maulid and nebi is the birthplace of ali another oratory below the ground here as in the former place a maulid and a ziyara are held on the anniversary of the lion's birth four near khadija's house and the nataq nabi is a place called al muttaka from a stone against which the prophet leaned when worn out with fatigue it is much visited by devotees and some declare that on one occasion the father of lies appeared to the prophet in the form of an elderly man and tempted him to sin by asserting that the mosque prayers were over this stone disclosing the fraud caused the fiend to flee Five. Maulid Hamza, a little building at the old Bab Umra, near the Shabaiqi cemetery. Here was the Bazan, or the channel down which the Ain Hanain ran into the Birkat Majid, and many authorities doubt that Hamza was born at this place. Footnote. The reader is warned that I did not see the five places above enumerated. The Ciceronian books mention twelve other visitations, several of which are known only by name one al muqtaba or the hiding place alluded to in the preceding pages its locality is the subject of debate two dar al khaizaran where the prophet prayed secretly till the conversion of umar enabled him to dispense with concealment three maulid umar or umar's birthplace mentioned in books as being visited by devotees in the fourteenth of rabi al awwal of every year four abu Bakr's house near nataq al nabi it is supposed to have been destroyed in the twelfth century. 5. Mawla Jafar al tayyar near the Shabaiqi Cemetery. 6. al Mada, an oratory, also called Nafas al-Ard, because here creation began. 7. Dar al-Hijra, where Muhammad and Abu Bakr mounted for the flight. 8. Masjid al-Raya, where the Prophet planted his flag when Mecca surrendered. 9. Masjid al shajara a spot at which Muhammad caused the tree to advance and to retire. 10. Masjid Jarana, where Muhammad clad himself in the pilgrim garb. It is still visited by some Persians. 11. Masjid Ibrahim, or Abu Qubais. 12. Masjid Dhu Tawa. End of footnote. The reader must now be as tired of pious visitations as I was. Before leaving Mecca, I was urgently invited to dine by old Ali bin Yasin the Zamzami, a proof that he entertained inordinate expectations, excited, it appeared, by the boy Muhammad, for the simple purpose of exalting his own dignity. One day we were hurriedly summoned, about 3 p.m., to the senior's house, a large building at Zuqaq al-Hajr. We found it full of pilgrims, amongst whom we had no trouble to recognize our fellow travellers, the quarrelsome old or not and his impudent slave boy. Ali met us upon the staircase and conducted us into an upper room where we sat upon divans and with pipes and coffee prepared for dinner. Presently the semicircle arose to receive a eunuch who lodged somewhere in the house. He was a person of importance, being the guardian of some dames of high degree at Cairo and Constantinople. The highest place and the best pipe were unhesitatingly offered to and accepted by him. He sat down with dignity, answered diplomatically certain mysterious questions about the dames, and applied his blubber lips to a handsome mouthpiece of lemon-coloured amber, it was a fair lesson of humility for a man to find himself ranked beneath this high-shouldered spindle-shanked beardless bit of neutrality and as such i took it duly to heart the dinner was served up in a cinea a plated copper tray about six feet in circumference and handsomely ornamented with arabesque and inscriptions under this was the usual kursi or stool composed of mother-o'-pearl facets set in sandalwood and upon it a well-tinned and clean-looking service of the same material as the senior. 
we began with a variety of stews stews with spinach stews with bamia or hibiscus and rich vegetable stews these being removed we dipped hands in biryani a meat pilau abounding in clarified butter kima finely chopped meat warak mahshi vine leaves filled with chopped and spiced mutton and folded into small triangles kebab or bits of roti spitted in mouthfuls upon a splinter of wood together with a salata of the crispest cucumber and various dishes of watermelon cut into squares bread was represented by the eastern scone but it was of superior flavour and far better than the ill-famed chapati of india our drink was water perfumed with mastic after the meat came a kunafa fine vermicelli sweetened with honey and sprinkled with powdered white sugar several stews of apple and quinces mahalabiya a thin jelly made of rice flour milk starch and a little perfume together with squares of raha a confiture highly prized in these regions because it comes from constantinople footnote familiar to rahat al hulqum the pleasure of the throat a name which has sorely puzzled our tourists this sweetmeat would be pleasant had it not smelled so strongly of the periquier's shop rosewater tempts to many culinary sins in the east and europeans cannot dissociate it from the idea of a lotion however if a guest is to be honoured rosewater must often take the place of the pure element even in tea in the footnote the dinner concluded with a pilau of rice and butter for the easier discussion of which we were provided with carved wooden spoons arabs ignore the delightful french art of prolonging dinner after washing your hands you sit down throw an embroidered napkin over your knees and with a bismillah by the way of grace plunge your hand into the attractive dish changing ad libitum occasionally sucking your finger-tips as boys do lollipops and varying that diversion by cramming a chosen morsel into a friend's mouth when your hunger is satisfied you do not sit for your companions you exclaim alhamd edge away from the tray wash your hands and mouth with soap display signs of repletion otherwise you will be pressed to eat more seize your pipe sip your coffee and take your caff nor is it customary in these lands to sit together after dinner the evening prayer cuts short the sands before we rose to take leave of ali bin yasin a boy ran into the room and displayed those infantine civilities which in the east are equivalent to begging a present i slipped a dollar into his hand at the sight of which he the veritable little meccan would not contain his joy a rial he exclaimed a rial look grandpa the good effendi has given me a rial the old gentleman's eyes twinkled with emotion he saw how easily the coin had slipped from my fingers and he fondly hoped that he had not seen the last piece verily thou art a good young man he ejaculated adding fervently as prayers cost nothing may allah further all thy desires a gentle patting of the back evidenced his high approval i never saw old ali after that evening but entrusted to the boy mohammed what was considered a just equivalent for his services End of chapter thirty three Chapter thirty four of Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Personal Narrative of a Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. Chapter thirty four To Jeddah a general plunge into worldly pursuits and pleasures announced the end of the pilgrimage ceremonies all the devotees were now whitewashed the book of their sins was a tabula rasa too many of them lost no time in making a new departure down south and in opening a fresh account the faith must not bear the blame of the irregularities they may be equally observed in the calvinist after a sunday of prayer sinning through monday with a zest and the Romanist falling back with new fervour upon the causes of his confession and penance, as in the Muslim, who washes his soul clean by running and circumambulation, and in fairness it must be observed that, as amongst Christians, so in the Muslim persuasion, there are many notable exceptions to this rule of extremes. 
several of my friends and acquaintances date their reformation from their first sight of the Kaaba. The Muslims' Holy Week over, nothing detained me at Mecca. For reasons before stated, I resolved upon returning to Cairo, resting there for a while, and starting a second time for the interior, via Muwayla. Footnote. This second plan was defeated by bad health, which detained me in Egypt till return to India became imperative. End footnote. The Meccans are as fond of little presents as are nuns. The Kabira took an affectionate leave of me, begged me to be careful of her boy, who was to accompany me to Jeddah, and laid friendly but firm hands upon a brass pestle and mortar upon which she had long cast the eye of concupiscence. Having hired two camels for thirty-five piastres, and paid half the sum in advance, I sent on my heavy boxes with Sheikh, now Haji Nur, to Jeddah. Footnote. The usual hire is thirty piastres, but in the pilgrimage season a dollar is often paid. The hire of an ass varies from one to three reals. End footnote. Omar Effendi was to wait at Mecca till his father had started, in command of the dromedary caravan, when he would privily take ass, join me at the port, and return to his beloved Cairo. I bade a long farewell to all my friends, embraced the Turkish pilgrims, and mounting our donkeys, the boy Mohammed and I left the house. Abdullah the melancholy followed us on foot through the city, and took leave of me, though without embracing, at the Shabaiki quarter. Issuing into the open plain, I felt a thrill of pleasure, such joy as only the captive delivered from his dungeon can experience. The sunbeams warmed me into renewed life and vigour. The air of the desert was a perfume, and the homely face of nature was as the smile of a dear old friend. I contemplated the Syrian caravan, lying on the right of our road, without any of the sadness usually suggested by a parting look. It is not my intention minutely to describe the line down which we travelled that night. The pages of Burkhardt give full information about the country. Leaving Mecca, we fell into the direct road running south of Wadi Fatima, and traversed for about an hour a flat surrounded by hills. Then we entered a valley by a flight of rough stone steps, dangerously slippery and zigzag, intended to facilitate the descent for camels and for laden beasts. About midnight we passed into a hill-girt wadi, here covered with deep sands, there hard with gravelly clay, and finally, about dawn, we sighted the maritime plain of Jeddah. Shortly after leaving the city, our party was joined by other travellers, and towards evening we found ourselves in force, the effect of an order that pilgrims must not proceed singly upon this road. Coffee-houses and places of refreshment abounding, we halted every five miles to refresh ourselves and the donkeys. Footnote. Besides the remains of those in ruins, there are on this road eight coffee-houses and stations for travellers, private buildings, belonging to men who supply water and other necessaries. And footnote. At sunset we prayed near a Turkish guard-house, where one of the soldiers kindly supplied me with water for ablution. Before nightfall I was accosted in Turkish by a one-eyed old fellow who, quote, with faded brow, entrenched with many a frown and conic beard, end quote, and habited in unclean garments, was bestriding a donkey as faded as himself. When I shook my head, he addressed me in Persian. The same manoeuvre made him try Arabic. Still he obtained no answer. Then he grumbled out good Hindustani. That also failing, he tried successively Pushtu, Armenian, English, French, and Italian. At last I could keep a stiff lip no longer. At every change of dialect his emphasis, beginning with then who the d are you? became more emphatic. I turned upon him in Persian, and found that he had been a pilot, a courier, and a servant to eastern tourists, and that he had visited England, France, and Italy, the Cape, India, Central Asia, and China. We then chatted in English, which Haji Akif spoke well, but with all manner of courier's phrases. Haji Abdullah so badly that he was counselled a course of study. It was not a little strange to hear such phrases as, Comte Neddy, and, Crenon de 
almost within earshot of the tomb of Ishmael, the birthplace of Mohammed, and the sanctuary of Al-Islam. About 8 p.m. we passed the Alamein, which define the sanctuary in this direction. They stand about nine miles from Mecca, and near them are a coffee-house and a little oratory, popularly known as the Sabil Aga Almas. On the road, as night advanced, we met long strings of camels, some carrying litters, others huge beams, and others bales of coffee, grain, and merchandise. Sleep began to weigh heavily upon my companion's eyelids, and the boy Mohammed hung over the flank of his donkey in a most ludicrous position. About midnight we reached a mass of huts called al Hadda. Ali Bay places it eight leagues from Jeddah. At the boundary, which is considered to be the halfway halting place, pilgrims must assume the religious garb. Footnote. In Ibn Jubair's time, the Iram was assumed at il Furain, now a decayed station, about two hours' journey from al Hadda towards Jeddah. End footnote and infidels travelling to Taif are taken off the Meccan road into one leading northward to Arafat. The settlement is a collection of huts and hovels, built with sticks and reeds, supporting brushwood and burnt and blackened palm leaves. It is maintained for supplying pilgrims with coffee and water. Travellers speak with horror of its heat during the day. Ali Bey, who visited it twice, compares it to a furnace. Here the country slopes gradually towards the sea, the hills draw off, and every object denotes departure from the Meccan plateau. At al Hadda we dismounted for an hour's halt. A coffee-house supplied us with mats, water-pipes, and other necessaries. We then produced a basket of provisions, the parting gift of the kind Kabira, and, this late supper concluded, we lay down to doze. After half an hour's halt had expired, and the donkeys were saddled, I shook up with difficulty the boy Mohammed, and induced him to mount. He was, to use his own expression, dead from sleep, and we had scarcely advanced an hour when, arriving at another little coffee-house, he threw himself upon the ground, and declared it impossible to proceed. This act caused some confusion. The donkey-boy was a pert little badawi, offensively republican in manner. He had several times addressed me impudently, ordering me not to flog his animal, or to hammer its sides with my heels. On these occasions he received a contemptuous snub which had the effect of silencing him. But now, thinking we were in his power, he swore that he would lead away the beasts, and leave us behind to be robbed and murdered. A pinch of the windpipe and a spin over the ground altered his plans at the outside of execution. He gnawed his hand with impotent rage, and went away threatening us with the governor of Jeddah next morning. Then an Egyptian of the party took up the thread of remonstrance, and, aided by the old linguist, who said in English, "'By God, you must budge! You'll catch it here!' He assumed a brisk and energetic style, exclaiming, "'Yala, rise and mount! Thou art only losing our time! Thou dost not intend to sleep in the desert!' I replied, "'O oh, my uncle, do not exceed in talk!' Fuzul, excess in Arabic, is equivalent to telling a man in English not to be impertinent, rolled over on the other side heavily, as doth Enceladus, and pretended to snore, whilst the cowed Egyptian urged the others to make us move. The question was thus settled by the boy Mohammed, who had been aroused by the dispute. "'Do you know,' he whispered, in awful accents, "'what that person is?' and he pointed to me. "'Why, no,' replied the others. Well, said the youth, the other day the Yuteba showed us death in the Zariba Pass, and what do you think he did? Voila, what do we know? exclaimed the Egyptian. What did he do? He called for his dinner, replied the youth, with a slow and sarcastic emphasis. That trait was enough. The others mounted and left us quietly to sleep. I have been diffuse in relating this little adventure, which is characteristic showing what bravado can do in Arabia. It also suggests a lesson which every traveller in these regions should take well to heart. The people are always ready to terrify him with frightful stories which are the merest phantoms of cowardice. The reason why the Egyptian displayed so much philanthropy was that, had one of the party been lost, the survivors might have fallen into trouble. But in this place we were, I believe, despite the declarations of our companions that it was infested with turpins and fra diavolos, as safe as in Mecca. 
Every night, during the pilgrimage season, a troop of about fifty horsemen patrolled the roads. We were all armed to the teeth, and our party looked too formidable to be cruelly beaten by a single footpad. Our nap concluded, we remounted and resumed the weary way down a sandy valley in which the poor donkeys sank fat lock deep. At dawn we found our companions halted and praying at the Kahwat Turki, another little coffee-house. Here an exchange of what is popularly called chaff took place. Well, cried the Egyptian, what have you gained by halting? We've been quiet here, praying and smoking for the last hour. Go, eat thy buried beans. Footnote. The favorite Egyptian kitchen, held to be contemptible food by the Arabs. End footnote. We replied, what does an Egyptian boor know of manliness? The surly donkey-boy was worked up into a paroxysm of passion by such small jokes as telling him to convey our salams to the governor of Jeddah, and by calling the asses after the name of his tribe. He replied by foul unmannered skirl taunts, which only drew forth fresh derision, and the coffee-house keeper laughed consumedly, having probably seldom entertained such funny gentlemen. Shortly after leaving the Kahat Turkey, we found the last spur of the highlands that sink into the Jeddah plain. This view would for some time be my last of, quote, infamous hills and sandy perilous wilds, end quote, and I contemplated it with the pleasure of one escaping from it. Before us lay the usual iron flat of these regions, whitish with salt and tawny with stones and gravel but relieved and beautified by the distant white walls whose canopy was the lovely blue sea. Not a tree, not a patch of verdure was in sight. Nothing distracted our attention from the sheet of turquoises in the distance. Merrily the little donkeys hobbled on, in spite of their fatigue. Soon we distinguished the features of the town, the minarets, the fortifications, so celebrated since their honeycombed guns beat off in 1817 the thousands of Abdullah bin Saud, the Wahhabi, and a small dome outside the walls. Footnote. In 1817 Abdullah bin Saud attacked Jeddah with 50,000 men, determining to overthrow its kaffir works, namely its walls and towers. The assault is described as ludicrous. All the inhabitants aided to garrison. They waited till the wild men flocked about the place, crying, Come, and let us look at the labours of the infidel. They then let fly, and raked them with matchlock balls, and old nails acting grape. The Wahhabi host at last departed, unable to take a place which a single battery of our smallest siege-guns would breach in an hour. And since that day the Meccans have never ceased to boast of their Gibraltar, and to taunt the Madanites with their wallless port, Yambu. End footnote. The sun began to glow fiercely, and we were not sorry when, at about eight a.m., after passing through the mass of hovels and coffee-houses, cemeteries and sand-hills, which forms the eastern approach to Jeddah, we entered the fortified Bab Makkah. Allowing eleven hours for our actual march, we halted about three, those wonderful donkeys had accomplished between forty-four and forty-six miles, generally in deep sand, in one night. Footnote. Al-Idrisi places Mecca forty Arab miles from Jeddah. Burkhat gives fifty-five miles, and Ali Bey has not computed the total distance. End footnote. And they passed the archway of Jeddah, cantering almost as nimbly as when they left Mecca. Sheikh Nur had been ordered to take rooms for me in a vast pile of mudrapur, unfossilized coral, a recent formation, once the palace of Mohammed bin On, and now converted into a wakala. Instead of so doing, Indian-like, he had made a gypsy encampment in the square opening upon the harbour. After administering the requisite correction, I found a room that would suit me. In less than an hour it was swept, sprinkled with water, spread with mats, and made as comfortable as its capability admitted. At Jeddah I felt once more at home. The sight of the sea acted as a tonic. The Maharatas were not far wrong when they kept their English captives out of reach of the ocean, declaring that we were an amphibious race, to whom the wave is a home. After a day's repose at the caravanserai, the camel-man and donkey-boy clamouring for money, and I not having more than tenpence of borrowed coin, it was necessary to cash at the British Vice-Consulate a draft given to me by the Royal Geographical Society. With some trouble, 
I saw Mr. Cole, who, suffering from fever, was declared to be not at home. His dragoman did by no means admire my looks. In fact, the general voice of the household was against me. After some fruitless messages, I sent up a scroll to Mr. Cole, who decided upon admitting the importunate Afghan. An exclamation of astonishment and a hospitable welcome followed my self-introduction as an officer of the Indian Army. Amongst other things, the Vice-Consul informed me that, in diverse discussions with the Turks about the possibility of an Englishman finding his way en cachette to Mecca, he had asserted that his compatriots could do everything, even pilgrim to the holy city. The Muslims politely assented to the first, but denied the second part of the proposition. Mr. Cole promised himself a laugh at the Turks' beards but since my departure he wrote to me that the subject made the owners look so serious that he did not like recurring to it. Truly gratifying to the pride of an Englishman was our high official position assumed and maintained at Jeddah. Mr. Cole had never, like his colleague at Cairo, lowered himself in the estimation of the proud race with which he has to deal, by private or mercantile transactions with the authorities. He has steadily withstood the wrath of the Meccan Sharif, and taught him to respect the British name. The Abbey Hamilton ascribed the attentions of the Prince to the infinite respect which the Arabs entertained for Mr. Cole's straightforward way of doing business. It was a delicate flattery addressed to him. And the writer was right. Honesty of purpose is never thrown away amongst these people. The general contrast between our consular proceedings at Cairo and Jeddah is another proof of the advisability of selecting Indian officials to fill offices of trust at Oriental courts. They have lived amongst Easterns, and they know one Asiatic language, with many Asiatic customs, and, chief merit of all, they have learned to assume a tone of command without which, whatever may be thought of it in England, it is impossible to take the lead in the East. The home-bred diplomat is not only unconscious of the thousand traps everywhere laid for him, he even plays into the hands of his crafty antagonists by a ceremonious politeness which they interpret, taking ample care that the interpretation should spread, to be the effect of fear or of fraud. Jeddah has been often described by modern pens. Footnote. Abel Fedda writes the word Jeddah, and Mr. Lane, as well as M. Marie and M. Dufault, adopt this form, which signifies a plain wanting water. The water of Jeddah is still very scarce and bad. All who can afford it drink the produce of hill springs brought in skins by the Badarin. Ibn Jubair mentions that outside the town were 360 old wells, dug, it is supposed, by the Persians. Jeddah, or Jidda, is the vulgar pronunciation, and not a few of the learned call it Jada, the grandmother in allusion to the legend of Eve's tomb, and footnote. Burghardt, in Anadomini 1814, devoted a hundred pages of his two volumes to the unhappy capital of the Tihamat al hijaz the lowlands of the mountain region. Later still, Messrs. Marie and Chedifaut wrote upon the subject, and two other French travellers, Messrs. Galinier and Ferret, published tables of the commerce in its present state, quoting as authority the celebrated Arabicist M. Fresnel. Footnote. In chapters 3 and 6 of this work, I have ventured some remarks upon the advisability of our being represented in al Hijaz by a consul, and at Mecca by a native agent, till the day shall come when the tide of events forces us to occupy the mother city of al-Islam. My apology for reverting to these points must be the nature of an Englishman who would everywhere see his nation second to none, even at Jeddah. Yet, when we consider that from twenty-five to thirty vessels here arrive annually from India, and that the value of the trade is about twenty-five lakhs of rupees, the matter may be thought worth attending to. The following extracts from a letter written to me by Mr. Cole shall conclude this part of my task. Quote, you must know that in 1838 a commercial treaty was concluded between Great Britain and the Porte, specifying, amongst many other clauses here omitted, 1. That all merchandise imported from English ports to al hijaz should pay 4% duty, 2. That all merchandise imported by British subjects from countries not under the dominion of the Porte should likewise pay but 5%, 3. 
that all goods exported from countries under the dominion of the Porte should pay 12%, after a deduction of 16% from the market value of the articles. 4. That all monopolies be abolished. Now, when I arrived at Jeddah, the state of affairs was this. A monopoly had been established upon salt, and this weighed only upon our Anglo-Indian subjects, they being the sole purchasers. Five percent was levied upon full value of goods, no deduction of the twenty percent being allowed. The same was the case with exports, and most vexatious of all, various charges had been established by the local authorities under the names of boat hire, weighing, brokerage, etc., etc. The duties had thus been raised from four to at least eight percent. This being represented at Constantinople, brought a peremptory firman, ordering the governor to act up to the treaty letter by letter. I have had the satisfaction to rectify the abuses of sixteen years' standing during my first few months of office, but I expect all manner of difficulties in claiming reimbursement for the over-exactions. End quote. End footnote. These have been translated by the author of Life in Abyssinia. Abd al-Karim, writing in 1742, informs us that the French had a factory at Jeddah, and in 1760, when Bruce revisited the port, he found the East India Company in possession of a post whence they dispersed their merchandise over the adjoining regions. But, though the English were at an early epoch of their appearance in the East received here with a special favour, I failed to procure a single ancient document. Jeddah, when I visited it, was in a state of commotion, owing to the perpetual passage of pilgrims, and provisions were for the same reason scarce and dear. The two large wakalas, of which the place boasts, were crowded with travellers, and many were reduced to encamping upon the squares. Another subject of confusion was the state of the soldiery. The nizam, or regulars, had not been paid for seven months, and the arnauts could scarcely sum up what was owing to them. Easterns are wonderfully amenable to discipline. A European army, under the circumstances, would probably have helped itself. But the Pasha knew that there is a limit to a man's endurance, and he was anxiously casting about for some contrivance that would replenish the empty pouches of his troops. The worried dignitary must have sighed for those beaux jours when privily firing the town and allowing the soldiers to plunder was the Oriental style of settling arrears of pay. Footnote. Monsieur Rochet, soi-disant d'Ericourt, amusingly describes this manoeuvre of the governor of al Hodaida, and footnote. Jeddah displays all the license of a seaport and garrison town. Fair Corinthians establish themselves even within earshot of the Karakun, or guard post, a symptom of excessive laxity in their authorities, for it is the duty of the watch to visit all such irregularities with a bastinado preparatory to confinement. My guardians and attendants at the Wakala used to fetch araki in a clear glass bottle, without even the decency of a cloth, and the messenger, twice returned from these errands, decidedly drunk. More extraordinary still, the people seemed to take no notice of the scandal. The little Dwarka had been sent by the Bombay Steam Navigation Company to convey pilgrims from al Hijaz to India. I was still hesitating about my next voyage, not wishing to coast the Red Sea in this season without a companion, when one morning Omar Effendi appeared at the door, weary and dragging after him an ass more weary than himself. We supplied him with a pipe and a cup of hot tea, and, as he was fearful of pursuit, we showed him a dark hole full of grass under which he might sleep concealed. The student's fears were realized. His father appeared early the next morning, and having ascertained from the porter that the fugitive was in the house, politely called upon me. Whilst he plied all manner of questions, his black slave furtively stared at everything in and about the room. But we had found time to cover the runaway with grass, and the old gentleman departed after a fruitless search. There was, however, a grim smile about his mouth which boded no good. That evening, returning home from the hammam, I found the house in an uproar. The boy Mohammed, who had been miserably mauled, was furious with rage, and Sheikh Noor was equally unmanageable by reason of his fear. In my absence the father had returned with a posse comitatus of friends and relatives. They questioned the youth, who delivered himself of many circumstantial and emphatic misstatements. Then they proceeded to open the boxes, upon which the boy Mohammed cast himself sprawling, with a vow to die rather than to endure such a disgrace. 
This procured for him some scattered slaps, which presently became a storm of blows, when a prying little boy discovered Omar Effendi's leg in the hiding-place. The student was led away unresisting, but mildly swearing that he would allow no opportunity of escape to pass. I examined the boy Mohammed, and was pleased to find that he was not seriously hurt. To pacify his mind, I offered to sally out with him, and to rescue Omar Effendi by main force. This, which would only have brought us all into a brunt with quarter-staves and similar servile weapons, was declined, as had been foreseen. But the youth recovered complacency, and a few well-merited encomiums upon his pluck restored him to high spirits. The reader must not fancy such escapade to be a serious thing in Arabia. The father did not punish his son. He merely bargained with him to return home for a few days before starting to Egypt. This the young man did, and shortly afterwards I met him unexpectedly in the streets of Cairo. Deprived of my companion, I resolved to waste no time in the Red Sea, but to return to Egypt with the utmost expedition. The boy Mohammed, having laid in a large store of grain, purchased with my money, having secured all my disposable articles, and having hinted that, after my return to India, a present of twenty dollars would find him at Mecca, asked leave, and departed with a coolness for which I could not account. Some day afterwards Sheikh Noor explained the cause. I had taken the youth with me on board the steamer, where a bad suspicion crossed his mind. "'Now I understand,' said the boy Mohammed to his fellow-servant. "'Your master is a sahib from India. He had laughed at our beards.' He parted as coolly from Sheikh Noor. These worthy youths had been drinking together when Mohammed, having learned at Stamboul the fashionable practice of badmasti, or liquor vice, dug his fives into Noor's eye. Noor, erroneously considering such exercise likely to induce blindness, complained to me, but my sympathy was all with the other side. I asked the Hindi why he had not returned the compliment, and the Meccan once more overwhelmed the Mayan with taunt and jibe. It is not easy to pass the time at Jeddah. In the square opposite to us was an unhappy idiot, who afforded us a melancholy spectacle. He delighted to wander about in a primitive state of toilette, as all such wretches do. But the people of Jeddah, far too civilized to retain Muslim respect for madness, forced him, despite shrieks and struggles, into a shirt, and when he tore it off they beat him. At other times the open space before us was diversified by the arrival and the departure of pilgrims. But it was a mere reshove of the feast, and had lost all power to please. Whilst the boy Mohammed remained, he used to pass the time in wrangling with some Indians who were living next door to us, men, women, and children, in a promiscuous way. After his departure I used to spend my days at the vice-consulate, the proceeding was not perhaps of the safest, but the temptation of meeting a fellow-countryman, and of chatting shop about the service, was too great to be resisted. I met there the principal merchants of Jeddah, Kraya Soa, a Greek, M. Anton, a Christian from Baghdad, and others. Footnote. Many of them were afterwards victims to the Jeddah massacre on June 30, 1858. I must refer the reader to my Lake Regions of Central Africa, Appendix, Volume 2, for an account of this event, for the proposals which I made to ward it off, and for the miserable folly of the Bombay government, who rewarded me by an official reprimand. End footnote. And I was introduced to Khalid Bey, brother of Abdullah bin Saud the Wahhabi. This noble Arab once held the official position of Mukhid al Jawabad, or secretary, at Cairo, where he was brought up by Mohammed Ali. He is brave, frank, and unprejudiced, fond of Europeans, and a lover of pleasure. Should it be his fate to become chief of the tribe, a journey to Rijaz, and a visit to Central Arabia, will offer no difficulties to our travellers. I now proceed to the last of my visitations. Outside the town of Jeddah lies no less a personage than Sid Nahawa, the mother of mankind. The boy Mohammed and I, mounting asses one evening, issued through the Meccan gate, and turned towards the northeast over a sandy plain. After half an hour's ride amongst dirty huts and tattered coffee hovels, we reached the ascent, and found the door closed. Presently a man came running with might from the town. He was followed by two others, and it struck me at the time they applied the key with peculiar impressment, and made inordinately low conges as we entered the enclosure of whitewashed walls. The mother is supposed to lie like a Muslima, fronting the Kaaba, 
with her feet northwards, her head southwards, and her right cheek propped by her right hand. Whitewashed and conspicuous to the voyager and traveller from afar is a diminutive dome with an opening to the west. It is furnished as such places usually are in al -Hija. Under it and in the centre is a square stone, planted upright and fancifully carved to represent the omphalic region of the human frame. This, as well as the dome, is called al -Sura, or the navel. The cicerone directed me to kiss this manner of hieroglyph, which I did, thinking the while that, under the circumstances, the salutation was quite uncalled for. Having prayed here, and at the head, where a few young trees grow, we walked along the side of the two parallel dwarf walls which define the outlines of the body. They are about six paces apart, and between them, upon Eve's neck, are two tombs, occupied, I was told, by Osman Pasha and his son, who repaired the mother's sepulchre. I could not help remarking to the boy Mohammed that if our first parent measured a hundred and twenty paces from head to waist, and eighty from waist to heel, she must have presented much the appearance of a duck. To this the youth replied, flippantly, that he thanked his stars the mother was underground, otherwise that man would lose their senses with fright. Ibn Jubair, twelfth century, mentions only an old dome, built upon the place where Eve stopped on the way to Mecca. Yet al-Idrisi, A.D. 1154, declares Eve's grave to be at Jeddah. Abd al-Karim, 1742, compares it to a parterre with a little dome in the centre, and the extremities ending in barriers of palisades. The circumference was a hundred and ninety of his steps. In Rook's travels we are told that the tomb is twenty feet long. Ali Bey, who twice visited Jeddah, makes no allusion to it. We may therefore conclude that it had been destroyed by the Wahhabis. Burkhardt, who, I need scarcely say, has been carefully copied by our popular authors, was informed that it was a rude structure of stone, about four feet in length, two or three feet in height, and as many in breadth, thus resembling the tomb of Noah seen in the valley of al buqa in Syria. Bruce writes, Two days' journey from this place, either Mecca or Jeddah, Eve's grave of green sods, about fifty yards in length, is shown to this day. But the great traveller probably never issued from the town gates. And Sir W. Harris, who could not have visited the holy place, repeats in 1840 that Eve's grave of green sod is still shown on the barren shore of the Red Sea. The present structure is clearly modern. Anciently, I was told at Jeddah, the sepulchre consisted of a stone at the head, a second at the feet, and the navel dome. The idol of Jeddah, in the days of Arab lithology, was called Sacha Tavila, the long stone. May not this stone of Eve be the Muslimized revival of the old idolatry? It is to be observed that the Arabs, if the tombs be admitted as evidence, are inconsistent in their dimensions of the patriarchal stature. The sepulchre of Adam at the Mashida Kaif is, like that of Eve, gigantic. That of Noah at al -Buqa, is a bit of an aqueduct thirty-eight paces long by one and a half wide. Job's tomb, near Hula, seven parasangs from Karbala, is small. I have not seen the grave of Moses, southeast of the Red Sea, which is becoming known by the bitumen cups there sold to pilgrims. But Aaron's sepulchre in the Sinaitic peninsula is of moderate dimensions. On leaving the graveyard I offered the guardian a dollar, which he received with a remonstrance that the man of my dignity should give so paltry a fee. Nor was he at all contented with the assurance that nothing more could be expected from an Afghan darwaysh, however pious. Next day the boy Mohammed explained the man's impressment and disappointment. I had been mistaken for the Pasha of al Madina. For a time my peregrinations ended. Worn out with fatigue and the fatal fiery heat, I embarked September 26th, on board the Dwarka, experienced the greatest kindness from the commander and chief officer, Messrs. Wally and Taylor, and, wondering the while how the Turkish pilgrims who crowded the vessel did not take the trouble to throw me overboard, in due time I arrived at Suez. And here, reader, we part. Bear with me while I conclude in the words of a brother traveller long gone but not forgotten, Fayan, this personal narrative of my journey to Arijaz. Quote, 
I have been exposed to perils, and I have escaped from them. I have traversed the sea, and have not succumbed under the severest fatigues, and my heart is moved with emotions of gratitude that I have been permitted to effect the objects I had in view. End quote. Footnote. The curious reader will find details concerning patriarchal and prophetical tombs in Unexplored Syria. End footnote. End of chapter 34《Appendix I of Pilgrimage to El Medina and Mecca》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon.《Appendix I of Personal Narrative of a Pilgrimage to El Medina and Mecca》by Richard Francis Burton Of Hajj, or Pilgrimage the word Hajj is explained by Muslim divines to mean kast, or aspiration, and express man's sentiment that he is but a wayfarer on earth, wending towards another and a nobler world. This explains the origin and the belief that the greater the hardships, the higher will be the reward of the pious wanderer. He is urged by the voice of his soul, O oh, thou who toilst so hard for worldly pleasures and perishable profit, Wilt thou endure nothing to win a more lasting reward? Hence it is that pilgrimage is common to all old faiths. The Hindus still wander to Egypt, to Tibet, and to the inhospitable Caucasus. The classical philosophers visited Egypt, the Jews annually flocked to Jerusalem, and the Tartars and Mongols, Buddhists, journey to distant Lamasseres. The spirit of pilgrimage was predominant in medieval Europe, and the processions of the Roman Catholic Church are, according to her votaries, modern memorials of the effete rite. Footnote. Monsieur Hux travels in Tartary. And footnote. Every Muslim is bound, under certain conditions, to pay at least one visit to the holy city. Footnote. The two extremes between which lie many gradations are these. Abu Hanifa directs every Muslim and Muslima to perform the pilgrimage if they have health and money for the road and for the support of their families. Moreover, he allows a deputy pilgrim whose expenses must be paid by the principal. Ibn Malik, on the contrary, enjoins every follower to visit Mecca if able to walk and to earn his bread on the way. As a general rule, in al-Islam there are four shurda wujub, or necessary conditions, that is, one, Islam, the being a Muslim, two, Baluk, adolescence, three, Huyat, the being a free man, four, Akal, or mental sanity. Other authorities increase the conditions to eight, that is, five, Wujud al Sad, sufficiency of provision, six, Al Rala, having a beast of burden, if living two days' journey from Mecca, seven, Takliat al Tariq, the road being open, and eight, Imkan al Malsir, the being able to walk two stages if the pilgrim hath no beast. Others, again, include all conditions under two heads. One, Sihat, health. Two, Istitat, ability. These subjects have exercised not a little the casuistic talents of the Arab doctors. A folio volume might be filled with differences of opinion on the subject, Is a blind man sound? And footnote. This constitutes the Hajjat al Fats, the one obligatory pilgrimage, or Hajjat al Islam, of the Mohammedan faith. Repetitions become mere sunats, or practices of the Prophet, and are therefore supererogatory. Some European writers have of late years laboured to represent the Meccan pilgrimage as a fair, a pretext to collect merchants and to afford Arabia the benefits of purchase and barter. It would be vain to speculate whether the secular or the spiritual element originally prevailed, but most probably each had its portion. But those who peruse this volume will see that, despite the comparatively lukewarm piety of the age, the Meccan pilgrimage is religious, essentially, accidentally, an affair of commerce. Muslim pilgrimage is of three kinds. 1. Al-Mukarina, the uniting, 
is when the votary performs the Hajj and the Umrah together, as was done by the Prophet in his last visit to Mecca. Footnote. The technical meaning of these words will be explained below. and footnote. 2. Al-Ifrad, singulation, is when either the Hajj or the Umrah is performed singularly, the former preceding the latter. The pilgrim may be either Al-Mufrid bil Hajj, one who is performing only the Hajj, or vice versa, Al-Mufrid bil Umrah. According to Abu Hanifa, this form is more efficacious than the following. 3. Al-Tamatu, possession, is when the pilgrim assumes the Ikham, and preserves it throughout the months of Shawal, Zulkada, and nine days, ten nights, in Zulhijjah, performing Hajj and Umar the while. Footnote. At any other time of the year, Ikham is considered makru, or objectionable, without being absolutely sinful. End footnote. There is another threefold division of pilgrimage. 1. Umrah, the little pilgrimage, performed at any time except the pilgrimage season. It differs in some of its forms from Hajj, as will afterwards appear. 2. Hajj, or simple pilgrimage, performed at the proper season. 3. Hajj al Akbar, the great pilgrimage, is when the day of Arafat happens to fall upon a Friday. This is a most auspicious occasion. M. Corsin de Perceval and other writers departing from the practice of modern Islam make Hajj al Akbar to mean the simple pilgrimage in opposition to the Umrah, which they call Hajj al Asghar. The following companion of the Shafi pilgrim rites is translated from a little treatise by Mohammed of Sherbin, surnamed Al Khatib, a learned doctor whose work is generally read in Egypt and in the countries adjoining. Chapter 1 of Pilgrimage Footnote. In other books, the following directions are given to the intended pilgrim. Before leaving home, he must pray two prostrations, concluding the orisons with a long supplication and blessings upon relatives, friends, and neighbors, and he must distribute not fewer than seven silver pieces to the poor. The day should be either a Thursday or a Saturday. Some, however, say, Allah hath honored the Monday and the Thursday. If possible, the first of the month should be chosen, and the hour early dawn. Moreover, the pilgrim should not start without a rafiq or companion, who should be a pious as well as a travelled man. The other mukadamat al-safar, or preambles to journeying, are the following. Istikhar, consulting the rosary and friends. Kulus and Nayat, vowing pilgrimage to the Lord, not for lucre or revenge. Settling worldly affairs, paying debts drawing up a will, and making arrangements for the support of one's family, hiring animals from a pious person. The best mantra is a camel, because preferred by the prophet. An ass is not commendable. A man should not walk if he can afford to ride. And the palanquin or litter is, according to some doctors, limited to invalids. Reciting long prayers when mounting, halting, dismounting, and at nightfall. On hills the takbir should be used. The tasbih is properest for vales and plains, and Mecca should be blessed when first sighted. Avoiding abuse, curses, or quarrels, sleeping like the Prophet, namely, in early night, when prayer hour is distant, with iftirash, or lying at length with the right cheek on the palm of the dexter hand, and near dawn with itaka, that is, propping the head upon the hand, with the arm resting upon the elbow, and lastly, travelling with collyrium pot, looking-glass and comb, needle and thread for sewing, scissors and toothstick, staff and razor. End footnote. No, says the theologist with scant preamble, that the acts of al-hajj or pilgrimage are of three kinds. One, al-arkan or faraj, those made obligatory by Quranic precepts and therefore essentially necessary and not admitting expiatory or vicarious atonement, either in Hajj or Umrah. 2. Al-Wajibat, requisites, the omission of which may, according to some schools, be compensated for by the Fidjat, or atoning sacrifice. Footnote. In the Shefai school there is little difference between al fads and Al-Wajib. In Hanafi the former is a superior obligation to the latter. End footnote. 3. Al-Sunan, plural of Sunat the practice of the prophet, which may be departed from without positive sin. Now, the archon, 
the pillars upon which the right stands are six in number. Footnote. The Hanafi, Maliki, and even some Shafi doctors reduce the number from six to four, that is, one, Ikram, with Niyat, two, Tawaf, three, Wukuf, four, Sai, and footnote. That is, one, al ikram rendering unlawful, or the wearing pilgrim garb and avoiding certain actions. Two, al wukuf the standing upon Mount Arafat. Three, the Tawaf al or circumambulation of impetuosity. Footnote. The Ifasa is the impetuous descent from Mount Arafat. Its Tawaf, generally called Tawaf al zirat less commonly Tawaf al zadra or Tawaf al nuzul is that performed immediately after throwing the stones and resuming the lay called dress on the victim day at Mount Muna. And footnote. Four, the Sai, or course between Mount Safa and Mawa. Five, al halk tonger of the whole or part of the head for men or taxir cutting the hair for men or women footnote shaving is better for men cutting for women a razor must be passed over the bald head but it is sufficient to burn pluck shave or clip three hairs when the chevalier is long and footnote six al tartib or the due order of the ceremonies as above enumerated but al sai four may either precede or follow al wukuf too provided that the tawaf al kudum or the circumambulation of the arrival has previously been performed and hark five may be done before as well as after the tawaf al ifaza three now the wajibat requisites of pilgrimage also called nusuk are five in number that is one al ikram or assuming pilgrim garb from the mikat or fixed limit footnote the known mikat are north zulalifa northeast karn al manazil northwest al jufra south jalamlam east zat irg and footnote two the mabit or nighting at musdalifa for this a short portion generally in the latter watch preceding the yamal nach or victim day suffices three the spending at Muna the three nights of the Ayam al Tashrik, or days of drying flesh, of these the first is the most important. Four, the Rami al Jimar, or casting stones at the devil, and five, the avoiding of all things forbidden to the pilgrim when in a state of Ihram. Some writers reduce these requisites by omitting the second and third. The Tawaf al Vida, or the circumambulation of farewell, is a Wajib Mustakil, or particular requisite which may, however, be omitted without prejudice to pilgrimage. Finally, the sunat of pilgrimage are many in number. Of these I enumerate but a few. Hajj should precede Ummah. The tabiyat should be frequently ejaculated. The tawaf al kudum must be performed on arrival at Mecca before proceeding to Mount Arafat. Footnote. This tawaf is described in chapter 5. End footnote. The two bow prayers should follow Tawaf. A whole night should be passed at Musdalifa and Muna. Footnote. Generally speaking, as will afterwards be shown, the pilgrims pass straight through Musdalifa and spend the night at Muna. End footnote. The circumambulation of farewell must not be forgotten, and the pilgrim should avoid all sewn clothes, even slippers. Footnote. The Tawaf al Vida is considered a solemn occasion. The pilgrim first performs circumambulation. He drinks the waters of Zemzem, kisses the Kaaba threshold, and stands for some time with his face and body pressed against the Multazam. There, on clinging to the curtain of the Kaaba, he performs Takbir, Talil, Tahmid, and blesses the Prophet, weeping if possible, but certainly groaning. He then leaves the mosque, backing out of it with tears and lamentations, till he reaches the Baba Vida, whence, with a parting glance at the Beit Ullah, he went his way home. End footnote. Section 1 of Ikram. Before doffing his lakal garment, the pilgrim performs a total ablution, shaves and perfumes himself. He then puts on a rida and an iza. Footnote. See chapter 5. and footnote. Both new, clean, and of a white collar, after which he performs a tubo prayer, the sunat of al-Ikram, with the sotto voice niyat, specifying which rite he intends. Footnote. Many pronounce this niyat, 
if intending to perform pilgrimage the devotee standing before prayer says i avow this intention of hajj to allah the most high End footnote. when muhim that is in iham the muslim is forbidden unless in case of sickness necessity overheat or unendurable cold when a victim must expiate the transgression one to cover his head with aught which may be deemed a covering as a cap or turban but he may carry an umbrella dive under water stand in the shade and even place his hands upon his head a woman may wear sewn clothes white or light blue not black but her face veil should be kept at a distance from her face two to wear anything sewn or with seams as shirt trousers or slippers anything knotted or woven as chain armour but the pilgrim may use for instance a torn-up shirt or trousers bound round his loins or thrown over his shoulders he may knot his izar and tie it with a cord and he may gird his waist three to knot the rida or shoulder cloth footnote in spite of this interdiction pilgrims generally for convenience knot their shoulder clothes under the right arm and footnote four to deviate from absolute chastity, even kissing being forbidden to the muhrim. Marriage cannot be contracted during the pilgrimage season. 5. To use perfumes, oil, curling the locks, or removing the nails and hair by paring, cutting, plucking, or burning. The nails may be employed to remove particuli from the hair and clothes, but with care that no pile fall off. 6. To hunt wild animals, or to kill those which were such originally but he may destroy the five noxious, a kite, a crow, a rat, a scorpion, and a dog, given to biting. He must not cut down a tree, or pluck up a self-growing plant, but he is permitted to reap and to cut grass. Footnote. Hunting, killing, or maiming beasts in sanctuary land, and cutting down trees, are acts equally forbidden to the muhrim and the muhil, the Muslim in his normal state. For a large tree, a camel, for a small one, a sheep, must be sacrificed and footnote it is meritorious for the pilgrim often to raise the tabiat cry la baik alahuma la baik la sharika laka la baik in alamda wal niyamata laka wal muk la sharika laka la baik footnote see chapter five after the tabiat the pilgrim should bless the prophet and beg from allah paradise and protection from hell saying o allah by thy mercy spare us from the pains of hell fire and footnote when assuming the pilgrim garb and before entering mecca ghusl or total ablution should be performed but if water be not procurable the tayammum or sand ablution suffices the pilgrim should enter the holy city by day and on foot when his glance falls upon the kaaba he should say O Allah, increase this thy house in degree, and greatness, and honour, and dignity. Entering the outer Bab al-Salam, he must exclaim, O Allah, thou art the safety, and from thee is the safety. And then passing into the mosque, he should repair to the black stone, touch it with his right hand, kiss it, and commence his circumambulation. Footnote. Most of these injunctions are meritorious and may therefore be omitted without prejudice to the ceremony. And footnote. Now, the victims of Aligram are five in number, that is, one, the victim of requisites, when a pilgrim accidentally or willingly omits to perform a requisite, such as the assumption of the pilgrim garb at the proper place. This victim is a sheep, sacrificed at the Yid al-Qurban, in addition to the usual offering. Footnote namely the victim sacrificed on the great festival day at Muna, and footnote. Or, in lieu of it, ten days fast, three of them in the Hajj season, that is, on the sixth, seventh, and eighth days of zul and seven after returning home. Two, the victim of luxuries, turfa, such as shaving the head or using perfumes. This is a sheep, or a three days fast, or alms, consisting of three sa'a measures of grain, distributed among six paupers. 3. The victim of suddenly returning to lakal life, that is to say, before the proper time. It is also a sheep, after the sacrifice of which the pilgrim shaves his head. 4. The victim of killing game. If the animal slain be one for which the tame equivalents be procurable, 
a camel for an ostrich, a cow for a wild ass or cow, and a goat for a gazelle, the pilgrim should sacrifice it, or distribute its value, or purchase with it grain for the poor, or fast one day for each mud measure. If the equivalent be not procurable, the offender must buy its value of grain for alms deeds, or fast a day for every measure. 5. The victim of incontinence. This offering is either a male or a female camel. Footnote. So the commentators explain badana. End footnote. These failing, a cow or seven sheep, or the value of a camel in grain distributed to the poor, or a day's fast for each measure. Section 2 of Tawaf, or Circumambulation. Of this ceremony there are five vajibat, or requisites, that is, concealing the shame, as in prayer, footnote, a man's arat is from the navel to the knee, in the case of a free woman the whole of her face and person are shame, and footnote, ceremonial purity of body, garments, and place, circumambulation inside the mosque, seven circuits of the house, Commencements of circuits from the black stone, circumambulating the house with the left shoulder presented to it, circuiting the house outside its shazawan or marble basement. Footnote. If the pilgrim place but his hand upon the shazawan or on the hij, the tawaf is nullified. And footnote. And lastly, the niyat or intention of tawaf, specifying whether it be for hajj or for umrah. Of the same ceremony, if the principal sunat or practices are to walk on foot, to touch, kiss, and place his forehead upon the black stone, if possible after each circuit, to place the hand upon the rukun al yamani, south corner, but not to kiss it, to pray during each circuit for what is best for man, pardon of sins, to quote lengthily from the Quran. Footnote: This is a purely shafi practice. The Hanafi school rejects it on the grounds that the word of God should not be repeated when walking or running, and footnote, and to often say, Subhan Allah, and to mention none but Allah, to walk slowly during the first three circuits and trotting the last four, footnote, the reader will observe, chapter 5, that the Mutaviv made me reverse this order of things, and footnote, all the while maintaining a humble and contrite demeanour with downcast eyes. The following are the prayers which have descended to us by tradition. When touching the black stone, the pilgrim says, footnote, It is better to recite these prayers mentally, but as few pilgrims know them by heart, they are obliged to repeat the words of the Cicerone. And footnote, After Niyat, In the name of Allah, and Allah is omnipotent, O Allah, I do this in thy belief, and in verification of thy book, and in faithfulness to thy covenant, and in pursuance of the example of thy prophet Muhammad. May Allah bless him and preserve. Opposite the door of the house, O Allah, verily the house is thy house, and the sanctuary thy sanctuary, and the safeguard thy safeguard, and this is the place of the fugitive to flee from hell fire. Arrived at the Rukn al Iraqi, north corner, O Allah, verily I take refuge with thee from polytheism, shirk, and disobedience, and hypocrisy, and evil conversation, and evil thoughts concerning family, achel, a wife, and property, and progeny. Parallel with the mizab or rain-spout, O Allah, shadow me in thy shadow that day when there is no shade but thy shadow, and cause me to drink from the cup of thy prophet Muhammad, May Allah bless him and preserve that pleasant draught after which is no thirst to all eternity, O Lord of honour and glory. At the corners of Shami and Al Yamani, west and south angles, O Allah, make it an acceptable pilgrimage and the forgiveness of sins, and a laudable endeavour, and a pleasant action in thy sight, and a store that perisheth not, O thou glorious, O thou pardoner. Footnote. This portion is to be recited twice, and footnote. And between the southern and eastern corners, O Lord, grant to us in this world prosperity, and in the next world prosperity, and save us from the punishment of fire. After the sevenfold circumambulation, the pilgrim should recite a two-bow prayer, the sunnah of Tawaf, behind the Makam Ibrahim. If unable to pray there, he may take any other part of the mosque. 
These devotions are performed silently by day and allowed by night, and after prayer the pilgrim should return to the black stone and kiss it. Section 3 of Sai, or Course Between Mounts Safa and Mawa After performing Tawaf, the pilgrim should issue from the gate Al Safa, or another if necessary, and ascend the steps of Mount Safa, about a man's height from the street. Footnote a woman or hermaphrodite is enjoined to stand below the steps and in the street. And footnote. There he raises the cry Takbir and implores pardon for his sins. He then descends and turns towards Mount Marwa at a slow pace. Arrived within six cubits of the Mill al Aqzar, the green pillar planted in the corner of the temple on the left hand, he runs swiftly till he reaches the two green pillars the left one of which is fixed in the corner of the temple, and the other close to the Dar al-Abbas. Footnote. Women and hermaphrodites should not run here, but walk the whole way. I have frequently, however, seen the former imitating the men. And footnote. Thence he again walks slowly up to Mawa, and ascends it as he did Safa. This concludes a single course. The pilgrim then starts from Marwa, and walks, runs, and walks again through the same limits, till the seventh course is concluded. There are four requisites of Sai. The pilgrim must pass over all the space between Safa and Marwa. He must begin with Safa, and end with Marwa. He must traverse the distance seven times, and he must perform the rite after some important tawaf, as that of arrival, or that of return from Arafat. The practices of Sai are, briefly, to walk, if possible, to be in a state of ceremonial purity, to quote lengthily from the Quran, and to be abundant in praise of Allah. The prayer of Sai is, O my Lord, pardon and pity, and pass over that sin which thou knowest. Verily thou knowest what is not known, and verily thou art the most glorious, the most generous. O our Lord, grant us in this world prosperity and in the future prosperity, and save us from the punishment of fire. When Sai is concluded, the pilgrim, if performing only Umrah, shaves his head or clips his hair and becomes Muhu, returning to the Muslim's normal state. If he purpose Hajj or pilgrimage after Umrah, he reassumes the Ikram, and if he be engaged in pilgrimage, he continues Muhim, that is, in Ingram, as before. Section 4 of Wukuf, or standing upon Mount Arafat. The days of pilgrimage are three in number, namely the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth of the month Zul Ijah. Footnote. The Arab legend is that the angels asking the Almighty why Ibrahim was called Al Khalil, or God's friend, they were told that all his thoughts were fixed on heaven, and when they called to mind that he had a wife and child, Allah convinced them of the patriarch's sanctity by a trial. One night Ibrahim saw, in a vision, a speaker who said to him, Allah orders thee to draw near him with a victim. He awoke, and not comprehending the scope of the dream, took a special notice of it. Hence the first day of pilgrimage is called Yam al Tarviya. The same speaker visited him on the next night, saying, Sacrifice what is dearest to thee. From the patriarch's knowing what the first vision meant, the second day is called Yam Arafat. On the third night he was ordered to sacrifice Ismail. Hence that day is called Yam Nar, of throat-cutting. The English reader will bear in mind that the Muslim day begins at sunset. I believe that the origin of Tarviyat, which may mean carrying water, dates from the time of pagan Arabs, who spent that day in providing themselves with the necessary. Yam Arafat derives its name from the hill, and Yam al Nar from the victims offered to the idols in the Muna Valley. And footnote. On the first day, eighth, called Yam al Tarviya, the pilgrim should start from Mecca after the dawn prayer and sunrise, perform his noontide, afternoon, and evening devotions at Muna, where it is a sunat that he should sleep. Footnote. The present generation of pilgrims, finding the delay inconvenient, always pass on to Arafat without halting, and generally arrive at the mountain late in the afternoon of the eighth that is to say, the first day of pilgrimage. Consequently, they pray the morning prayer of the ninth at Arafat. And footnote. On the second day, ninth, the Yam Arafat, after performing the early prayer at Galas, 
that is, when a man cannot see his neighbor's face, on Mount Zabir, near Muna, the pilgrim should start when the sun is risen, proceed to the mountain of mercy, and camp there, and after performing the noontide and afternoon devotions at Mashid Ibrahim, footnote, this place will be described afterwards, end footnote, joining and shortening them, footnote, the Shafi, when engaged on a journey which takes up a night and day, is allowed to shorten his prayers, and to join the noon with the afternoon, and the evening with the night devotions, thus reducing the number of times from five to three per diem. The Hanafi school allows this on one day and on one occasion only, namely on the ninth of Zul Hijjah, arriving at Musalifa, when at the Isha hour it prays the Maghrib and the Isha prayers together. And footnote. He should take his station upon the mountain, which is all standing ground. But the best position is that preferred by the Prophet, near the great rocks lying at the lower slope of Arafat. He must be present at the sermon. Footnote. If the pilgrim be too late for the sermon, his labour is irretrievably lost. M. Cousin de Perceval makes the Prophet to have preached from his camel al Kasva on a platform at Mount Arafat before noon, and to have again addressed the people, after the post-meridian prayers, at the station of Sakarat, Muhammad's last pilgrimage, called by Muslims Hajj al bilah of perfection, as completing the faith, Hajj al-Islam, or Hajj al-Vida, of farewell, is minutely described by historians as the type and pattern of pilgrimage to all generations. And, footnote. and be abundant in Tabiyat, supplication, tahlil, recitations of the chapter say he is the one god footnote ibn abbas relates a tradition that whoever recites this short chapter eleven thousand times on the arafat day shall obtain from allah all he desires and footnote and weeping for that is the place for the outpouring of tears there he should stay till sunset and then decamp and return hastily to masalifa where he should pass a portion of the night Footnote. Most schools preferred to sleep, as the Prophet did, at Mustalifa, pray the night devotions there, and when the yellowness of the next dawn appears, collect the seven pebbles and proceed to Muna. The Shafi, however, generally leave Mustalifa about midnight. And footnote. After a visit to the mosque Masar al hakim he should collect seven pebbles and proceed to Muna. Footnote. These places will be minutely described in a future chapter. And footnote. Yam al nahr the third day of the pilgrimage, 10 sul is the great festival of the Muslim year. Amongst its many names, footnote, Id al Qurban, or the festival of victims, known to the Turks as Qurban Bayram, or the Indians as Bakait, the Kinefit, Id al Zua, or forenoon, or Id al Azza, of serene night. The day is called Yam al nahr of throat cutting. And footnote. Id al Qurban is the best known, as expressive of Ibrahim's sacrifice in lieu of Ismail. Most pilgrims, after casting stones at the Aqaba, or great devil, hurried to Mecca. Some entered the Kaaba, whilst others content themselves with performing the Tawaf al Vaza, or circumambulation of impetuosity, round the house. Footnote. If the ceremony of Sai has not been performed by the pilgrim after the circuit of arrival, he generally proceeds to it on this occasion. And footnote. The pilgrim should then return to Mnuna, sacrifice a sheep, and sleep there. Strictly speaking, this day concludes the pilgrimage. The second set of trois jours, namely the eleventh, the twelfth, and the thirteenth of Zul Hijjah. Footnote. This day, the eleventh, is known in books as Yam al because the pilgrims pass it in repose at Muna, and footnote, are called Ayam al Tashrik, or the days of drying flesh in the sun. The pilgrim should spend that time at Muna, footnote, the days of drying flesh, because at this period pilgrims prepare provisions for their return by cutting up their victims and exposing to the sun large slices slung upon long lines of cord. The schools have introduced many modifications into the ceremonies of these three days. Some spent the whole time at Muna and returned to Mecca on the morning of the 13th. Others return on the 12th, especially when that day happens to fall upon a Friday. And, footnote. and each day throw seven pebbles at each of the three pillars. Footnote. 
as will afterwards appear, the number of stones and the way of throwing them vary greatly in the various schools. And footnote. When throwing stones, it is desirable that the pilgrim should cast them far from himself, although he is allowed to place them upon the pillar. The act also should be performed after the zawal, or declension of the sun. The pilgrim should begin with the pillar near the Mashida Kaif, proceed to the Wusta, or central column, and end with the Akaba. If unable to cast the stones during the daytime, he is allowed to do it at night. The throwing over. The pilgrim returns to Mecca, and when his journey is fixed, performs the Tawaf Avida, of farewell. On this occasion it is a sunat to drink the waters of Zemzem, to enter the temple with more than usual respect and reverence, and bidding it adieu, to depart from the holy city. The Muslim is especially forbidden to take with him cakes made of the earth or dust of the harim, and similar mementos as they savour of idolatry. Chapter 2 of Umrah, or the Little Pilgrimage The word Umrah denotes a pilgrimage performed at any time except the pilgrim season, the 8th, ninth, and 10th of Zulhijjah. The archon or pillars upon which the Umrah rite rests are five in number, that is, one, al ikram two, al tabav three, al sai between Safa and Marwa, four, al hag tonjer or al taksir cutting the hair, five, al tatib or the due order of ceremonies as above enumerated. Footnote. The difference in the pillars of Umrah and Hajj is that in the former the standing on Arafat and the Tawaf al ifaza are necessarily omitted. End footnote. The wajibat, or requisites of Umrah, are but two in number. One, al ihram or assuming the pilgrim garb, from the mikat, or fixed limit. And, two, the avoiding of all things forbidden to the pilgrim when in state of ihram. In the sunat and mustahab portions of the ceremony, there is no difference between Umrah and Hajj. Chapter 3 Of Ziyarat, or the visit to the Prophet's tomb. al Ziyarat is a practice of the faith, and the most effectual way of drawing near to Allah through his prophet Muhammad. As the Zaire arrives at al Madina, when his eyes fall upon the trees of the city, he must bless the prophet with a loud voice. Then he should enter the mosque and sit in the holy garden, which is between the pulpit and the tomb, and pray a two-bow prayer in honour of the Mashid. After this he should supplicate pardon for his sins. Then, approaching the sepulchre, and standing four cubits away from it, recite this prayer. Peace be with thee, O thou th and y s. Footnote. The twentieth and thirty-sixth chapters of the Koran. and footnote. Peace be with thee, and upon thy descendants and thy companions, one and all, and upon all the prophets, and those inspired to instruct mankind. And I bear witness that thou hast delivered thy message, and performed thy trust, and advised thy followers, and swept away darkness, and fought in Allah's path the good fight. May Allah requite thee from us the best with which he ever requited profit from his followers. Let the visitor stand a while before the tomb with respect and reverence and singleness of mind and fear and awe. After which let him retreat one cubit and salute Abu Bakr the truthful in these words. Peace be with thee, O Caliph of Allah's prophet over his people, and aider in the defence of his faith. After this, again retreating another cubit, let him bless in the same way Omar the just. After which, returning to his former station opposite the Prophet's tomb, he should implore intercession for himself and for all dearest to him. He should not neglect to visit the Bakya cemetery and the Kuba mosque, where he should pray for himself and for his brethren of the Muslimin, or the Muslimat, the Muminin and the Muminat. Footnote. These second words are the feminines of the first. They prove that the Muslim is not above praying for what Europe supposed he did not believe in, namely, the souls of women. And footnote. The quick of them and the dead. When ready to depart, let the Zayr take leave of the mosque with a two-bow prayer, and visit the tomb, and salute it, and again beg intercession for himself and for those he loves. And the Zayr is forbidden to circumambulate the tomb, or to carry away the cakes of clay made by the ignorant with the earth and dust of the Hachim. End of Appendix 1
Appendix two, part one of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appendix two, part one of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. The Baytullah the house of allah has been so fully described by my predecessors that there is little inducement to attempt a new portrait footnote baytullah or house of allah and kaaba i e the cube house or la maison carre are all synonymous and a footnote readers however may desire a view of the great sanctuary and indeed without a plan and its explanation the ceremonies of the harem would be scarcely intelligible i will do homage to the memory of the accurate burckhardt and extract from his pages a description which shall be illustrated by a few notes the kaaba stands in an oblong square enclosed by a great wall two hundred fifty paces long and two hundred broad footnote ali bey gives five hundred thirty six feet nine inches by three hundred fifty six feet my measurement is two hundred fifty seven paces by two hundred and ten most muslim authors reckoning by cubits make the parallelogram four hundred four by three hundred ten and a footnote none of the sides runs quite in a straight line though at first sight the whole appears to be of a regular shape this open square is enclosed on the eastern side by a colonnade the pillars stand in a quadruple row they are three deep on the other sides and are united by pointed arches every four of which support a small dome plastered and whitened on the outside these domes according to qutb ad din are a hundred and fifty-two in number footnote on each short side are counted twenty-four domes on the long thirty-five this would give a total of a hundred and eighteen along the cloisters the arabs reckon in all a hundred and fifty-two viz twenty-four on the east side on the north thirty-six on the south thirty-six one on the mosque corner near the zarura minaret sixteen at the porch of the bab ziyada and fifteen at the bab ibrahim the shape of these domes is the usual median aranha and the superstition of the meccans inform the pilgrim that they cannot be counted the books reckon one thousand three hundred and fifty two pinnacles or battlements on the temple wall and a footnote the pillars are above twenty feet in height and generally from one foot and half to one foot and three quarters in diameter but little regularity has been observed in regard to them some are of white marble granite or porphyry but the greater number are of common stone of the mecca mountains footnote the common stone of the mecca mountains is a fine grey granite quarried principally from a hill near the bab shabaiqi which furnished material for the kaaba eastern authors describe the pillars as consisting of three different substances viz rukham or white marble and not alabaster its general sense suan or granite or cyanide and hajar shumaisi a kind of yellow sandstone so called from bir shumais a place on the jeddah road near hadda the halfway station and a footnote al fasi states the whole at five hundred fifty nine and says they are all of marble excepting a hundred and twenty six which are of common stone and three of composition qutb ad din reckons five hundred fifty five of which according to him three hundred eleven are of marble and the rest of the stone taken from the neighbouring mountains but neither of these authors lived to see the latest repairs of the mosque after the destruction occasioned by a torrent in a d sixteen twenty six footnote i counted in the temple five hundred fifty four pillars it is however difficult to be accurate as the four colonnades and the porticos about the two great gates are irregular topographical observations moreover must here be made under difficulties ali bey remembers them roughly at plus de cent cent colonnes pilastres and a footnote between every three or four columns stands an octagonal one about four feet in thickness on the east side are two shafts of reddish-grey granite in one piece 
and one fine grey porphyry with slabs of white felspath. On the north side is one granite column, and one of fine-grained red porphyry. These are probably the columns which Qutb din states to have been brought from Egypt, and principally from Ahmim, or Panopolis, when the chief or caliph al-Mahdi enlarged the mosque in A.H. 163. Among the 450 or 500 columns which form the enclosure, I found not any two capitals or bases exactly alike. The capitals are, of course, our San workmanship, some of them which had served for former buildings by the ignorance of the workmen have been placed upside down upon the shafts. I observed about half a dozen marble bases of good Grecian workmanship. A few of the marble bases bear Arabic or Kufic inscriptions, in which I read the dates 863 and 762 A.H. Footnote. The author afterwards informs us that the temple has been so often ruined and repaired that no traces of remote antiquity are to be found about it. He mentions some modern and unimportant inscriptions upon the walls and over the gates, knowing that many of the pillars were sent in ships from Syria and Egypt by the Caliph al-Mahdi, a traveller would have expected better things. End of footnote. A column on the east side exhibits a very ancient Kufic inscription, somewhat defaced, and I could neither read nor copy. Some of the columns are strengthened with broad iron rings or bands, as in many other Saracen buildings of the east. Footnote. The reason being that those shafts formed of the Meccan stone are mostly in three pieces, but the marble shafts are in one piece. End of footnote. They were first employed by Ibn Zahir Barquq, the king of Egypt, in rebuilding the mosque which had been destroyed by fire in A.H. 802. Footnote. To this may be added that the facades of the cloisters are twenty-four along the short walls and thirty-six along the others. They have stone ornaments not inaptly compared to the French fleur-de-lis. The capital and bases of the other pillars are grander and more regular than the inner. They support pointed arches, and the Arab secures his beloved variety by placing at every fourth arch a square pilaster. Of these there are on the long sides ten, and on the short seven. And a footnote. Some parts of the walls and arches are gaudily painted in stripes of yellow, red, and blue, as are also the minarets. The paintings of flowers in the usual Muslim style are nowhere seen. The floors of the colonnades are paved with large stones badly cemented together. Some paved causeways lead from the colonnades towards the Kaaba or the Holy House in the centre. Footnote. I counted eight, not including the broad pavement which leads from the Bab Ziyada to the Kaaba, or the four cross branches which connect the main lines. These Firash al Hajar, as they are called, also serve to partition off the area. One space, for instance, is called Hasot al Harim, or the women's sanded place, because it is appropriated to the female devotees. And a footnote. They are of sufficient breadth to admit four or five persons to walk abreast, and they are elevated about nine inches above the ground. Between these causeways, which are covered with fine gravel or sand, grass appears growing in several places produced by the zamzam water oozing out of the jars which are placed in the ground in long rows during the day footnote the jars are little amphorae which inscribed with the name of the donor and a peculiar cipher and a footnote there is a descent of eight or nine steps from the gates on the north side into the platform of the colonnade, and three or four steps from the gates on the south side. Towards the middle of this area stands the Kaaba. It is 115 paces from the north colonnade and 88 from the south. For this want of symmetry we may readily account, the Kaaba having existed prior to the mosque which was built around it and enlarged at different periods. The Kaaba is an oblong massive structure, eighteen paces in length, fourteen in breadth, and from thirty-five to forty feet in height. Footnote. My measurements give twenty-two paces, or fifty-five feet in length, 
by eighteen or forty-five of breadth, and the height appeared greater than the length. Ali Bey makes the eastern side thirty-seven French feet, two inches and six lines, the western thirty-eight degrees, four feet and six inches, the northern twenty-nine feet, the southern thirty-one degrees, six feet, and the height thirty-four degrees, four feet he therefore calls it a veritable trapezium in al idris's time it was twenty-five cubits by twenty-four and twenty-seven cubits high and a footnote it is constructed of the grey mecca stone in large blocks of different sizes joined together in a very rough manner with bad cement footnote i would alter this sentence thus it is built of fine grey granite in the horizontal course of masonry of irregular depth the stones are tolerably fitted together and are held by excellent mortar like roman cement the lines are also straight and a footnote it was entirely rebuilt as it now stands in a d sixteen twenty seven the torrent in the preceding year had thrown down three of its sides and preparatory to its re-erection the fourth side was according to assami pulled down after the ulamas or the learned divines had been consulted on the question whether mortals may be permitted to destroy any part of the holy edifice without incurring the charge of sacrilege and infidelity the kaaba stands upon a base of two feet in height which presents a sharp inclined plane footnote this base is called al shazarwan from the persian shadarwan a cornish eaves or canopy it is in penthouse shape projecting about a foot beyond the wall and composed of fine white marble slabs polished like glass there are two breaks in it one opposite and under the doorway and another in front of ismail's tomb pilgrims are directed during circumambulation to keep their bodies outside of the shazarawan this would imply it to be part of the building but its only use appears in the large brass rings welded into it for the purpose of holding down the kaaba covering and a footnote its roof being flat it has at a distance the appearance of a perfect cube Footnote. Ali Bey also errs in describing the roof as plat en dessous. Were such the case, rain would not pour off with a violence through the spout. Most Oriental authors allow a cubit of depression from southwest to northwest. In Ali Dris's day, the Kaaba had a double roof. Some say this is the case in the present building, which has not been materially altered in shape since its restoration by Al Hajjaj in AH eighty three. The roof was then eighteen cubits long by fifteen broad. End of footnote. The only door which affords entrance and which is opened but two or three times in a year. Footnote. In Ibn Jubayr's time, the Kaaba was opened every day in Rajab and in other months on every monday and friday the house may now be entered ten or twelve times a year gratis and by pilgrims as often as they can collect amongst parties a sum sufficient enough to tempt the guardian's cupidity and a footnote is on the north side and about seven feet above the ground footnote this mistake in which burckhardt is followed by all our popular authors is the more extraordinary as all arabic authors call the door wall janib al mashriq or the eastern side or wajh al bayt the front of the house as opposed to dhar al bayt the back of the house niebuhr is equally in error when he asserts that the door fronts to the south arabs always hold the rukn al iraqi or the iraqi angle to face the polar star and so it appears in ali bey's plan the kaaba therefore has no northern side and it must be observed that muslim writers dispose the length of the kaaba from east to west whereas our travellers make it from north to south ali bey places the door only six feet from the pavement but he calculates distances by the old french measure it is about seven feet from the ground and six from the corner of the black stone between the two the space of the wall is called al multism in burckhardt by clerical error is called al metzem volume one page hundred and seventy three it derives its name from the attached to because here the circumambulator should apply his bosom and beg pardon for his sins 
Al-Multism, according to M. de Perceval, following Dosson, was formerly Le Lieu d'Engagements, whence, according to him, its name. Le Multism, says M. Galan, rit à cérémonie du pèlerinage de la Mecque, qui est centré la pied noire et la porte, et l'endroit où Mohammed se réconcilia avec ses dix compagnons, qui disaient qu'il n'était pas véritablement prophète. End of footnote. In the first periods of Al Islam, however, when it was rebuilt in AH sixty four by Ibn Zubair, chief of Mecca, it had two doors, even with the ground floor of the mosque. Footnote. From the Bab al Ziyada, or the gate in the northern colonnade, you descend by two flights of steps, in all about twenty five. This depression manifestly arises from the level of the town having been raised like Rome by successive layers of ruins. The most populous and substantial quarters, as the Shamiya to the north, as one might expect, would be the highest, and this is actually the case. But I am unable to account satisfactorily for the second hollow within the temple, and immediately around the house of Allah, where the door, according to all historians formerly on a level with the pavement, and now about seven feet above it, shows the exact amount of depression, which cannot be accounted for simply by calcation. Some chroniclers assert that when the Quraysh rebuilt the house, they raised the door to prevent devotees entering without their permission. But seven feet would scarcely oppose an entrance, and how will this account for the floor of the building being also raised to that height above the pavement? It is curious to observe the similarity between this inner hollow of the Meccan fane and the artificial depression of the Hindu pagoda where it is intended to be flooded. The Hindus would also revere the form of the Mecca fane, exactly resembling their square temples at whose corners are placed brahma vishnu shiva and ganesha who adore the great universal generator in the centre the second door anciently stood on the side of the temple opposite the present entrance inside its place can be traced Ali Bey suspects its having existed in the modern building, and declares that the exterior of the surface of the wall shows the tracery of a blocked-up door, similar to that still open. Some historians declare that it was closed by the Quraysh when they rebuilt the house in Muhammad's day, and the subsequent erection have had only one. The general opinion is that Al-Hajjaj finally closed up the western entrance, doctors also differ as this to its size the popular measurement is three cubits broad and little more than five in length and a footnote the present door which according to azraqi was brought hither from constantinople in a d sixteen thirty three is wholly coated with silver and has several gilt ornaments upon its threshold are placed every night various small lighted wax candles and perfuming pans filled with musk aloe wood etc footnote pilgrims and ignorant devotees collect the drippings of wax the ashes of the aloe wood and the dust from the ataba or the threshold of the kaaba either to rub upon their foreheads or to preserve as relics these superstitious practices are sternly rebuked by the ulama End of footnote. at the north-east corner of the kaaba footnote for north-east read south-east and a footnote near the door is the famous black stone footnote i will not enter into the fabulous origin of the hajar al aswad some of the traditions connected with it are truly absurd when allah says ali made covenant to the sons of adam on the day of fealty he placed the paper inside the stone it will therefore appear at the judgment and bear witness to all who have touched it muslims agree that it was originally white and became black by reason of men's sins it appeared to me a common aerolit covered with a thick slaggy coating glossy and pitch-like worn and polished dr wilson of bombay showed me a specimen in his possession which externally appeared to be a black slag with the inside of a bright and sparkling greyish-white the result of admixture of nickel with iron 
this might possibly as the learned orientalist then suggested account for the mythic change of colour its appearance on earth after a thunderstorm and its being originally a material part of the heavens qutb din expressly declares that when the qaramita restored it after twenty-two years to the meccans men kissed and rubbed it upon their brows and remarked that the blackness was only superficial while the inside being white some greek philosophers it will be remembered believed that the heavens to be composed of stones cosmos or shooting stars and the sanconiathan ascribing the aerolite worship of the god Kaolus, described them to be living or animated stones the arabian says maximus of tyre in dissertation thirty eight page four hundred fifty five pay homage to i know not what god which represented by a quadrangle stone the gross fetishism of the hindus it is well known introduced them to lithology at jagannath they worship a pyramidal black stone fabled to have fallen from heaven or miraculously to have presented itself on the place where the temple now stands moreover they revere the salagram as the emblem of vishnu the second person in their triad the rudest emblem of the bonus deus was a round stone it was succeeded in india by the cone and triangle in egypt by the pyramid in greece it was represented by cones of terracotta about three inches and a half long without going deep into theory it may be said that the kaaba and the hajar are the only two idols which have survived the three hundred sixty composing the heavenly host of the arab pantheon thus the hindu poet exclaims behold the marvels of my idol temple o muslim that when its idols are destroyed it becomes allah's house wilford asiatic society volumes three and four makes the hindus declare that the black stone at mokesha or mokshashtana or mecca was an incarnation of mokeshwara an incarnation of shiva who with his consort visited al hijaz when the kaaba was rebuilt this emblem was placed in the outer wall for contempt but the people still respected it in the dabistan the black stone is said to be an image of Kaiwan or saturn and a shahristani also declares the temple to have been dedicated to the same planet zuhal whose genius is represented in the puranas as fierce hideous four-armed and habited in a black cloak with dark turban muslim historians are unanimous in asserting that the sasan son of babikan and other persian monarchs gave rich presents to the kaaba they especially mention the two golden crescent moons as significant offering the guaber assert that among the images and relics left by mahabbat and his successors in the kaaba was the black stone an emblem of saturn they also call the city mahka or the moon's place from an exceedingly beautiful image of the moon whence they say the arabs derived mecca and the sabaeans equally respect the kaaba and the pyramids which they assert to be the tombs of seth enoch or herms and sabi the son of enoch mecca then it is claimed as a sacred place and the hajar al aswad as well as the kaaba are revered as holy emblems by four different faiths the hindu sabaean guaber and muslim i have little doubt and hope to prove at another time that the jews connected it with traditions about abraham this would be the fifth religion that looks towards the kaaba a rare meeting-place of devotion End of footnote. the black stone forms a part of the sharp angle of the building footnote. presenting this appearance in profile the hajar was suffered from the iconoclastic principle of islam having once narrowly escaped destruction by the order of al hakim of egypt in these days the metal rim serves as a protection as well as an ornament End of footnote. it forms a part of the sharp angle of the building at four or five feet above the ground footnote. the height of the hajar from the ground according to my measurement is four feet nine inches ali bey places it at forty two inches above the pavement End of footnote it is an irregular oval about seven inches in diameter with an undulating surface composed of about a dozen smaller stones of different sizes and shapes well joined together with a small quantity of cement and perfectly well smoothed 
it looks as if the whole had been broken into many pieces by a violent blow and then united again it is very difficult to determine accurately the quality of this stone which has been worn to its present surface by the million touches and kisses it has received it appears to me like a lava containing several small extraneous particles of whitish and of yellowish substances its colour is now deep reddish-brown approaching to black it is surrounded on all sides by a border composed of substances which i took to be a close cement of pitch and gravel of a similar but not quite the same brownish colour footnote the colour was black and metallic and the centre of the stone was sunk about two inches below the metal circle round the sides was a reddish-brown cement almost level with the metal and sloping down to the middle of the stone ibn jubeir declares the depth of the stone unknown but that most people believe that it extends two cubits into the wall in his day it was three shibers broad shibir is the large span from thumb to the little finger-tip and one span long with knobs and a joining of four pieces which the karamita had broken the stone was set in a silver band its softness and moisture were such says ibn jubeir that the sinner would never remove his mouth from it which phenomenon made the prophet declare it to be the covenant of allah on earth End of footnote this border serves to support its detached pieces it is two or three inches in breadth and rises a little above the surface of the stone both the border and the stone itself are encircled by a silver band broader below than above footnote the band is now a massive circle of gold or silver gilt i found the aperture in which the stone is one span and three fingers broad and a footnote and on the two sides with a considerable swelling below as if a part of the stone were hidden under it the lower part of the border is studded with silver nails on the south-east corner of the kaaba or as the arabs call it rukn al yamani there is another stone about five feet from the ground footnote the rukn al yamani is the corner facing the south the part alluded to in the text is the wall of the kaaba between the shami and the yamani angles distant about three feet from the latter and near the side of the old western door long since closed the stone is darker and redder than the rest of the wall it is called al-mustajab or al-mustajab min al dhunub or mustajab al dua where prayer is granted pilgrims here extend their arms press their bodies against the building and beg pardon for their sins End of footnote it is one foot and half in length and two inches in breadth placed upright on of the common mecca stone this the people walking round the kaaba touch only with their right hand and they do not kiss it footnote i have frequently seen it kissed by men and women End of footnote. on the north side of the kaaba just by its door and close to the wall is a slight hollow in the ground footnote al mahajan is the place of mixing or kneading because the patriarchs here kneaded the mud used as cement in the holy building some call it al hufra or the hole and it is generally known as maqam jibril the place of gabriel because here descended the inspired order for the five daily prayers and at this spot the archangel and the prophet performed their devotions making it a most auspicious spot it is on the north of the door from which it is distant about two feet its length is seven spans and seven fingers breadth seven spans three fingers and depth one span four fingers the following sentence from herkalet qanun islam chapter twelve section five may serve to show the extent of error still popular the author after separating the baytullah from the kaaba erroneously making the former the name of the whole temple proceeds to say the rain-water which falls on the kaaba terrace runs off through a golden spout on a stone near it called the rukn al yamani or the alabaster stone and stands over the grave of ismail and a footnote lined with marble and sufficiently large to admit of three persons sitting here it is thought meritorious to pray the spot is called al mahajan and supposed to be where abraham and his son ismail kneaded the chalk and mud which they used in building the kaaba and near this mahajan the former is said to have placed a large stone upon which he stood while working at the masonry 
On the basis of the Kaaba just over the Majjan is an ancient Kufic inscription, but this I was unable to decipher and had no opportunity of copying it. On the west or the northwest side of the Kaaba, about two feet below its summit, is the famous Mezab or the water spout. Footnote generally called Mizab al-Rahman, or Spout of Mercy. It carries rain from the roof and discharges it upon Ismail's grave, where pilgrims stand fighting to catch it. In al Idrisi's time it was of wood, now it is said to be of gold, but it looks really dingy. End of footnote. Through which the rainwater collected on the roof of the building is discharged, so as to fall upon the ground. It is about four feet in length and six inches in breadth, as well as I could judge from below, with borders equal in height to its breadth. At the mouth hangs what is called the beard of the Maizab, a gilt board over which the water flows. This spout was sent hither from Constantinople in A.H. 981, and is reported to be of pure gold. The pavement round the Kaaba below the Maizab was laid down in A.H. 826 and consists of various coloured stones, forming a very handsome specimen of mosaic. There are two large slabs of fine verdi antico in the centre, which, according to Macrisi, were sent thither as presents from Cairo in A.H. 241. Footnote. Usually called the Hajar al-Akhdar, or the green stone, Al Idrisi speaks of a white stone covering Ismail's name. Ibn Jubair of green marble, longish in the form of mihrab arch, and near it a white round slab, in both of which are spots that make them appear yellow. And near them, we are told, and towards the Iraqi corner is the tomb of Hajar, under a green slab one span and half broad, and pilgrims used to pray at both places. Ali Bey earnestly applies the words al hajar Ismail to the parapet about the slab. and a footnote. This is the spot where, according to the Mohammedan tradition, Ismail, the son of Ibrahim, and his mother Hajra were buried. And here it is meritorious for the pilgrim to recite a prayer of two rak'ats. On this side is a semicircular wall, the two extremities of which are in a line with the sides of the Kaaba, and distant from it three or four feet, leaving an opening which leads to the burial place of Ismail. Footnote. My measurements give five feet six inches. In al Idris's day the wall was fifty cubits long. End of footnote. The wall bears the name Al-Hatim. Footnote. Al-Hatim literally means the broken. Burkhardt asserts that the Makawi no longer apply the word, as some historians do, to the space bounded by the Kaaba, the partition, the Zamzam, and the Maqam of Ibrahim. I heard it, however, so used by learned Meccans, and they gave as the meaning of the name the break in this part of the oval pavement which surrounds the Kaaba. Historians relate that all who rebuilt the house of Allah followed Abraham's plan till the Quraysh, and after them Al-Hajjaj curtailed it in the direction of Al-Hatim, which part was then first broken off and ever since remained so. And the footnote, and the area which it encloses is called Hijr or Hijr Ismail. Footnote, Al-Hijr is the space separated from the Kaaba, as the name denotes. Some supposes that Abraham here penned his sheep. Possibly Ali Bey means this part of the temple when he speaks of Al Hajar Ismail, the Pierre d'Ismail. And a footnote: On account of its being separated from the Kaaba, the wall itself also is sometimes so called. Tradition says that the Kaaba once extended as far as the Hatim, and that the side having fallen down at the time of the Hajj, the expenses of repairing it were demanded from the pilgrims, under a pretense that the revenues of the government were not acquired in a manner sufficiently pure to admit their application towards a purpose so sacred. The sum, however, obtained proved very inadequate. All that could be done, therefore, was to raise the wall which marked the space formerly occupied by the Kaaba. This tradition, although current among the Motawifs or Ciceronis, is at variance with history, which declares that the Hijr was built by the Bani Quraysh, who contracted the dimensions of the Kaaba, that it was united to the building by the Hajjaj, and again separated from it by Ibn Zubair. Footnote. Al-Hajjaj. This, as well afterwards be seen, is a mistake. 
he excluded the hatim and a footnote it is asserted by al fasi that a part of the hijr as it now stands was never comprehended within the kaaba the law regards it as a portion of the kaaba inasmuch as it is esteemed equally meritorious to pray in the hijr as in the kaaba itself and the pilgrims who have not had an opportunity of entering the latter are permitted to affirm upon an oath that they have prayed inside the kaaba although they have only prostrated themselves within the enclosure of the hatim the wall is built of solid stone about five feet in height and four in thickness cased all over with white marble and inscribed with prayers and invocations neatly sculptured upon the stone in modern characters footnote as well as memory serves me for i have preserved no note the inscriptions are in the marble casing and indeed no other stone meets the eye End of footnote these and the casings are the work of al ghuri the egyptian sultan in a h nine hundred seventeen the walk around the kaaba is performed on the outside of the wall the nearer to it is the better around the kaaba is a good pavement of marble about eight inches below the level of the great square footnote as well as memory serves me for i have preserved no note the inscriptions are in the marble casing and indeed no other stone meets the eye and a footnote it was laid in a h nine hundred eighty one by the order of the sultan and describes an irregular oval it is surrounded by thirty-two slender gilt pillars or rather poles between every two of which are suspended seven glass lamps always lighted after sunset footnote it is a fine close grey polished granite the wall is called al mataf or the place of circumambulation and a footnote beyond the poles is a second pavement about eight paces broad somewhat elevated above the first but of coarse work then another six inches higher and eighteen paces broad upon which stand several small buildings beyond this is the gravelled ground so that two broad steps may be said to lead from the square down to the kaaba the small buildings just mentioned which surround the kaaba are the five maqams with the well of zamzam the arch called bab salam and the member footnote these are now iron posts very numerous supporting cross rods and of tolerably elegant shape in ali bey's time there were trente un colonne mines and piliers and bronze some native works say thirty-three including the two marble columns between each two hang several white or green glass globe lamps with wicks and oil floating on water their light is faint and dismal the whole of the lamps in the harem is said to be more than a thousand yet they serve but to make darkness more visible and a footnote opposite the four sides of the kaaba stand four other small buildings where the imams of the orthodox mohammedan sects the hanafi shafi hanbali and maliki take their station and guide the congregation in their prayers the maqam al maliki on the south and that of hanbali opposite the black stone are small pavilions open on all sides and supported by four slender pillars with a light sloping roof terminating in a point exactly in the style of indian pagodas footnote there are only four maqams the hanafi maliki hanbali and the maqam ibrahim and there is some error of diction below for in these it means that the imams stand before their congregations and nearest to the kaaba in ibn jubayr's time the zaidi sect was allowed an imam though known to be schismatics and abusers of the caliphs now not being permitted to have a separate station for prayer they suppose theirs to be suspended from heaven above the kaaba roof and a footnote the maqam al hanafi which is the largest being fifteen paces by eight is open on all sides and supported by twelve small pillars it has an upper story also open where the muaddin who calls to prayers takes his stand this was built in a h nine hundred twenty three by sultan salim the first it was afterwards rebuilt by khushgildi governor of jidda in nine hundred forty seven but all the four maqams as they now stand were built in a h one thousand and seventy four the maqam al shafi is over the well zamzam to which it serves as an upper chamber footnote the maqam al maliki is on the west of and thirty-seven cubits from the kaaba that of the hanbali is forty-seven paces distant and a footnote near their respective maqams the adherents of the four different sects seat themselves for prayer 
During my stay at Mecca, the Hanafis always begin their prayer first, but according to Mazalman custom, the Shafi'is should pray first in the mosque, then the Hanafis, Malikis, and Hanbalis. The prayer of Maghrib is an exception, which they are all enjoined to utter together. Footnote. In Burkhardt's time, the school prays according to the seniority of their founders, and they uttered the azan of Maghrib together, because that is a peculiarly delicate hour, which easily passes by unnoticed. In the twelfth century, at all times but the evening, the Shafi'i began, then came the Maliki and Hanbali simultaneously, and lastly the Hanafi. Now the Sheikh al muazzinin begins the call, which is taken up by the others. He is a Hanafi, as indeed are all the principal people at Mecca, only a few wild sharifs of the hills being Shafi'i. End of footnote. The Maqam al-Hanbali is the place where the officers of the government and other great people are seated during prayers. Here the Pasha and the Sharif are placed, and in their absence the eunuchs of the temple. These fill the space under this Maqam in front, and behind it the female hajjis who visit the temple have their places assigned to to which they repair principally for the two evening prayers few of them being seen in the mosque and the three other daily prayers they also perform the tawaf or the walk around the kaaba but generally at night though it is not uncommon to see them walking in the daytime among the men End of appendix two part one Appendix 2, Part 2 of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appendix 2, Part 2 of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. The Baytullah. The present building, which encloses Zamzam, stands close by the Maqam al Hanbali and was erected in a h one thousand and seventy two it is of a square shape and of massive construction with an entrance to the north opening into the room which contains the well footnote the door of the zamzam building fronts the southeast and the footnote this room is beautifully ornamented with marbles of various colours and adjoining to it but having separate door is a small room with a stone reservoir which is always full of zamzam water this the hajjis get to drink by passing their hands with a cup through an iron grated opening which serves as a window into the reservoir without entering the room the mouth of the well is surrounded by a wall five feet in height and about ten feet in diameter upon this the people stand who draw up the water in leathern buckets an iron railing being so placed as to prevent their falling in in al time there were eight marble basins in this room for the purpose of ablution on the north-east or the south-east side of zamzam stand two small buildings one behind the other called al qubbatain footnote this is not exactly correct as the plan will show the angle of one building touches the angle of its neighbour and a footnote they are covered by domes painted in the same manner as the mosque and in them are kept water jars lamps carpets mats brooms and other articles used in the very mosque footnote their names and offices are now changed one is called qubbat al-sa'at and contains the clocks and chronometers two of them english sent as presents to the mosque by the sultan the other is known as the qubbat al-kutub is used as a storeroom for manuscripts bequeathed to the mosque they still are open to burkhardt's just criticism being nothing but the common dome springing from four walls and vulgarly painted with bands of red yellow and green in ibn jubayr's time the two domes contained bequests of books and candles the qubbat abbas or that further from the kaaba than its neighbour was also called qubbat al-sharab or the dome of drink because zamzam water was here kept cooling for the pilgrims in dawrak or earthen jars the nearer was termed qubbat al-yahudi and the tradition they told me was that a jew having refused to sell his house upon the spot was allowed to remain in loco by the prophet as a lasting testimony to his regard for justice a similar tale is told of an old woman's hut 
which was allowed to stand in the corner of the great Nushirawan's royal halls. End of footnote. These two ugly buildings are injurious to the interior appearance of the building, their heavy forms and structures being very disadvantageously contrasted to the light and airy shape of the maqams. I heard some hajis from Greece, men of a better taste than Arabs, express their regret that the Qubbatain should be allowed to disfigure the mosque. They were built by Khushgildi, the governor of Jidda, in A.H. 947, one is called Qubbat al-Abbas, from having been placed on the site of a small tank said to have been formed by Abbas, the uncle of Muhammad. A few paces west or northwest of Zamzam, and directly opposite to the door of the Kaaba, stands a ladder or a staircase. Footnote. Called a Daraj. A correct drawing of it may be found in Ali Bey's work. End of footnote which is moved up to the wall of the Kaaba on days when that building is opened, and by which the visitors ascend to the door. It is of wood, with some carved ornaments, moves on low wheels, and is sufficiently broad to admit of four persons ascending abreast. The first ladder was sent hither from Cairo in A.H. 818 by Mu'ayyid Abu Nasr, king of Egypt. In the same line with the ladder, and close by it, stands a lightly built insulated and circular arch, about fifteen feet wide and eighteen feet high. This is called the Bab al-Salam, which must not be confounded with the great gate of the mosque bearing the same name. Those who enter the Baytullah for the first time are enjoined to do so by the outer and inner Bab al-Salam. In passing under the latter, they are to exclaim, O God, may it be a happy entrance. I do not know by whom this arch was built, but it appears to be modern. Footnote. The Bab al-Salam, or Bab al-Nabi, or Bab al Nusheba, resembles in its isolation a triumphal arch, and is built of cut stone. End of footnote. Nearly in front of the Bab al-Salam, and nearer the Kaaba than any of the other surrounding buildings, stands the Maqam Ibrahim. Footnote. The praying place of Abraham. Readers will remember that the Meccan mosque is peculiarly connected with Ibrahim, whom Muslims prefer to all prophets except Muhammad. End of footnote. This is a small building supported by six pillars about eight feet high, four of which are surrounded from top to bottom by a fine iron railing while they leave the space beyond the two hind pillars open within the railing is a frame about five feet square terminating in a pyramid top and set to contain the sacred stone upon which ibrahim stood while he built the kaaba and which with the help of his son ismail he had removed from hence to the place called al majan already mentioned the stone is said to have yielded under the weight of the patriarch and to preserve the impression of his foot still visible upon it but no haji has ever seen it as the frame is always entirely covered with a brocade of red silk richly embroidered footnote this i believe to be incorrect i was asked five dollars for permission to enter but the sum was too high for my finances Learned men told me that the stone shows the impress of two feet, especially the big toes, and devout pilgrims fill the cavities with water, which they rub all over their eyes and faces. When the Caliph al-Mahdi visited Mecca, one Abdullah bin Uthman presented himself at the unusual hour of noon, and informing the prince that he had brought him a relic, which no man but himself had yet seen, produced this celebrated stone. Al-Mahdi, rejoicing greatly, kissed it, rubbed his face against it, and pouring water upon it, drank the draught. Qutb al-Din, one of the Meccan historians, says that it was visited in his day. In Ali Bey's time, it was covered with un magnifique trap noir brod, un et un argent, avec des rois glandes et non. He does not say, however, that he saw the stone. Its veils, called Sitr Ibrahim al-Khalil, are a green ibrisham or silk mixed with cotton and embroidered with gold they are made at cairo of three different colours black red and green and one is devoted to each year the gold embroidery is in the thulthi character and expresses the throne verse the chapter of the cave and the name of the reigning sultan on the top is allah below it muhammad and beneath this is ibrahim al-khalil 
and at each corner is the name of the four caliphs in a note to the dabistan volume two page four hundred and ten we find two learned orientalists confounding the black stone with abraham's station or platform the prophet honoured the black stone upon which abraham conversed with hajar to which he tied his camels and upon which the traces of his feet are still seen and a footnote persons are constantly seen before the railing invoking the good offices of ibrahim and a short prayer must be uttered by the side of the maqam after the walk around the kaaba is completed it is said that many of the sahaba or first adherents of muhammad were entered in the open space between this maqam and zamzam from which circumstance it is one of the most favourite places of prayers in the mosque Footnote. not only here i was told by learned meccans but under all the oval pavements surrounding the kaaba and a footnote in this part of the area the caliph suleiman bin abdul malik brother of walid built a fine reservoir in a h ninety seven which was filled from a spring east of arafat but the Makawis destroyed it after his death on the pretence that the water of zemzam was preferable footnote the spring gushes from the southern base of mount arafat as will afterwards be noticed it is exceedingly pure and a footnote on the side of maqam ibrahim facing the middle part of the front of the kaaba stands the member or the pulpit of the mosque it is elegantly formed of fine white marble with many sculptured ornaments and was sent as present to the mosque in a h nine hundred sixty nine by sultan suleiman bin selim footnote the author informs us that the first pulpit was sent from cairo in a h eight hundred eighteen together with a staircase both being the gifts of muayyid caliph of egypt ali bey accurately describes the present mimbar and a footnote a straight narrow staircase leads up to the post of the khatib or the preacher which is surmounted by a gilt polygonal pointed steeple resembling an obelisk here the sermon is preached on fridays and on certain festivals these like the friday sermons of all mosques in the mohammedan countries are usually of the same turn with some slight alterations upon extraordinary occasions footnote the curious will find a specimen of a muslim sermon in lane's module egypt volume one chapter three and a footnote i have now described all the buildings within the enclosure of the temple the gates of the mosque are nineteen in number and are distributed about it without any order of symmetry footnote burkhardt subjoins their names as they are usually written upon small cards by the motowifs in another column are the names by which they were known in more ancient times principally taken from the azraqi and the qutubi i have added a few remarks in brackets mention is made of modern name arches and ancient names one bab salam composed of three gates or arches and the ancient name is bab bani sheba this is properly applied to the inner not the outer salam gate two modern name is bab nebi it has two gates or arches ancient name is bab al jinais gate of the bears the dead being carried through it into the mosque three bab al abbas opposite to this the house of abbas once stood number of arches or gates three ancient name bab sartaqat some muslim authors confound this bab al abbas with the gate of bears four modern name is bab ali number of gates or arches is three ancient name is bab bani hashim five bab al zed or bab al ashara number of arches and gates two ancient name is bab bazan so called from a neighboring hill six bab al baghla number of arches or gates two no ancient name seven bab al safa five arches or gates the ancient name bab bani makhzum eight bab al sharif number of arches and gates two ancient name bab al jihad so called because leading to the hill a jihad nine bab mujahid number of gates and arches two ancient name bab al dukhma ten bab zuleikha gate and arches too ancient name bab sharif ajillan who built it eleven bab umhani so called from the daughter of abi talib gate and arches too ancient name bab al hazurra some write this bab al zarura twelve bab al wada 
through which the pilgrim passes when taking his final leave of the temple gate and arches too ancient name bab juma thirteen bab ibrahim or bab al khayyatin so called from a tailor who had a shop near it gate or arches one no ancient name fourteen bab al umra through which pilgrims issue to visit the umra also called bani sahem arch and gate one ancient name bab amir ibn al yas or bab sidra fifteen bab atiq arch and gate one ancient name bab al ajali sixteen bab al basti gate and arch one ancient name bab ziyad dar nadwa seventeen bab al qutubi so called from the historian of mecca who lived in an adjoining lane and opened this small gate into the mosque number of gate and arches one no ancient name eighteen bab ziyade number of arches and gate three ancient name is called bab ziyada or the gate of access because it is a new structure thrown out into the shamia or the syrian quarter nineteen bab draibe gate or arches one ancient name bab madrasa the total number of the arches are thirty-nine an old pair of slippers is here what a shocking bad hat is at a crowded house in europe a self-preserver burkhart lost three pairs i more fortunately only one and a footnote burkhart's description of the gates is short and imperfect on the eastern side of the mosque there are four principal entrances seven on the southern side three in the western and five in the northern wall the eastern gates are the greater bab salam through which the pilgrim enters the mosque next to it is the lesser bab salam with two small arches thirdly the bab in nabi where the prophet used to pass through from khadijah's house and lastly near the southeast corner the bab ali or of the banu hashim opening from the street between safa and marwa between the northeastern corner and the northern wall is the bab Dureba, a small entrance with one arch next to it almost fronting the kaaba and its grand adit bab ziyada also known as bab al nadwa here the colonnade projecting far beyond the normal line forms a small square or hall supported by pillars and a false colonnade of sixty-one columns leads to the true cloister of the mosque this portion of the building being cool and shady is crowded by the poor the diseased and the dying during divine worship and at other times by idlers schoolboys and merchants passing through the three external arches pilgrims descend by a flight of steps into the hall where they deposit their slippers it not being considered decorous to hold them when circumambulating the kaaba a broad pavement in the shape of an irregular triangle whose base is the cloister leads to the circuit of the house next to the ziada gate is a small single arched entrance bab qutubi and beyond it one similar the bab al ajla also named al basitiya from its proximity to the college of abd al basit close to the northwest angle of the cloister is the bab al nadwa anciently called bab al umra and now bab al atiq the old gate near this place and opening into the kaaba stood the town hall or dar al nadwa built by qusay for containing the oriflame al liwa and as a council chamber for the ancients of the city footnote many authorities place this building upon the site of the modern maqam hanafi and a footnote in the western wall are three entrances the single arched gate nearest to the north angle is called bab banu sahm or bab al umra because pilgrims pass through it to the tanaim and to the ceremony al umra little pilgrimage in the centre of the wall is the bab ibrahim or bab al khayyatin the tailor's gate a single arch leading into a large projecting square like that of the ziyada entrance but somewhat smaller near the southwest corner is a double arch adit the bab al wada or the farewell gate hence departing pilgrims issue forth from the temple at the western end of the southern hall is the two arched bab umhani so called after the lady's residence when it was included into the mosque next to it is a similar building bab ajlan which derives its name from a large college madrasa ajlan some call it bab sharif because it is opposite to one of the palaces after which and also pierced with two arches is bab al-jihad 
some erroneously spell it bab al jihad or of war the gate leading to jabal al jihad the next is double arched and called the bab al mujahid or bab al rahma gate of mercy near opposite the kaaba and connected with the pavement by a raised line of stone is the bab al safa through which pilgrims now issue to perform the ceremony as say it is a small and unconspicuous erection next to it is the bab al baghla with two arches and close to the south-east angle of the mosque the bab yunus alias bab badan alias bab zed alias bab al ashara or gate of the ten because of a favourite within the first ten sahaba or the companions of the prophet most of these gates says burckhardt have high pointed arches but a few round arches are seen among them which like all arches of its kind in al hijaz are nearly semicircular they are without ornament except the inscription on the exterior which commemorates the name of the builder and they are all posterior in date to the fourteenth century as each gate consists of two or three arches or divisions separated by narrow walls these divisions are counted in the enumeration of the gates leading into the kaaba and they make up the number thirty-nine there being no doors to the gates the mosque is consequently open at all times i have crossed at every hour of the night and have always found people there either at prayers or walking about footnote the Makkans love to boast that no hour of the day or night is the kaaba ever seen without a devotee performing a tawaf End of footnote. the outside walls of the mosque are those of the houses which surround it on all sides these houses belonged originally to the mosque the greater part are now the property of individuals they are let out to the richest hajis at very high prices as much as five hundred piastres being given during the pilgrimage for a good apartment with a window opening into the mosque footnote this would be about fifty dollars whereas twenty-five is a fair sum for a single apartment like english lodging housekeepers the meccans make the season pay for the year in burckhardt's time the colonnato was worth from nine to twelve piastres the value of the latter coin is now greatly decreased for twenty-eight go to the spanish dollars all over al hijaz and a footnote windows have in consequence been opened in many parts of the walls on level with the street and above that of the floor of the colonnades hajis living in these apartments are allowed to perform the friday prayers at home because having the kaaba in view from the windows they are supposed to be in the mosque itself and to join in prayer those assembled within the temple upon a level with the ground floor of the colonnades and opening into them are small apartments formed in the walls having the appearance of dungeons these have remained the property of the mosque while the house above them belonged to private individuals they are let out to watermen who deposit in the zamzam jars or to less opulent hajis who wish to live in the mosque footnote i entered one of these caves and never experienced such a sense of suffocation even in that favourite spot for brighters to asphyxiate themselves the baths of nero End of footnote some of the surrounding houses still belong to the mosque and were originally intended for public schools as their names of madretas implies they are now let out to hajis the exterior of the mosque is adorned with seven minarets irregularly distributed one minaret bab al umra two minaret bab al salam three minaret bab ali four minaret bab al wada five minaret madrasat kait bay six Minaret Bab Ziyadi, seven. Minaret Madrasat Sultan Suleiman. Footnote: The magnificent son of Salim the First, who built Al Madina, the minaret bearing his name. The minarets at Mecca are far inferior to those of her rival, and their bands of gaudy colours give them an appearance of tawdry vulgarity. And a footnote: They are quadrangle or round steeples, in no way differing from other minarets the entrance to them is from the different buildings around the mosque which they adjoin footnote two minarets namely those of the bab al salam and the bab al safa are separated from the mosque by private dwelling-houses a plan neither common nor regular and a footnote a beautiful view of the busy crowd below is attained by ascending the most northern one footnote a stranger must be careful how he appears at a minaret window unless he would have a bullet whizzing past his head 
Arabs are especially jealous of being overlooked, and have no fellow feeling for votaries of beautiful views. For this reason here, as in Egypt, a blind muezzin is preferred, and many ridiculous stories are told about men who for years have counterfeited society to live in idleness. End of footnote. Having described at length the establishment attached to the mosque of al-Medina, I spare my readers detailed account of the crowd of idlers that hang about the Meccan temple. The Naib al-Haram, or vice-intendant, is one Sayyid Ali, said to be of Indian extraction. He is a superior to all the attendants. There are about eighty eunuchs, whose chief, Sarur Agha, was a slave of Muhammad Ali Pasha. Their pay varies from one hundred to one thousand piastres per mensem. It is, however, inferior to the Medina salaries. The Imam, Muazzins, Khatib, Zamzamis, etc., etc., are under their respective sheikhs, who are ulama. Footnote. I have illustrated this chapter, which otherwise might be unintelligible to many, by a plan of the Kaaba, taken from Ali Bey al-Abbasi, which Burkhardt pronounced to be perfectly correct. This author has not been duly appreciated. In the first place, his disguise was against him, and secondly, he was a spy of the French government. According to Mr. Banks, who had access to the original papers at Constantinople, Ali Bey was a Catalonian named Badia, and was suspected to have been of jewish extraction he claimed for napoleon a reward for his services returned to the east and died it is supposed of poisoning in the hauran near damascus in the edition which i have consulted paris eighteen fourteen the author labours to persuade the world by marking the days with their planetary signs etc etc that he is a real oriental but he perpetually betrays himself some years ago accurate plans of the two harems were made by order of the present sultan they were doubtless to be found amongst the archives at constantinople End of footnote. briefly to relate the history of the kaaba the house of allah is supposed to have been built and rebuilt ten times one the first origin of the idea is manifestly as a symbolical allusion to the angels standing before the almighty and praising his name when Allah, it is said, informed the celestial throng that he was about to send a vice-regent on earth, they deprecated the design. Being reproved with these words, God knoweth what ye know not, and dreading the eternal anger, they compassed the arsh, or throne, in adoration. Upon this Allah created the Bayt al-Ma'mur, four jasper pillars with a ruby roof, and the angels circumambulated it, crying, Praise to Allah, and exalted be Allah, and there is no Allah but Allah, and Allah is omnipotent. The Creator then ordered them to build a similar house for man on earth. This, according to Ali, took place forty, according to Abu Huraira, two thousand years before the creation. Both authorities, however, are agreed that the firmaments were spread above and the seven earths beneath this Bayt al-Ma'mur. There is a considerable contradiction concerning the second house. Ka'ab related that Allah sent down with Adam a khayma, or a tabernacle of hollow ruby, which the angels raised on stone pillars. Footnote. It must be remembered that the Muslims, like many of the Jews, hold that paradise was not on earth, but in the lowest firmament, which is, as it were, a reflection of earth. End of footnote. This was also called Bayt al-Ma'mur, adam received an order to come pass it about after which he begged a reward for obedience and was promised a pardon to himself and to all his progeny who repent others declare that adam expelled from paradise and lamenting that he no longer heard the prayers of the angels was ordered by allah to take the stones of the five hills lebanon sinai turzait or olivet ararat and hira which afforded the first stone gabriel smiting his wing upon earth opened a foundation to the seventh layer and the position of the building is exactly below the heavenly bayt al mamur a muslim corruption of the legends concerning the heavenly and the earthly jerusalem our first father circumambulated it as he had seen the angels do and was by them taught the formula of prayer and the number of circuits According to others, again, this second house was not erected till after the angelic foundation was destroyed by time. 3. The history of the third house is also somewhat confused. 
when the Beit al-Ma'mur, or as they say, the tabernacle was removed to heaven after Adam's death, a stone and mud building was placed in its stead by his son Shays, or Seth. For this reason it is respected by the Sabaeans, or the Christians of St. John, as well as by the Muslims. This Kaaba, according to some, was destroyed by the deluge, which materially altered its site. Others believe that it has raised to heaven. Others, again, declare that only the pillars supporting the heavenly tabernacle were allowed to remain. Most authorities agree in asserting that the black stone was stored up in Abu Qubais, whence the first created of mountains is called al Amin, or the Honest. 4. Abraham and his son were ordered to build the fourth house upon the old foundations. Its materials, according to some, were taken from the five hills which supplied the second. Others give the names Uhud, Quds, Warqa, Sinai, Hira, and a sixth Abu Qubais. It was of irregular shape, thirty-two cubits from the eastern to the northern corner, thirty-two from the north to the west, thirty-one from west to south, twenty from south to east, and only nine cubits high. There was no roof. Two doors level with the ground were pierced in the eastern and western walls, and inside, on the right hand, near the present entrance, a hole for treasure was dug. Gabriel restored the black stone, which Abraham, by his direction, placed in its present corner, as a sign where circumambulation is to begin, and the patriarch then learned all the complicated rites of pilgrimage. When this house was completed, Abraham, by Allah's orders, ascended Jabal Sabir, and called the world to visit the sanctified spot, and all earth's sons heard him, even those in their father's loins or in their mother's womb, from that day unto the day of resurrection. 5. The Amalika descended from Imlik, the great son of Sam, the son of Noah, who first settled near Mecca, founded the fifth house. At tabari and the Muslim historians generally made the erection of the Amalika to precede that of the Jerham. These, according to others, repaired the house which Abraham built. 6. The sixth Kaaba was built about the beginning of the Christian era by the Banu Jirham, the children of Kahtan, fifth descendant from Noah. According to the Muslims, Ismail married a daughter of this tribe, Da'ala bint Muzaz bin Umar, and abandoning Hebrew, he began to speak Arabic, Ta'arab. Hence, his descendants are called Arabicized Arabs. After Ismail's death, which happened when he was a hundred and thirty years old, Thabit, the eldest of his twelve sons, became the lord of the house. He was succeeded by his maternal grandfather, Muzaz, and afterwards by his children. The Jurham inhabited the higher parts of Mecca, especially Jabal Qaqa'an, so called from their clashing arms, whereas the Amalika dwelt in the lower grounds, which obtained the name of Ajiyad, from their generous horses. 7. Qusay bin Kilab, governor of Mecca and fifth forefather of the Prophet, built the seventh house, according to Abraham's plan. He roofed it over with palm leaves, stocked it with idols, and persuaded his tribe to settle near the harem. 8. Qusay's house was burnt down by a woman's censer, which accidentally set fire to the kiswa or covering, and the walls were destroyed by a torrent. A merchant ship belonging to a Greek trader called Bakum being wrecked at Jeddah, afforded material for the roof, and the crew were employed as masons. The Quraysh tribe, who rebuilt the house, failing in funds of pure money, curtailed its proportions by nearly seven cubits, and called the omitted portion al-Hatim. In digging the foundation, they came to a green stone, like a camel's hunch, which, struck with a pickaxe, sent forth a blinding light and prevented further excavation, the Quraysh, amongst other alterations, raised the walls from nine to eighteen cubits, built a staircase and a northern breadth, closed the western door, and placed the eastern entrance above the ground to prevent men entering without their leave. When the eighth house was being built, Muhammad was in his twenty-fifth year. His surname of Al-Amin, the Honest, probably induced the tribes to take him, to make him their umpire for the decision of a dispute about the position of the black stone, and who should have the honor of raising it to its place. Footnote. Others derive the surname from this decision. End of footnote. 
he decided for the corner chosen by abraham and distributed the privilege amongst the clans the banu zahra and banu abd manaf took the front wall and the door the banu jama and the banu saham was allotted the black wall the banu maghzum and their Qurayshi relations stood at the southern wall and at the stone corner were posted the banu abd dar banu as'ad and banu ada nine abdullah ibn zubayr nephew of aisha rebuilt the kaaba in a h sixty four it had been weakened by fire which burnt the covering besides splitting the black stone into three pieces and by the manjaniq or the catapults of hussein bin numayr general of yazid who obstinately besieged mecca till he heard of his sovereign's death abdullah hoping to fulfil a prophecy and seeing that the people of mecca fled in alarm pulled down the building by means of his thin carved abyssinian slaves footnote as will afterwards be mentioned almost every meccan knows the prophecy of mohammed that the birthplace of his faith will be destroyed by an army from abyssinia such things bring their own fulfilment and a footnote when they came to abraham's foundation he saw that it included al hijr which part the quraysh had been unable to build the building was made of cut stone and fine lime brought from al yemen abdullah taking in the hatim lengthened the building by seven cubits and added to its former height nine cubits thus making a total of twenty-seven he roofed over the whole or part reopened the western door to serve as an exit and followed the advice of his aunt who quoted the prophet's words he supported the interior with a single row of three columns instead of double row of six placed there by the quraysh finally he paved the mataf or the circuit ten cubits round with the remaining slabs and increased the haram by taking in the nearer houses during the building a curtain was stretched around the walls and the pilgrims compassed them externally when it finished it was perfumed inside and outside and invested with brocade then abdullah and all the citizens went forth in a procession to the tanaim a reverend place near mecca returned to perform umrah or the lesser pilgrimage slew a hundred victims and rejoiced with great festivities the caliph abd al malik bin marwan besieged abdullah bin zubayr who after a brave defence was slain in a h seventy four al hajjaj bin yusuf the general of abd al malik's troops wrote to the prince informing him that abdullah had made unauthorized additions to and changes in the harem the reply brought in order to rebuild the house al hajjaj again excluded the hatim and retired the northern wall six cubits and a span making it twenty-five cubits long by twenty-four broad the other three sides were allowed to remain as built by the son of zubayr he gave the house a double roof closed the western door and raised the eastern four cubits and a span above the mataf or circuit which he paved over the harem was enlarged and beautified by the abbasids especially by al mahdi al mu'tamid and al mutazid some authors reckon as an eleventh house the repairs made by sultan murad khan on the ninth of tuesday twentieth of shaban a h one thousand and thirty a violent torrent swept the harem it rose one cubit above the threshold of the kaaba carried away the lamp-post and the maqam ibrahim all the northern wall of the house half of the eastern and one-third of the western side it subsided on wednesday night the repairs were not finished until a h the thousand and forty the greater part however of the building dates from the time of al-hajjaj and muslims who never mention his name without a curse knowingly circumambulate his work the ulama indeed have insisted upon its remaining untouched lest kings in wantonness should change its form harun al-rashid desired to rebuild it but was forbidden by the imam malik the present proofs of the kaaba sanctity as adduced by the learned are puerile enough but curious the ulama have made much of the verselet verily the first house built for mankind to worship in is that in becca or mecca blessed and a salvation to the three worlds therein are manifest signs the standing place of abraham which whoso enter shall be saved quran chapter three the word therein is interpreted to mean mecca and the manifest signs the kaaba which contains such marvels as the footprints of an abraham's platform and the spiritual safeguard of all who enter the sanctuary footnote 
Mecca, our Mecca, is the common word. Bekka is a synonym never used but in books. The former means a concourse of people. But why derive it from the Hebrew and translate it as slaughter? Is this a likely name for a holy place? Dr. Colenso actually turns the Makaraba of Ptolemy into the Mecca Rabah, plentiful slaughter. But if Makaraba be Mecca, it is evident of corruption of Mecca and Araba, the Arab race. Again, supposing the Meccan temple to be originally dedicated to the sun, why should the pure Arab, Baal, become Hebraized Hobal, and the deity being the only one in the hundred and sixty that formed the pantheon? End of footnote. The other signs, historical, psychical, and physical, are briefly these. The preservation of the Hajar al-Aswad and the Maqam Ibrahim from many foes, and the miracles put forth, as in the war of the elephant to defend the house. The violent and terrible deaths of the sacrilegious, and the fact that in the deluge the large fish did not eat the little fish in the harem. A wonderful desire and love impel men from distant regions to visit the holy spot, and the first sight of the Kaaba causes awe and fear, horripilation and tears. Furthermore, ravenous beasts will not destroy their prey in the sanctuary land, and the pigeons and other birds never perch upon the house except to be cured of sickness from fear of defiling the roof. The Kaaba, though small, can contain any number of devotees. No one is ever hurt, and invalids recover their health by rubbing themselves against the kiswa and the black stone. Footnote this is an audacious falsehood the kaaba is scarcely ever opened without some accident happening and a footnote finally it is observed that every day a hundred thousand mercies descend upon the house and especially that if rain come up from the northern corner there is plenty in iraq if from the south there is plenty in yemen if from the east there is plenty in india if from the west there is plenty in syria and if from all four angles general plenty is presignified end of appendix two chapter forty six of pilgrimage to al madina and mecca this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Chapter 46 of Personal Narrative of a Pilgrimage to al Madina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. Appendix 3. This document is written upon slips of paper pasted together four feet five inches long by about six and a half inches broad and contains altogether 71 lines below the triangle. The divisions are in red ink. It rolls up and fits into a cylinder of tin, to which are attached small silk cords to sling it over the shoulder when travelling or on pilgrimage. Specimen of a Murshid's diploma in the Qadri order of the mystic craft at the Sawuf. This is the tree whose root is firm, and whose branches are spreading, and whose shade is perpetual and the bearer is a good man we beg of allah to grant him purity of intention by the power of him upon whom revelation descended and inspiration i have passed it on and i the poorest of men and the servant of the poor am sayyid a the names are here omitted for obvious reasons son of sayyid b the qadri the servant of the prayer rug of his grandsire of the sheikh abdul qadir jilani allah sanctify his honoured tomb amen there is no god but allah sheikh abdul qadir a thing to allah facsimile of the seal of great abdul qadir this upon the document is a sign that the owner has become a master in the craft Sayyid A, son of Sayyid B of C. This is the living Sheikh's seal, and is the only one applied to the apprentice's diploma. And of him, in the name of Allah the Merciful, the Compassionate, we beg aid. 
praise be to allah opener of the locks of hearts with his name and withdrawer of the veils of hidden things with his beneficence and raiser of the flags of increase to those who persevere in thanking him i praise him because that he hath made us of the people of unity and i thank him being desirous of his benefits and i bless and salute our lord muhammad the best of his prophets and of his servants and i bless and salute his muhammad's family and companions the excelling in dignity for the increase of their dignity and its augmentation but afterwards thus saith the needy slave who confesseth his sins and his weakness and his faults and hopeth for the pardon of his lord the almighty sayyid a the qadri son of sayyid b the qadri son of sayyid abu bakr the qadri son of sayyid ismail the qadri son of sayyid abdul wahhab the qadri son of sayyid nur din the qadri son of sayyid darwaish the qadri son of sayyid hussam din the qadri son of sayyid nur din the qadri son of sayyid walid din the qadri son of sayyid zain din the qadri son of sayyid sharaf din the qadri son of sayyid shams din the qadri son of sayyid muhammad al hattak the son of sayyid abdul aziz son of the sayyid of sayyids polar star of existence the white pearl the lord of the reigns of worldly possession the chief of allah's friends the incomparable imam the essence of negativing accidents the polar star of polar stars or prince of princes a particular degree in tasawwuf the greatest assistance note Ghaus assistance also means a person who in tasawwuf has arrived at the highest point to which fervor of devotion leads End note, the uniter of the lover and the beloved note the human soul and its supreme source End note, the sayyid prince the sheikh teacher muhyiddin abdul qadir of jilan note for a short notice of this celebrated mystic see der below abdul qadir End note. Allah sanctify his honoured sepulchre, and Allah enlighten his place of rest. Son of Abu Salih Musa Jangidost, son of Sayyid Abdullah al Jaili, son of Sayyid Yahya Zahid, son of Sayyid Muhammad, son of Sayyid Daud, son of Sayyid Musa, son of Sayyid Abdullah son of sayyid musa al juni son of sayyid abdullah al mahs son of sayyid hassan al musanna note hassan the second from whom sprung the sharifs of al hijaz End note. son of the imam hassan son of the imam and the amir of true believers ali the son of abu talib may allah be satisfied with him son of abdul muttalib note father to abdullah father of muhammad end note son of hashim son of abdul manaf son of qusay son of kilab son of murat son of kaab son of louis son of ghalib son of fir quraish son of malik son of nazr son of kanana son of khuzayma son of mudrika son of ilyas son of muzar son of nizar son of adnan note dated by m c de percival about a hundred and thirty years b c end note son of adda son of udad son of mahmisa son of hamel son of nayyit son of kuzar son of ismail son of ibrahim son of karikh son of kasir son of arwa son of falig son of shalikh son of Kainan, son of arfakshad son of sam son of noah son of shais son of adam the father of mankind thus between adnan and adam we have eighteen generations al wakiri and at tobari give forty between adnan and ishmael which ibn khaldun confirmed by m c de percival thinks is too small a number 
the text however expresses the popular estimate but it must be remembered that the prophet used to say beyond adnan none but allah knoweth and the genealogists lie with whom be peace and upon our prophet the best of blessings and salutation and adam was of dust and dust is of the earth and earth is of foam and foam is of the wave and the wave is of water note muslims cleaving to the neptunian theory of earthly origin End note. and water is of the rainy firmament and the rainy firmament is of power and power is of will and will is of the omniscience of the glorious god but afterwards that good man the approaching to his lord the averse to all besides him the desirous of the abodes of futurity the hoper for mercy the darwaish abdullah your humble servant gentle reader end note son of the pilgrim joseph the afghan henceforward let him be known by the name of darwaish king in the name of allah hath come to us and visited us and begged of us instruction in the saying of unity i therefore taught him the saying which i learned by ordinance from my sheikh and my instructor and my personal uncle the sayyid the sheikh abdul qadr note the former genealogy proved my master to be what is technically called khalifa jaddi or hereditary in his dignity the following table shows that he is also khulfai adopted to succeed and gives the name and the descent of the holy man who adopted him the qadri son of the sayyid the sheikh abu bakr the qadri son of the sayyid the sheikh ismail the qadri son of the sayyid the sheikh abdul wahab the qadri son of the sayyid the sheikh nur din the qadri son of the sayyid the sheikh shahr darwaish the qadri son of the sayyid the sheikh Husamuddin the Qadri, son of the Sayyid the Sheikh Nuruddin the Qadri, from his sire and Sheikh Waliuddin the Qadri, from his sire and Sheikh Zainuddin the Qadri, from his sire and Sheikh Sharafiluddin the Qadri, from his sire and Sheikh Muhammad al Hattak the Qadri, from his sire and Sheikh Abdul Aziz. Allah sanctify his honoured sepulchre, and Allah enlighten his place of rest from his sire and sheikh sayyid the polar star of existence the white pearl the polar star of holy men the director of those that tread the path the sayyid the sheikh muhyiddin abdul qahir of jilan allah sanctify his honoured sepulchre and allah enlighten his place of rest amen from his sheikh the sheikh abu sa'id al mubarak al makhzumi from the sheikh the sheikh abu hassan al hankari from his sheikh the sheikh abu faras at tartusi from his sheikh the sheikh abdul wahid at tamimi from his sheikh the sheikh abu qasim al junaid of baghdad from his sheikh the sheikh asir sakati from his sheikh the sheikh al ma'aruf al karhi from his sheikh the sheikh daoud at tay from his sheikh the sheikh habib al ajami from his sheikh the sheikh al hassan of basra from his sheikh the prince of true believers ali son of abu talib allah be satisfied with him and allah honor his countenance from the prophet of allah upon whom may allah have mercy from jibril from the omnipotent the glorious and afterwards we taught him that is that good man abdullah the saying of unity and ordered its recital one hundred sixty five times after each fariza note each obligatory prayer is called a fariza the sheikh therefore directs the saying of unity that is la ilaha illallah to be repeated eight hundred and twenty five times per diem and on all occasions according to his capability and allah have mercy upon our lord muhammad and upon his family and upon his companions one and all and praise be to allah lord of the three worlds it is finished there is no god but allah number note 
that is, of repetitions after each obligatory prayer, end note, 165. End of chapter 46. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Recorded in London, England. Appendix 4, Part 1 of Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barty Begley. Appendix 4, Part 1 of Personal Narrative of a Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. Appendix 4 the Navigation and Voyages of Ludovicus Vertomaus, Gentleman of Rome, A.D. 1503. The first of the pilgrims to Mecca and Al-Medina, who has left an authentic account of the holy cities, is Louis Vertomanus, Ludovico Bartema, Gentleman of the City of Rome. Footnote. I have consulted the Navigation and Voyages of Louis Vertomanus to the regions of Arabia, Egypt, Persia, Syria, Ethiopia, and East India, both within and without the river of Ganges, etc., containing many notable and strange things, both historical and natural, translated out of Latin into English by Richard Eden, in the year of our Lord, 1576, Hakluyt's Voyages, Volume 4. The curious reader will also find the work in Purchase, Pilgrims and Pilgrimage, Volume 2, and Ramusio, Raccolta della Navigazione e Viaggi, Toma 1. The Travels of Bartema were first published at Milan, A.D. 1511, and the first English translation appeared in Wills and Eden's Decades, four tomes, A.D. 1555. End of footnote. If any man, says this author, shall demand of me the cause of this my voyage, certainly I can show no better reason than is the ardent desire of knowledge, which hath moved many other to see the world and the miracles of God therein. In the year of our Lord, 1503, he departed from Venice with prosperous winds arrived at Alexandria and visited Babylon of Egypt, Berinto, Tripoli, Antioch and Damascus. He started from the latter place on the 8th of April, 1503, in familiarity and friendship with a certain Captain Mameluke, which term he applies to all such Christians as have forsaken their faith to serve the Mahometans and Turks, and in the garb of a Mameluki renegado. He estimates the Damascus caravan to consist of 40,000 men and 35,000 camels, nearly six times its present number. Footnote. The number of pilgrims in this caravan is still grossly exaggerated. I cannot believe that it contains more than 7,000 of both sexes and all ages. End of footnote. On the way, they were enforced to conflict with a great multitude of the Arabians. But the threescore Mamluks composing their escort were more than a match for 50,000 Bedouin. On one occasion, the caravan, attacked by 24,000 Arabians, slew 1,500 of the enemies, losing in the conflict only a man and a woman. Footnote. This may confirm Strabo's account of Aelius Gallus' loss after a conflict with a host of Arabs, two Roman soldiers. Monsignor Jomar, noticing the case, pleasantly remarks that the two individuals in question are to be pitied for their extreme ill look. End of footnote. This marvel, which is probably not without some exaggeration, he explains by the strength and valiance of the Mamluks, by the practice still popular of using the camels in the state of a bulwark and placing the merchants in the midst of the army, that is, in the midst of the camels, while the pilgrims fought manfully on every side, and, finally, by the circumstance that the Arabs were unarmed and wear only a thin loose vesture and are beside almost naked, their horses also being ill-furnished and without saddles or other furniture. The Hijazi Badui of this day are a much more dangerous enemy. The matchlock and musket have made him so, and the only means of crippling him is to prevent the importation of firearms and lead, and by slow degrees to disarm the population. After performing the ceremonies of pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca, he escaped to Zida or Jida, Jeddah, despite the trumpeter of the caravana giving warning to all the Mamluks to make ready their horses to direct their journey towards Syria with proclamation of death to all that should refuse to do so and embarked for Persia upon the Red Sea. He touched at certain ports of Al-Yaman, and got into trouble at Aden, where the Mahometans took him, and put shackles on his legs, which came by occasion of a certain idolater, who cried after him, saying, O Christian dog, born of dogs! Footnote. 
This venerable form of abuse still survives the lapse of time. One of the first salutations reaching the ears of the overlands at Alexandria is some little boys, Ya Nazrani, Kalbawani, etc., etc., O Nazarene, O dog obscene, etc., etc. In Percy's Reliques, we read of the knight calling his Muslim opponent unchristian hound, a retort courteous to the Christian hound previously applied to him by the pagan. End of footnote. The lieutenant of the sultan assembled his council, consulted them about putting the traveller to death as a spy of Portugales, and threw him ironed into a dungeon. On being carried shackled into the presence of the sultan, Bartema said that he was a Roman, professed a Mameluk in Babylon of al -Kair. But when told to utter the formula of the Muslim faith, he held his tongue, either that it pleased not God, or that for fear and scruple of conscience he durst not. For which offence he was again deprived of ye fruition of heaven. But, happily for Bartema, in those days the women of Arabia were greatly in love with white men. Before escaping from Mecca, he lay hid in the house of a Mohammedan, and could not express his gratitude for the good wife's care. Also, he says, this furthered my good entertainment, that there was in the house a fair young maid, the niece of the Mohammedan, who was greatly in love with me. At Aden he was equally fortunate. One of the sultan's three wives, on the departure of her lord and master, bestowed her heart upon the traveller. She was very fair and comely after their manner, and of colour inclining to black. She would spend the whole day in beholding Bartema, who wandered about simulating madness. Footnote. For a full account of the mania fit, I must refer the curious reader to the original. Book 2, Chapter 5. The only mistake the traveller seems to have committed was that, by his ignorance of the rules of ablution, he made men agree that he was no saint but a madman. End of footnote. And, in the mean season, diverse times, sent him secretly much good meat by her maidens. He seems to have played his part to some purpose under the colour of madness, converting a great fat sheep to Mohammedanism, killing an ass because he refused to be a proselyte, and finally he handled a Jew so ill that he had almost killed him. After sundry adventures and a trip to Sana'a, he started for Persia with the Indian fleet, in which, by means of fair promises, he had made friendship with a certain captain. He visited Zela and Berbera in the Somali country, and at last reached Hormuz. The third book entreateth of Persia, the fourth of India and of the cities and other notable things seen there. The eighth book contains the Voyage of India, in which he includes Pegu, Sumatra, Borneo and Java, where, abhorring the beastly manners of a cannibal population, he made but a short stay. Returning to Calicut, he used great subtility, escaped to the Portugales, and was well received by the Viceroy. After describing in his seventh book the voyage or navigation of Ethiopia, Melinda, Mombasa, Mozambique, Mozambique, and Zafala, Sofala, he passed the cape called Caput Bona Spei and repaired to the goodly city of Luxburn, Lisbon, where he had the honour of kissing hands. The king confirmed with his great seal the letters patentes, whereby his lieutenant, the viceroy of India, had given the pilgrim the order of knighthood. And thus, says Bartema by way of conclusion, departing from thence with the king's passport and safe conduct, at the length after these my long and great travails and dangers, I came to my long desired native country, the city of Rome, by the grace of God, to whom be all honour and glory. This old traveller's pages abound with the information to be collected in a fresh field by an unscrupulous and hard-headed observer. They are, of course, disfigured with a little romancing. His Jews at Cabor near al Medina were five or six spans long, at Mecca he saw two unicorns, the younger at the age of one year and like a young colt. The horn of this is the length of four handfuls. Footnote. He proceeds, however, to say that the head is like a heart's, the legs thin and slender, like a fawn or hide, the hoofs divided much like the feet of a goat, that they were sent from Ethiopia, the Somali country, and were showed to the people for a miracle. They might therefore possibly have been African antelopes, which a lucis naturae had deprived of their second horn, but the suspicion of fable remains. End of footnote. And so credulous is he about anthropophagy, that he relates of Mohammed, son to the Sultan of Sana'a, how he, by a certain natural tyranny and madness, delighteth to eat men's flesh, and therefore secretly killeth many to eat them. Footnote. This is a tale not unfamiliar to the Western world. 
Louis XI of France was supposed to drink the blood of babes pour rajeunir sa veine épuisée. The reasons in favour of such unnatural diet have been fully explained by the infamous Marquis de Sade. End of footnote. But all things well considered, Lodovico Bartema, for correctness of observation and readiness of wit, stands in the foremost rank of the old oriental travellers. I proceed to quote and to illustrate with notes the few chapters devoted in the first volume of this little-known work to Mecca and Al-Medina. Chapter 11 Of a Mountain Inhabited with Jews And of the city of Medina Tanabi, where Muhammad was buried. In the space of eight days we came to a mountain which containeth in circuit ten or twelve miles. This is inhabited with the Jews, to the number of five thousand or thereabout. They are of very little stature, as of the height of five or six spans, of some much less. They have small voices like women, and of black colour, yet some blacker than other. They feed of none other meat than goat's fleshes. Footnote this is to the present day a food confined to the Badawin. End of footnote. They are circumcised, and deny not themselves to be Jews. If by chance any Mahometan come into their hands, they flay him alive. At the foot of the mountain we found a certain hole, out of which flowed abundance of water. By finding this opportunity, we laded sixteen thousand camels which thing greatly offended the Jews. They wandered in that mountain, scattered like wild goats or prickets, yet durst they not come down, partly for fear, and partly for hatred against the Mahometans. Beneath the mountain are seen seven or eight thorn trees, very fair, and in them we found a pair of turtle doves, which seemed to us in manner a miracle, having before made so long journeys, and saw neither beast nor fowl. Then, proceeding two days' journey, we came to a certain city named Medina Thalnabi. Four miles from the said city we found a well. Here the caravana, that is, the whole herd of camels, rested. And remaining here one day, we washed ourselves, and changed our shirts, the more freshly to enter into the city. It is well peopled, and containeth about three hundred houses. The walls are like bulwarks of earth and the houses both of stone and brick. The soil about the city is utterly barren, except that about two miles from the city are seen about fifty palm trees that bear dates. Footnote. This alludes to the gardens of Cuba. The number of date trees is now greatly increased. See chapter 19. End of footnote. There, by a certain garden, runneth a course of water falling into a lower plain, where also passengers are accustomed to water their camels. Footnote. The Ain al Zarka, flowing from the direction of Cuba. Chapter 18. End of footnote. And here opportunity now serveth to confute the opinion of them which think that the ark or tomb of wicked Mahomet to hang in the air, not born up with anything, as touching which thing, I am utterly of another opinion, and affirm this neither to be true, nor to have any likeness of truth, as I presently beheld these things, and saw the place where Mahomet is buried, in the said city of Medina Tel Nabi. For we tarried there three days, to come to the true knowledge of all these things. When we were desirous to enter into their temple, which they call Meshita, footnote, Masjid, a mosque, End of footnote. and all other churches by the same name, we could not be suffered to enter without a companion little or great. They, taking us by the hand, brought us to the place where they say Mahomet is buried. Chapter 12 Of the Temple or Chapel and Sepulchre of Mahomet, and of his fellows. His temple is vaulted, and is a hundred paces in length, fourscore in breadth. The entry into it is by two gates. From the sides it is covered with three vaults. It is borne up with four hundred columns or pillars of white brick. 
there are seen hanging lamps about the number of three thousand. From the other part of the temple in the first place of the Meshita is seen a tower of the circuit of five paces vaulted on every side and covered with a cloth or silk and is borne up with a grate of copper curiously wrought and distant from it two paces and of them that go thither is seen as it were through a lattice footnote nothing can to more correct than this part of bartima's description toward the left hand is the way to the tower and when you come thither you must enter by a narrower gate on every side of those gates or doors are seen many books in manner of a library on the one side twenty and on the other side twenty-five these contain the filthy traditions and life of mahomet and his fellows within the said gate is seen a sepulchre that is a digged place where they say mahomet is buried and his fellows which are these nabi bubakar othomar aumar and fatuma footnote nabi the prophet abu bakr osman omar and fatima it was never believed that osman was buried in the prophet's mosque this part of the description is utterly incorrect the tombs are within the tower above mentioned and bartima in his thirteenth chapter quoted below seems to be aware of the fact End of footnote. but mahomet was their chief captain and an arabian born halley was son-in-law to mahomet for he took to wife his daughter fatuma bubakar is he who they say was exalted to the dignity of a chief counsellor and great governor although he came not to the high degree of an apostle or prophet as did mahomet othomar and aumar were chief captains of the army of mahomet every of these have their proper books of facts and traditions and hereof proceedeth the great dissension and discord of religion and manners among this kind of filthy men while some confirm one doctrine and some another by reason of their diverse sects of patrons doctors and saints as they call them by this means they are marvellously divided among themselves and like beasts kill themselves for such quarrels of diverse opinions and all faults this also is the chief cause of war between the sophie of persia and the great turk being nevertheless both mahometans and live in mortal hatred one against the other for the maintenance of their sects saints and apostles while every of them thinketh their own to be best chapter thirteen of the sect of mahomet now will we speak of the manners and sect of mahomet understand therefore that in the highest part of the tower aforesaid is an open round place now shall you understand what craft they use to deceive our caravans the first evening that we came thither to see the sepulchre of mahomet our captain sent for the chief priest of the temple to come to him and when he came declared unto him that the only cause of his coming thither was to visit the sepulchre and body of nabi by which word is signified the prophet mahomet and that he understood that the price to be admitted to the sight of these mysteries should be four thousand seraphs of gold also that he had no parents neither brothers sisters kinfolks children or wives neither that he came thither to buy merchandise as spices or bacca or nardus or any manner of precious jewels but only for very zeal of religion and salutation of his soul and was therefore greatly desirous to see the body of the prophet to whom the priest of the temple they called them side with countenance like one that were distraught footnote the request was an unconscionable one and the chief priest knew that the body being enclosed within four walls could not be seen End of footnote. made answer in this manner darest thou with those eyes with the which thou hast committed so many horrible sins desire to see him by whose sight god hath created heaven and earth to whom again our captain answered thus my lord you have said truly nevertheless i pray you that i may find so much favour with you that i may see the prophet whom when i have seen i will immediately thrust out mine eyes the side answered o prince i will open all things unto thee so it is that no man can deny but that our prophet died here who 
if he would, might have died at Mecca, but to show in himself a token of humility, and thereby to give us example to follow him, was willing rather here than elsewhere to depart out of this world, and was incontinent of angels born into heaven, and there received as equal with them. Then our captain said to him, Where is Jesus Christus, the son of Marie? To whom the side answered, At the feet of Mohammed. Footnote. This is incorrect. Hazrat Isa, after his second coming, will be buried in the prophet's Hujra, but no Muslim ever believed that the founder of Christianity left his corpse in this world. See chapter 16. End of footnote. Then said our captain again, It sufficeth, it sufficeth, I will know no more. After this, our captain coming out of the temple and turning to us said, See, I pray you, for what goodly stuff I would have paid three thousand seraphs of gold. The same day at evening, at almost three o'clock of the night, ten or twelve of the elders of the sect of Mahomet entered into our caravan, which remained not past a stone cast from the gate of the city. Footnote. Most probably in the Bar al Manaka, where the Damascus caravan still pitches tents. End of footnote. These ran hither and thither, crying like madmen, with these words, Mohammed, the messenger and apostle of God, shall rise again. O prophet, O God, Mohammed shall rise again. Have mercy on us, God. Our captain and we, all raised with this cry, took weapon with all expedition, suspecting that the Arabians were come to rob our caravan. We asked what was the cause of that exclamation, and what they cried. For they cried as do the Christians, when suddenly any marvellous thing chanceth. The elders answered, Saw you not the lightning which shone out of the sepulchre of the prophet Muhammad? Footnote. This passage shows the antiquity of the still popular superstition which makes a light to proceed from the prophet's tomb. End of footnote. Our captain answered that he saw nothing, and we also, being demanded, answered in like manner. Then said one of the old men, Are you slaves? That is to say, bought men, meaning thereby Mamelukes. Then said our captain, We are indeed Mamelukes. Then again the old man said, You, my lords, cannot see heavenly things, as being neophyti, that is, newly come to the faith, and not yet confirmed in our religion. To this our captain answered again, O oh, you mad and insensate beasts! I had thought to have given you three thousand pieces of gold, but now, O oh, you dogs and progeny of dogs, I will give you nothing. It is therefore to be understood that none other shining came out of the sepulchre than a certain flame which the priests caused to come out of the open place of the tower. Footnote. It is unnecessary to suppose any deception of the kind. If only the Illuminati could see this light, the sight would necessarily be confined to a very small number. End of footnote. Spoken of here before, whereby they would have deceived us, and therefore our captain commanded that thereafter none of us should enter into the temple. Of this also we have most true experience, and most certainly assure you that there is neither iron or steel or the manganese stone that should so make the tomb of Muhammad to hang in the air, as some have falsely imagined. Neither is there any mountain nearer than four miles. We remained here three days to refresh our company. To this city, victuals and all kind of corn is brought from Arabia Felix and Babylon or Alcair, and also from Ethiop, by the Red Sea, which is from this city but four days' journey. Footnote. This account is correct. Kusair, Kasair, Suez and Jeddah still supply al Medina. End of footnote. Chapter 14. The Journey to Mecca Footnote. It is impossible to distinguish from this description the route taken by the Damascus caravan in A.D. 1503. Of one thing only we may be certain, namely, that between al Medina and Mecca there are no seas of sand. End of footnote. After we were satisfied, or rather wearied, with the filthiness and loathsomeness 
of the trumperies, deceits, trifles and hypocrisies of the religion of Mahomet, we determined to go forward on our journey, and that by guiding of a pilot who might direct our course with the mariner's box or compass, with also the card of the sea, even as is used in sailing on the sea. And thus, bending our journey to the west, we found a very fair well or fountain, from the which flowed great abundance of water. The inhabitants affirm that St. Mark the Evangelist was the author of this fountain, by a miracle of God, when that region was in manner burned with incredible dryness. Footnote. The name of St. Mark is utterly unknown in Al-Hijaz. Probably the origin of the fountain described in the text was a theory that sprang from the brains of the Christian Mamluks. End of footnote. Here we and our beasts were satisfied with drink. I may not here omit to speak of the sea of sand and of the dangers thereof. This was found of us before we came to the mountain of the Jews. In this sea of sand we travelled the journey of three days and nights. This is a great broad plain, all covered with white sand, in manner as small as flour. If by evil fortune it so chanced that any travel that way southward, if in the meantime the wind come to the north, they are overwhelmed with sand, that they scatter out of the way, and can scarcely see the one the other ten paces off. And therefore the inhabitants travelling this way are enclosed in cages of wood, born with camels, and live in them. Footnote. A fair description of the still favourite vehicles, the Shugduf, Takt Rawan, and the Shibria. It is almost needless to say that the use of the mariner's compass is unknown to the guides in Al-Hijaz. End of footnote. So passing the journey, guided by pilots with mariner's compass and card, even as on the sea, as we have said. In this journey, also many perish for thirst, and many for drinking too much when they find such good waters. In these sands is found momia, which is the flesh of such men as are drowned in these sands, and they are dried by the heat of the sun, so that those bodies are preserved from putrefaction by the dryness of the sand, and therefore that dry flesh is esteemed medicinable. Footnote. Wonderful tales are still told about this same momia, mummy. I was assured by an Arab physician that he had broken a fowl's leg and bound it tightly with a cloth containing man's dried flesh, which caused the bird to walk about with a sound shank on the second day. End of footnote. Albeit there is another kind of more precious momia, which is the dried and embalmed bodies of kings and princes, which of long time have been preserved dry without corruption. When the wind bloweth from the north-east, then the sand riseth, and is driven against a certain mountain, which is an arm of the Mount Sinai. Footnote. This is probably Jabal Warkan, on the Darb al-Sultani, or sea road to Mecca. For the Muslim tradition about its Sinaitic origin, see chapter 20. End of footnote. There we found certain pillars artificially wrought, which they call Yan Yuan. On the left hand of the said mountain, in the top or ridge thereof is a den, and the entry into it is by an iron gate. Some feign that in that place Mohammed lived in contemplation. Here we heard a certain horrible noise and cry, for passing the said mountain we were in so great danger that we thought never to have escaped. Departing therefore from the fountain, we continued our journey for the space of ten days, and twice in the way fought with fifty thousand Arabians, and so at the Lent came to the city of Mecca, where all things were troubled by reason of the wars between two brethren, contending which of them should possess the kingdom of Mecca. End of Appendix 4, Part 1Appendix 4 of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to Al-Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appendix 4 of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to Al-Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. The Navigation and Voyages of Ludovicus Vortomanus, Gentleman of Rome, A.D. 1503, Part 2. Chapter 15 of the form and situation of the city of Mecca and why the Mahometans resort thither. Now the time requireth to speak somewhat of the famous city of Mecca or Mecca, 
what it is how it is situate and by whom it is governed the city is very fair and well inhabited and containeth in round form six thousand houses as well builded as ours and some that cost three or four thousand pieces of gold it hath no walls about two furlongs from the city is a mount footnote this is probably jabal warqan on the derb sultani or sea road to mecca for the muslim tradition about its sinaitic origin see chapter twenty and a footnote where the way is cut out which leadeth to a plain beneath it is on every side fortified with mountains in the stead of walls or bulwarks and hath four entries the governor is a sultan and one of the four brethren of the progeny of mahomet and is subject to the sultan of babylon of whom we have spoken before his other three brethren be at continual war with him the eighteenth day of may we entered into the city by the north side then by a declining way we came into a plain on the south side are two mountains the one very near the other distant only by a little valley which is the way that leadeth to the gate of mecca on the east side is an open place between two mountains like into a valley footnote the saniyat kuda a pass opening upon the mecca plain here two towers are now erected and a footnote and is the way to the mountain where they sacrifice to the patriarchs abraham and isaac footnote an error the sacrifice is performed at Muna, not on arafat the mountain here alluded to and a footnote this mountain is from the city about ten or twelve miles and the height of three stones cast it is of stone and as hard as marble yet no marble footnote the material is a close grey granite and a footnote in the top of the mountain is a temple or mesquita made after their fashion and hath three ways to enter into it footnote the form of the building has now been changed and a footnote at the foot of the mountain are two cisterns which conserves water without corruption of these the one is reserved to minister water to the camels of the caravan of babylon or al Qair, and the other for them of damasco it is rain-water and is derived far off footnote the meccans have a tradition concerning it that it is derived from baghdad and a footnote but to return to speak of the city for as touching the manner of sacrifice which they use at the foot of the mountain we will speak hereafter entering therefore into the city we found there the caravana of memphis or babylon which prevented us eight days and came not the way that we came this caravana contained threescore and four thousand camels and a hundred mamluks to guide them and here ought you to consider that by the opinion of all men this city is greatly cursed of god as apparently by the great baroness thereof for it is destitute of all manners of fruits and corn footnote muslims who are disposed to be facetious on serious subjects often remark that it is a mystery why allah should have built his house in a spot so barren and desolate and a footnote it is scorched with dryness for lack of water and therefore the water is there grown to such a price that you cannot for twelve pence buy as much water as will satisfy your thirst for one day now therefore i will declare that what provision they have for victuals the most part is brought them from the city of babylon otherwise named memphis kairos or al Qair, a city of the river of nilus in egypt as we have said before and is brought by the red sea called mer erythrium from a certain port named gidda a distant from mecca forty miles footnote this is still correct suez supplies jidda with corn and other provisions and a footnote the rest of their provisions is brought from arabia felix that is the happy or blessed arabia so named for the fruitfulness thereof in respect of the other two arabies called petria and deserta that is stone and desert they have also much corn from ethiopia here we found marvellous number of strangers and peregrines or pilgrims of the which some came from syria some from persia and other from both the east indies that is to say both india within the river of ganges and also the other india without the same river i never saw in any place greater abundance and frequentation of people for as much as i could perceive by tarrying there the space of twenty days 
these people resort thither for diverse causes as some for merchandise some to observe their vow of pilgrimage and others to have pardon for their sins as touching the which we will speak more hereafter chapter seventeen of the pardons or indulgences of mecca now let us return to speak of the pardons of the pilgrims for which so many strange nations resort thither in the midst of the city is a temple in fashion like unto the colossus of rome the amphitheatrum i mean like unto a stage yet not of marbled or hewed stones but of burnt bricks for this temple like unto an amphitheatre hath fourscore and ten or an hundred gates and is vaulted footnote a prodigious exaggeration burckhardt enumerates twenty the principal gates are seventeen in number in the old building they were more numerous joseph pitt says it hath about forty doors to enter into it not so much i think for necessity as figure for in some places they are close by one another and a footnote the entrance is by a descent of twelve stairs or degrees in every part footnote bartima alludes probably to the babiziada in the northern enciente and a footnote in the church porch are sold only jewels and precious stones in the entry the gilded walls shine on every side with incomparable splendour in the lower part of the temple that is under the vaulted places is seen a marvellous multitude of men for there are five or six thousand men that sell none other thing than sweet ointments and especially a certain odoriferous and most sweet powder wherewith dead bodies are embalmed footnote i saw nothing of the kind though consistently in the haram at mecca and a footnote and hence all manner of sweet savours are carried in manner into the countries of all the mahometans it passeth all belief to think of the exceeding sweetness of these savours far surmounting the shops of the apothecaries the twenty-three day of may the pardons began to be granted in the temple and in what manner we will now declare the temple in the midst is open without any enclosing and in the midst also thereof is a turret of largeness of six passes in circuit footnote the kaaba is an oblong massive structure eighteen paces in length fourteen in breadth and from thirty-five to forty feet in height burckhardt volume one page two hundred forty eight my measurements concerning which more hereafter gave eighteen paces in breadth and twenty-two in length and a footnote and involued or hanged with cloth or tapestry of silk footnote in ancient times possibly it was silk now it is of silk and cotton mixed and a footnote and passeth not the height of a man they enter into the turret by a gate of silver and is on every side beset with vessels full of balm on the day of pentecost license is granted to all men to see these things the inhabitants affirm that balm or balsam to be part of the treasure of the sultan that is the lord of mecca at every vault of the turret is fastened a round circle of iron like the ring of a door Footnote these are the brazen rings which serve to fasten the lower edge of the kiswa or of the covering and a footnote on the twenty-two day of may a great multitude of people began early in the morning before day seven times to walk about the turret kissing every corner thereof oftentimes feeling and handling them from this turret about ten or twelve paces is on other turret like a chapel builded after a manner this hath three or four entries in the midst thereof is a well of three score and ten cubits deep the water of this well is infected with saltpetre or salt nitre footnote a true description of the water of the well zemzem and a footnote egypt men are thereunto appointed to draw water for all the people and when a multitude of people have seven times gone round about the first turret they come to this well and touching the mouth or the brim thereof they say be it in the honour of god god pardon me and forgive me my sins when these words are said they that draw the water pour three buckets of water on the heads of every one of them and stand near about the well and wash them all wet from head to foot although they be apparelled with silk 
then doting fools dream that they are clean from all their sins and their sins are forgiven them they say furthermore that the first turret whereof we have spoken was the first house that ever abraham builded and therefore while they are yet all wet of the said washing they go to the mountain where as we have said before they are accustomed to sacrifice to abraham Footnote. there is great confusion in this part of bartema's narrative on the ninth of the hijjah the pilgrims leave mount arafat on the tenth many hasten into mecca and enter the kaaba they then return to the valley of munna where their tents are pitched and they sacrifice the victims on the twelfth the tents are struck and the pilgrims re-enter mecca and a footnote and remaining there two days they make the said sacrifice to abraham at the foot of the mountain chapter eighteen the manner of sacrificing at mecca for as much as for the most part noble spirits are delighted with novelties of great and strange things therefore to satisfy their expectation i will describe their manner of sacrificing therefore when they intend to sacrifice some of them kill three sheep some four and ten so that the butchery sometimes so floweth with blood that in one sacrifice are slain about three thousand sheep they are slain at the rising of the sun and shortly after are distributed to the poor for god's sake for i saw there a great and confounded multitude of poor people as to the number of twenty thousand these make many and long ditches in the fields where they keep fire with camel's dung and roast or seethe the flesh that is given them and eat it even there i believe that these poor people came thither rather for hunger than for devotion which i think by this conjecture that great abundance of cucumbers are brought thither from arabia felix which they ate casting away the paranges without their houses or tabernacles where a multitude of the said poor people gather them even out of the mire and the sand and eat them and are so greedy of these paranges that they fight who may gather most footnote this well describes the wretched state of the poor takruri and other africans but it attributes them an unworthy motive i once asked a learned arab what induced the wretches to rush upon destruction as they do when the faith renders pilgrimage obligatory only upon those who can afford necessaries for the way by allah he replied there is fire within their hearts which can be quenched only at god's house and at his prophet's tomb and a footnote the day following footnote bartema alludes to the day of arafat ninth of the hijjah which precedes not follows the day of sacrifice and a footnote their qadi which are in place with them as with us the preachers of god's word ascended into a high mountain to preach to the people that remaineth beneath and preach to them in their language the space of an hour the sum of the sermon was that with tears they should bewail their sins and beat their breast with sighs and lamentation and for the preacher himself with loud voice spake these words o abraham beloved of god o isaac chosen of god and his friend pray to god for the people of nebi when these words were said suddenly we heard lamenting voices when the sermon was done a rumour was spread that a great army of arabians to the number of twenty thousand were coming with which news that they kept the caravans being greatly feared with all speed like madmen fled into the city of mecca and we again bearing a news of the arabians approach fled also into the cities but while we were in the midway between the mountain and mecca we came by a despicable wall of the breadth of four cubits the people passing this wall had covered the way with stones and cause whereof they say to be this when abraham was commanded to sacrifice his son he willed his son isaac to follow him to the place where he should execute the commandment of god as isaac went to follow his father there appeared to him in the way a devil in likeness of a fair and friendly person not far from the said wall and asked him friendly whether he went isaac answered that he went to his father who tarried for him to this the enemy of mankind answered that it was best for him to tarry and if that he went any further his father would sacrifice him 
but isaac nothing fearing this advertisement of the devil went forward that his father on him might execute the commandment of god and with this answer as they say the devil departed yet as isaac went forward the devil appeared to him again in the likeness of an other friendly person and forbade him as before then isaac taking up a stone in that place hurled it at the devil and wounded him in the forehead in witness and remembrance whereof the people passing that way when they come near the wall are accustomed to cast stones against it and from thence go into the city footnote bartama alludes to the shaytan al kibir or the great devil as the buttress of al munna is called his account of satan's appearance is not strictly correct most muslims believe that abraham threw the stone at the regime the lapidated one but there are various traditions upon the subject and a footnote as we went this way the air was in manner darkened with a multitude of stock doves they say that these doves are of the progeny of the dove that spake in the ear of mahomet in likeness of the holy ghost footnote a christian version of an obscure muslim legend about a white dove alighting on the prophet's shoulder and appearing to whisper in his ear whilst he was addressing a congregation butler alludes to it the apostles of this fierce religion like mohammed's were as and wijan the latter word being probably a clerical error for pigeon when describing the kaaba i shall have occasion to allude to the blue rocks of mecca and a footnote these are seen everywhere as in the villages houses taverns and granaries of corn and rice and are so tame that one can scarcely drive them away to take them or kill them is esteemed a thing worthy death and therefore a certain pension is given to nourish them in the temple footnote no one would eat the pigeons of the kaaba but in other places el medina for instance they are sometimes used as article of food and a footnote chapter twenty of divers things which chanced to me in mecca and of zida a part of mecca it may seem good here to make mention of certain things in which is seen sharpness of wit in the case of urgent necessity which hath no law as saith the proverb for i was driven to the point how i might privily escape from mecca therefore whereas my captain gave me charge to buy certain things as i was in the market-place a certain mamluk knew me to be a christian and therefore in his own language spake unto me these words Intemenemme, that is where art thou footnote in the vulgar dialect antmenen and a footnote to whom i answered that i was a mahometan but he said thou sayest not truly i said again by the head of mahomet i am a mahometan then he said again come home to my house i followed him willingly when we were there he began to speak to me in the italian tongue and asked me again from whence i was affirming that he knew me and that i was no mahometan also that he had been some time in geneva and venice and that his words might be better believed he rehearsed many things which testified that he said truth when i understood this i confessed freely that i was a romain but professed to the faith of mahomet in the city of babylon and there made one of the mamluks whereof he seemed greatly to rejoice and therefore used me honourably but because my desire was yet to go further i asked the mahometan whether that city of mecca was so famous as all the world spake of it and inquired of him where was the great abundance of pearls precious stones spices and other rich merchandise that the brute went off to be in that city and all my talk was to the end to grope the mind of the mahometan that i might know the cause why such things were not brought thither as in time past but to avoid all suspicion i durst here make no mention of the dominion which the king of portugal had in the most part of that ocean and of the gulfs of the red sea and persia then he began with more attentive mind in order to declare unto me the cause what mart was not so greatly frequented as it had been before and laid the only fault thereof in the king of portugal but when he made mention of the king i began of purpose to detract his fame lest mahometan might think that i rejoiced that the christians came thither for merchandise 
when he perceived that i was of profession an enemy to the christians he had met me yet in greater estimation and proceeded to tell many things more when i was well instructed in all things i spake unto him friendly these words in the mahometan language munabba min al habi that is to say i pray you assist me footnote i confess in ability to explain these words the printer has probably done more than the author to make him unintelligible at manik min al nabi in vulgar tongue and rather corrupt arabic would mean i beg you to aid me for the sake of the prophet and a footnote he asked me wherein to help me i said how i may secretly depart hence confirming by great others that i would go to those kings that were most enemies to the christians affirming furthermore that i knew certain secrets greatly to be esteemed which if, if they were known to the said kings i doubted not but that in short time i should be sent for from mecca astonished at these words he said unto me i pray you what art or secret do you know i answered that i will give place to no man in making of all manner of guns and artillery then said he praised be mohammed who sent thee hither to do him and his saints good service and willed me to remain secretly in his house with his wife and required me earnestly to obtain leave of our captain that under his name he might lead from mecca fifteen camels laden with spices without paying any custom for they ordinarily pay to the sultan thirty seraphs of gold footnote ashrafi or dukats and a footnote for transporting of such merchandise for the change of so many camels i put him in good hope of his request he greatly rejoiced although he would ask for a hundred affirming that might easily be obtained by the privileges of the mamluks and therefore desired him that i might feel safe remain in his house then nothing doubting to obtain his request he greatly rejoiced and talking with me yet more freely gave me further instructions and counselled me to repair a certain king of the greater india in the kingdom and realm of tisham footnote the deccan and a footnote wherefore we will speak hereafter therefore the day before the caravana departed from mecca he willed me to lie hide in the most secret part of his house the day following early in the morning the trumpeter of the caravana gave warning to all the mamluks to make ready their horses to direct their journey toward syria with proclamation of death to all that should refuse to do so when i heard the sound of the trumpet and was advertised of the strait commandment i was marvellously troubled in mind and with heavy countenance desired the mahometan's wife not to beware of me and with earnest prayer committed myself to the mercy of god on the tuesday following our caravana departed from mecca and i remained in the mahometan's house with his wife but he followed the caravana yet before he departed he gave commandment to his wife to bring me to the caravana which should depart from zida the port of mecca footnote jidda and a footnote this port is distant from mecca forty miles whilst i lay thus hid in the mahometan's house i cannot express how friendly his wife used me this also furthered my good entertainment that there was in the house a fair young maid the niece of the mahometan who was greatly in love with me but at that time in the midst of the house troubles and fear the fire of venus was almost extinct in me and therefore with dalliances of fair words and promises i still kept myself in her favour therefore the friday following about noontide i departed following the caravana of india and about midnight we came to a certain village of the arabians and there remained the rest of that night and the next day till noon from hence we went forward on our journey toward zidda and came thither in the silence of the night the city hath no walls yet fair houses somewhat after the building of italy there is great abundance of all kind of merchandise by reason of resort in manner of all nations thither except jews and christians to whom it is not lawful to come thither as soon as i entered into the city i went into their temple or mesquita where i saw a great multitude of poor people as about the number of twenty five thousand attending a certain pilot who should bring them into their country 
here i suffered much trouble and affliction being forced to hide myself among these poor folks feigning myself very sick to the end that none should be inquisitive what i was whence i came or whither i would the lord of this city is the sultan of babylon brother of the sultan of mecca who is his subject the inhabitants are mahometans the soil is unfruitful and lacketh fresh water the sea beateth against the town there is nevertheless abundance of all things but brought thither from other places as from babylon of nilus arabia felix and divers other places the heat is here so great that men are in manner dried up therewith and therefore there is ever a great number of sick folks the city containeth about five hundred houses after fifteen days were passed i contacted a pilot who was ready to depart from thence into parisia and agreed of the price to go with him there lay at anchor in the haven almost hundred brigantines and foisters footnote a foist or bust was a kind of felucca partially decked and a footnote with diverse boats and barks of sundry sorts both with oars and without oars therefore after three days giving wind to our sails we entered into the red sea otherwise named mary erytherium and a footnote end of appendix four part two appendix five of personal narrative of pilgrimage to al medina and mecca this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org appendix five of personal narrative of pilgrimage to al medina and mecca by richard francis burton the pilgrimage of joseph pitts to mecca and al medina a d sixteen eighty part one our second pilgrim was joseph pitts of exon footnote it is curious as crichton in arabia volume two page two hundred eight observes that gibbon seems not to have seen or known anything of the little work published by pitts on his return home it is entitled a faithful account of the religion and the manners of the mahometans in which is a particular relation of their pilgrimage to mecca and the place of mahomet's birth and description of medina and his tomb there etc etc my copy is the fourth edition printed for t longman and r het london a d seventeen o eight the only remarkable feature in the getting up of the little octavo is that the engraving headed the most sacred and ancient temple of the mahometans at mecca is the reverse of the impression and a footnote a youth fifteen or sixteen years old when in a d sixteen seventy eight his genius leading him to be a sailor and see foreign countries caused him to be captured by an algerine pirate after living in slavery for some years he was taken by his patroon to mecca and el medina via alexandria rosetta cairo and suez his description of these places is accurate in the main points and though tainted with prejudice and bigotry he is free from superstition and credulity conversant with turkish and arabic he has required more knowledge of the tenets and the practice of al-islam than his predecessor and the term of his residence at algier fifteen years sufficed despite the defects of his education to give fullness and finish to his observation his chief patroon captain of a troop of horse was a profligate and debauched man in his time and a murderer who determined to proselyte a christian slave as an atonement for past impieties he began by large offers and failed he succeeded by dint of a great cudgel repeatedly applied to joseph pitt's bare feet i roared out says the relator to feel the pain of his cruel strokes but the more i cried the more furiously he laid on and to stop the noise of my crying would stamp with his feet on my mouth at last through terror he turned and spake the words la ilaha etc as usual holding up the forefinger of the right hand then he was circumcised in due form of course such conversion was not a sincere one there was yet swine's flesh in his teeth he boasts of saying his prayers in a state of impurity hates his fellow religionists was truly pleased to hear mahomet call sabatero i e shoemaker reads his bible talks of the horrid evil of apostasy calls the prophet a bloody impostor 
eats heartily in private of hog and is very much concerned for one of his countrymen who went home to his own country but came again to algier and voluntarily without the least force used towards him became a mahometan his first letter from his father reached him some days after he had been compelled by his patroon's barbarity to abjure his faith one sentence appears particularly to have afflicted him was this to have a care and keep close to god and to be sure never by any methods of cruelty that could be used towards me be prevailed to deny my blessed saviour and that he the father would rather hear of my death than of me being a mahometan indeed throughout the work it appears that his repentance was sincere god be merciful to me a sinner is the deprecation that precedes the account of his turning turk and the book concludes with to him therefore father son and holy spirit three persons and one god be all honour glory and raise world without end amen having received from his patroon whom he acknowledges to have been a second parent to him a letter of freedom at mecca and having entered into pay still living with his master pitts began to think of escape the grand turk had sent to algier for ships and the renegade was allowed to embark on board one of them provided with a diplomatic letter from mr baker consul of algier to mr ray consul at smyrna Footnote. some years afterwards mr consul baker when waited upon by pitts in london gave him a copy of the letter with the following memorandum upon the back of it copy of my letter to consul ray at smyrna to favour the escape of joseph pitts an english renegade from a squadron of algier men of war had my kindness to him been discovered by the government of algiers my legs and arms had first been broken and my carcass burnt a danger hitherto not courted by any and a footnote the devil we are told was very busy with him in the levant tempting him to lay aside all thoughts of escaping to return to algier and to continue a mussulman and the loss of eight months pay and certain other monies seems to have weighed heavily upon his soul still he prepared for the desperate enterprise in which failure would have exposed him to be dragged about the streets on the stone till half dead and then be burned to ashes in the jews burial place a generous friend mr elliot a cornish merchant who had served some part of his apprenticeship in axon and had settled at smyrna paid four pounds for his passage in a sh in a french ship to leghorn therefrom in the evening before sailing he went on board apparelled as an englishman with his beard shaven a campaign periwig and a cane in his hand accompanied with three or four of his friends at leghorn he prostrated himself and kissed the earth blessing almighty god for his mercy and goodness to him that he once more set footing on the european christian part of the world footnote the italics in the text are the authors this is admirably characteristic of the man asiatic christendom would not satisfy him he seems to hate the damnable doctrines of the papist almost as much as those of the muslims and a footnote he travelled through italy germany and holland where he received many and great kindnesses but his patriotism was damped as he entered england his own native country and the civilized land must have made him for a time regret having left algier the very first night he lay ashore he was impressed into the king's service we having at that time war with france despite arguments and tears he spent some days in colchester jail and finally he was put on board a smack to be carried to the dead nod man of war but happily for himself he had written to sir william falconer one of the smyrna or turkey company in london that gentleman used his interest to procure a protection from the admiralty office upon the receipt of which good news joseph pitts did rejoice exceedingly and could not forbear leaping upon the deck he went to london thanked sir william and hurried down to exeter where he ends his fifteen years tale with a homely heartful and affecting description of his first meeting with his father his mother died about a year before his return the following passages are part of the seventh and eighth chapter of pitt's little-known work next we came to gidda the nearest port town to mecca not quite one day's journey from it Footnote. he must have been accustomed to long days journey al idrisi makes jidda forty miles from mecca i calculated about forty-two and a footnote 
Here we are met by Dilils, i.e. certain persons who came from Mecca on purpose to instruct the Hajjis or pilgrims in the ceremonies, most of them being ignorant of them, which are to be used in their worship at the temple there. Footnote. Dalil, a guide, generally called at Mecca Mutawif, and a footnote in the middle of which is a place which they call Beit Allah, i.e. the house of God. They say that Abraham built it, to which I give no credit. As soon as we come to the town of Mecca, the Dalil, or guide, carries us into the great street, which is in the midst of the town, and to which the temple joins. Footnote. Pitts note, that before they'll provide for themselves, they serve God in their way. And a footnote. When the camels are laid down, he first directs us to the fountain, there to take abdis. Footnote. Abdast is the Turkish word borrowed from the Persian for wuzu, the minor ablution. And a footnote. Which being done, he brings us to the temple, into which having left our shoes with one who constantly attends to receive them, we enter at the door called bab salam i.e. the welcome gate, or gate of peace. After a few paces entrance, the Dalil makes a stand and holds up his hands towards the Beit Allah, it being in the middle of the mosque, the Hajjis imitating him and saying after him the same words which he speaks. At the very first sight of the Beit Allah, the Hajjis melt into tears, then we are led up to it, still speaking after the Dalil, then we are led round it seven times, and then to make two erkaits. Footnote. Rukaat, a bending. This two-bow prayer is in honor of the mosque. End of footnote. This being done, we are led into the street again, where we are sometimes to run and sometimes to walk very quickly with the Dalil from one place of the street to the other, about a bow shot. Footnote. This is the ceremony technically called a say, or running between Safa and Marwa. Burkhard describes it accurately, volume 1, page 174 till 175. End of footnote. I profess I could not choose but admire to see those poor creatures so extraordinary devout and affectionate when they are about these superstitions, and with what awe and trembling they were possessed, insomuch that I could scarce forbear shedding of tears to see their zeal, though blind and idolatrous. After all this is done, we return to the place in the street where we left our camels, with our provisions and necessaries, and then look out for lodgings. Where when we came, we disrobe and take our hirawems, footnote, ihram, the pilgrim garb, and a footnote, and put on our ordinary clothes again. All the pilgrims hold it to their great duty well to improve their time whilst they are at Mecca, not to do their accustomed duty and devotion in the temple, but to spend all their leisure time there, and as far as strength will permit to continue at tawaf, i.e. to walk around the beat Allah, which is about four and twenty paces square. At one corner of the beat there is a black stone fastened and framed with silver plate, footnote, now gold or gilt, and a footnote. And every time they come to that corner they kiss the stone, and having gone round seven times they perform two erkaits nomaz, or prayer. This stone, they say, was formerly white, and then it was called hajar asaid, i.e. the white stone. But by reason of the sins of the multitudes of people who kiss it, it has become black and is now called hajar asawid or the black stone footnote this is an error the stone is called hajar aswad or the black stone or hajar asad the blessed stone moreover it did not change its colour on account of the sins of the people who kissed it and a footnote this place is so much frequented by people going around it that the place of the tawaf i e the circuit which they take in going around it is seldom void of people at any time of the day or night footnote the meccans in effect still make this a boast and a footnote. Many have waited several weeks, nay, months, for the opportunity of finding it so. For they say that if any person is blessed with such an opportunity, that for his or her zeal in keeping up the honour of the tawaf, let they petition what they will at the beat Allah, they shall be answered. Many will walk round till they are quite weary, then rest, and add it again, carefully remembering at the end of every seventh time to perform two erkaits. This beat is in effect the object of their devotion, the idol which they adore, for let them never be so far distant from it, east, west, north, or south of it, they will be sure to bow down towards it. But when they are at the beat, they may go on which side they please, and pay their salah towards it. 
Footnote. Nothing more blindly prejudiced than this statement. Muslims turn towards Mecca as Christians towards Jerusalem. End of footnote. Sometimes there are several hundreds at Tawaf at once, especially after Aksham Nomaz, or fourth time of service, which is after candle lighting, as you heard before. And these both men and women, but the women walk on the outside the men, and the men nearest to the beat. In so great a resort as this, it is not to be supposed that every individual person can come to kiss the stone aforementioned. Therefore, in such a case, the lifting up the hands towards it, smoothing down their faces, and using a short expression of devotion, as Allah Waik Barik, i.e. Blessed God, or Allah Kabur, i.e. Great God, some such like, and so passing by it till opportunity of kissing it offers, is thought sufficient. Footnote. As will afterwards be explained, all the four orthodox schools do not think it necessary to kiss the stone after each circumambulation. And a footnote. But when there are but few men at Tawaf, then the women get opportunity to kiss the said stone, and when they have gotten it, they close in with it as they come round, and walk round as quick as they can to come to it again, and keep possession of it for a considerable time. The men, when they see that the women have got the place, will be so civil as to pass by and give them leave to take their fill, as I may say in their tawaf or walking round, during which they are using some formal expressions. When the women are at the stone, then it is esteemed a very rude and abominable thing to go near them, respecting the time and place. I shall now give you a more peculiar description of Mecca and the temple there. First, as to Mecca, it is a town situated in a barren place about one day's journey from the Red Sea, in a valley or rather in the midst of many little hills. It is a place of no force, wanting both walls and gates. Its buildings are, as I said before, very ordinary, insomuch that it would be a place of no tolerable entertainment, were it not for the anniversary resort of so many thousand haggis or pilgrims, on whose coming the whole dependence of the town in a manner is, for many shops are scarcely open all the year besides. The people here, I observed, are poor sort of people, very thin, lean, and swarthy. The town is surrounded for several miles with many thousands of little hills, which are very near one to the other. I have been on the top of some of them near Mecca, where I could see some miles about, yet was not able to see the farthest of the hills. They are all stony rock and blackish, and pretty near of bigness, appearing at a distance like cocks of hay, but all pointing towards Mecca. Some of them are half a mile in circumference, but all near of one height. The people here have an odd and foolish sort of tradition concerning them, viz., that when Abraham went about building the Beit Allah, God, by his wonderful providence, did so order it, that every mountain in the world should contribute something to the building thereof, and accordingly every one did send its proportion, though there is a mountain near Algier, which is called Karadok, i.e. Back Mountain. And the reason of its blackness, they say, is because it did not send any part of itself towards the building of the temple at Mecca. Footnote. These are mere local traditions. The original Kaaba was composed of materials gathered from the six mountains of paradise. Chapter 20. The present building is of grey granite quarried in a hill near Mecca. End of footnote. Between these hills is good and plain travelling, though they stand one to another. There is, upon the top of one of them, a cave, which they term Hira, i.e. Blessing. Footnote. Now Jabal Nur. End of footnote into which they say Mohammed did usually retire for his solitary devotions, meditations, and fastings, and here they believe he had a great part of the Al-Qur'an brought to him by the angel Gabriel. I have been in this cave and observed that it is not at all beautified, at which I admired. About half a mile out of Mecca is a very steep hill, and there are stairs made to go to the top of it, where there is a cupola under which is a cloven rock, into this they say Mohammed, when very young, viz. about four years of age, was carried by the angel Gabriel, who opened his breast and took out his heart, from which he picked some black blood specks, which was his original corruption, then put it into its place again, and afterwards closed up the part, and that during this operation Mohammed felt no pain. Into this very place I myself went, because the rest of my company did so, and performed some erkats, as they did. 
the town hath plenty of water and yet but few herbs unless in some particular places here are several sorts of good fruits to be had viz grapes melons watermelons cucumbers pumpkins and the like but these are brought two or three days journey off where there is a place of very great plenty called if i mistake not habash Footnote. they come from the well-known taif which the country people call hijaz but never habash the word taif literally means a circumambulator it is said that when adam settled at mecca finding the country barren he prayed to allah to supply him with a bit of fertile land immediately appeared a mountain which having performed tawaf round the kaaba settled itself down eastward of mecca hence to the present day taif is called qita'a min al-sham a piece of syria its fatherland and a footnote likewise sheep are brought hither and sold so that as to mecca itself it affords little or nothing of comfortable provisions it lieth in a very hot country insomuch that people run from one side of the streets to the other to get into the shadows as the motion of the sun causes it the inhabitants especially men do usually sleep on the tops of the houses for the air or in the streets before their doors some lay in the small bedding they have on a thin mat on the ground others have a slight frame made much like drink stalls on which we place barrels standing on four legs corded with palm cordage on which they put their bedding before they bring out their bedding they sweep the streets and water them as for my own part i usually lay open without any bed covering on the top of the house only i took a linen cloth dipped in water and after i had wrung it covered myself with it in the night and when i awoke i should find it dry then i would wet it again and thus i did two or three times in a night secondly i shall next give you some account of the temple of mecca it hath about forty doors to enter into it not so much i think for necessity as figure in some places they are closed by one another the form of it is much resembling that of the royal exchange in london but i believe it is near ten times bigger it is all open and gravelled in the midst except some paths that come from certain doors which lead to the Beit Allah, and are paved with broad stones the walks or cloisters all round are arched overhead and paved beneath with fine broad stone and all round are little rooms or cells where which dwell and give themselves up for reading studying in a devout life who are much akin to their dervises or hermits the beit allah which stands in the middle of the temple is four square about twenty-four paces each square and near twenty-four foot in height footnote this is an error of printing for paces End of footnote. it is built with great stone all smooth and plain without the least bit of carved work on it it is covered all over from top to bottom with a thick sort of silk above the middle part of the covering are embroidered all round letters of gold the meaning of which i cannot well call to mind but i think there were some devout expressions each letter is near two foot in length and two inches broad near the lower end of this beat are large brass rings fastened into it through which passeth a great cotton rope and to this the lower end of the covering is tacked the threshold of the door that belongs to the beat is as high as a man can reach and therefore when any person enters into it a sort of ladder stairs are brought for that purpose the door is plated all over with silver footnote pit's note not a massy gold as late french author who i am sure was never there says the door is of wood only plated over with silver much less is the inside of the beat sealed with massy gold as the same frenchman asserts i can assure the world there is no such thing the door is of wood thickly plated over with silver in many parts gilt and whatever hereabouts is gilt the meccans always call gold r f b and a footnote and there is a covering hangs over it and reaches to the ground which is kept turned up all the week except thursday night and friday which is their sabbath the set covering of the door is very thick embroidered with gold insomuch that it weighs several score pounds the top of the beat is flat beaten with lime and sand and there is a long gutter or spout to carry off the water when it rains at which time the people will run throng and struggle to get under the set gutter 
so that the water that comes off the beak may fall upon them accounting it as the dew of heaven and looking on it as a great happiness to have it drop upon them but if they can recover some of this water to drink they esteem it to be yet a much greater happiness many poor people make it their endeavour to get some of it and present it to the haggis for which they are well rewarded my patroon had a present made him of this water with which he was not a little pleased and gave him that brought it a good reward this beat allah is open but two days in the space of six weeks viz one day for the men and the next day for the women footnote this is no longer the case few women ever enter the kaaba on account of the personal danger they run there End of footnote. i was at mecca about four months i had the opportunity of entering into it twice a reputed advantage which many thousands of hajjis have not met with for those that come by land make no longer stay at mecca than sixteen or seventeen days when any enter into the beat all that they have to do is perform two arkats on each side footnote more correctly at three of the corners and the fourth opposite the southern third of the western wall and a footnote with the holding up their two hands and petitioning at the conclusion of each two erkats and they are so very reverent and devout in doing this that they will not suffer their eyes to wander and gaze about for they account it very sinful to do so nay they say that one was smitten blind for gazing about when in the beat as the reward of his vain and unlawful curiosity footnote it is deemed disrespectful to look at the ceiling but pilgrims may turn their eyes in any other direction they please and a footnote i could not for my part give any credit for this story but looked on it as a legendary relation and therefore was resolved if i could to take my view of it i mean not to continue gazing about it but now and then to cast an observing eye and i profess i found nothing worth seeing in it only two wooden pillars in the midst to keep up the roof footnote there are now three and a footnote and a bar of iron fastened to them on which hang three or four silver lamps which are i suppose but seldom if ever lighted in one corner of the beat is an iron or brass chain i cannot tell which for i made no use of it the pilgrims just clap it about their necks in token of repentance the floor of the beat is marble and so is the inside of the walls on which there is written something in arabic which i had no time to read the walls though of marble on the inside are hung over with silk which is pulled off before the hadkis enter footnote it is tucked up about six feet high and a footnote those that go into the beat tarry there but a very little while this scarce so much as half a quarter of an hour because others wait for the same privilege and while some go in others are going out after all is over and all that will have done this the sultan of mecca who is sharif i e one of the race of the mahomet accounts himself not too good to cleanse the beat and therefore with some of his favourites doth wash and cleanse it and first of all they wash it with the holy water zemzem and after that with sweet water the stairs which were brought to enter in at the door of the beat being removed the people crowd under the door to receive on them the sweepings of the said water and the besoms wherewith the beat is cleans are broken in pieces and thrown out amongst the mob and he that gets a small stick or twig of it keeps it as a sacred relic but to speak something further of the temple of mecca for i am willing to be very particular in matters about it though in so being i should it may be speak of things which by some people may be thought trivial the compass of the ground round the beat where the people exercise themselves in the duty of tawaf is paved with marble about fifty foot in breadth footnote it is a close kind of grey granite which takes a high polish from the pilgrim's feet and a footnote and round this marble pavement stand pillars of brass about fifteen foot high footnote now iron posts and a footnote and twenty foot distant from each other above the middle part of which iron bars are fastened reaching from one to the other and several lamps made of glass are hanged to each of the said bars with brass wires in the form of a triangle to give light in the night season for they pay their devotions at the beat allah as much by night as by day during the hajj's stay at mecca 
these glasses are half filled with water and a third part with oil on which a round wire brass is buoyed up with three little corks in the midst of this wire is made a place to put in the wick or cotton which burns till the oil is spent every day they are washed clean and replenished with fresh water oil and cotton on each of the four squares of the beak is a little room built and over every one of them is a little chamber with windows all around it in which chambers of the imams together with the mezzins perform salah in the audience of all the people which are below these four chambers are built one at each square of the beat by reason that there are four sorts of the mahometans the first called hanafi most of them are turks the second shafi footnote the shafi school have not never had a peculiar oratory like the other three schools they pray near the well zemzem and a footnote whose manners and ways the arabians follow the third hembali of which there are but few the fourth maliki of which there are those that lived westward of egypt even to the emperor of morocco's country these all agree in fundamentals only there is some small difference between them in the ceremonial part about twelve paces from the beat is as they say the sepulchre of abraham footnote this place contains the stone which served abraham for a scaffold when he was erecting the kaaba some of our popular writers confound the stone with the hajar al aswad and a footnote who by god's immediate command they tell you built this beat allah which sepulchre is enclosed within iron gates it is made somewhat like the tombstone which people of fashion have among us but with a very handsome embroidered covering into this persons are apt to gaze a small distance from it on the left hand is a well which they call bir al zamzam the water therefore they call holy water and i superstitiously esteem it as the papists do theirs in the month of ramadan they will be sure to break their fast with it they report that it is as sweet as milk but for my part i could perceive no other taste in it than in common water except that it was somewhat brackish the haggis when they come first to mecca drink of it unreasonably by which means they are not much purged but their flesh breaks out all in pimples and this they call the purging of their spiritual corruptions there are hundreds of pitchers belonging to the temple which in the month of ramadan are filled with the said water and placed all along before the people with cups to drink as they are kneeling and waiting for aksham namaz or evening service and as soon as the mezzins or clerks on the tops of the minarets began their bawling to call them to the namaz they follow drinking thereof before they begin their devotions this beer or well of zemzem is in the midst of one of the little rooms before mentioned at each square of the beat distant about twelve or fourteen paces from it out of which four men are employed to draw water without any pay or reward for any that shall desire it each of these men have two leather buckets tied to a rope on a small wheel one of which comes up full while the other goes down empty they do not only drink this water but oftentimes bathe themselves with it at which time they take off their clothes only covering their lower parts with thin wrapper and one of the drawers pours on each person's head five or six buckets of water footnote pitsnote the worthy mons the venot saith that the waters of mecca are bitter but i never found them so but as sweet and as good as any others for aught as i could perceive pitts has just remarked that he found the waters of zemzem brackish to my taste it was salt bitter which was exceedingly disagreeable r f b and a footnote the person bathing may lawfully wash himself therewith above the middle but not his lower parts because their account they are not worthy only letting the water take its way downwards in short they make use of this water only to drink take abdis and for bathing neither may take abdis with it unless they first cleanse their secret parts with other common water yea such a high esteem they have for it that many hajis carry it home to their respective countries in little latin or tin pots and present it to their friends half a spoonful may be to each who receive it in the hollow of their hand with great care and abundance of thanks sipping a little of it and bestowing the rest on their faces and naked heads at the same time holding up their hands and desiring god that they also may be so happy and prosperous as to go on pilgrimage to mecca 
the reason of their putting such a high value upon the water of this well is because as they say it is the place where ishmael was laid by his mother hagar i have heard them tell the story exactly as it is recorded on the twenty-first chapter of genesis and they say that in the very place where the child paddled with his feet the water flowed out End of appendix five part one Appendix 5 of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appendix 5 of Personal Narrative of Pilgrimage to Al Medina and Mecca by Richard Francis Burton. The Pilgrimage of Joseph Pitts to Mecca and Al Medina, AD 1680, Part 2 i shall now inform you how when and where they receive the honourable title of hajjis for which they are at all this pains and expense the qurban biram or the feast of sacrifice follows two months and ten days after the ramadan fast the eighth day after the set two months they all enter into hirawam i e put on their mortifying habit again and in that manner go to a certain hill called jebel urfat i e arafat el arafat i e the mountain of knowledge for there they say adam first found and knew his wife eve and they likewise say that she was buried at gidda near the red sea at whose sepulchre all the hajis who come to mecca by way of the red sea perform to erka its nomaz and i think no more i could not help but smile to hear this their ridiculous tradition for so i must pronounce it when observing the marks which were set the one at the head and the other at the foot of the grave i guessed them to be a bow-shot distant from each other on the middle of her supposed grave is a little mosque built where the haggis pay their religious respect this gibbel or hill is not so big as to contain the vast multitudes which resort thither for it is said by them that there meet no less than seventy thousand souls every year in the ninth day after the two months after ramadan and if it happen that in any year there be wanting some of that number god they say will supply the deficiency with so many angels footnote they are not so modest six hundred thousand is the mystical number others declare it to be incalculable oftentimes seven thousand have met at arafat and a footnote i do confess the number of haggis i saw at this mountain was very great nevertheless i cannot think they could amount to so many as seventy thousand there are certain bound stones placed round the gibbel in the plain to shew how far the sacred ground as they esteem it extends and many are so zealous as to come and pitch their tents within these bounds some time before the hour of paying their devotion here comes waiting for it but why they so solemnly approach this mountain beyond any other place and receive from hence the title of hajjis i confess i do not more fully understand than what i have already said giving but little heed to these delusions i observed nothing worth seeing on this hill for there was only a small cupola on the top of it footnote the cupola has now disappeared there is a tall pillar of masonry work whitewashed rising from a plastered floor for praying and a footnote neither are there many inhabitants nearer to it than mecca about one or two of the clock which is the time of yola nomaz having washed and made themselves ready for it they perform that and at the same time perform a kindonomas which they never do at the same time but upon this occasion because at the time when a kindonomas should be performed in the accustomed order viz about four o'clock in the afternoon they are imploring pardon for their sins and receiving the imam's benediction footnote on the ninth of the hijjah or the day of arafat 